Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Most of us think of ghosts as frightening entities, but I'm really not sure why. I mean, the majority of ghostly entities and spirits are like will-o'-wisps. They may drift out of the cobwebs of your attic or damp cellar corner, but for the most part they don't really do anything dramatic or harmful, except perhaps throw a chair in the air or shake a bed until it rocks, or step heavily on the floorboards in your house alerting you to their presence. Now I have seen doors open and close by themselves. Lights go on and off and dishes drop to the floor without breaking. But after watching hours upon hours of your favorite Ghost Hunters TV shows, I really can't get as excited as I was at maybe the age of four when I saw a full-body apparition in my room surrounded by a brilliant aura. TV and movies portray ghosts and the esoteric in general in a more aggressive light. You have Ghostbusters with its slime and The Exorcist's star Linda Blair spitting pea soup and telling her mother what she can do while in hell. Nothing like a good nail-biting horror story like Pet Cemetery to prompt us to hide under the covers and leave on the nightlight next to the bed. And who can't pass up a great episode of Supernatural? It doesn't matter in these instances if we are 5 or 50. A good scare is a good scare. But what about fearsome ghosts away from the fictionalized world of horror movies and television? Good scares in real life, as far as ghosts go, are pretty much a rarity, except for those occasional cases which are guaranteed to make you wet your pants and scare the crap out of you. And tonight, we're not looking at your average, mundane ghost story. What we're concerned with are incidents which can be categorized as the most diabolical of poltergeist experiences, as well as skirmishes with the most gruesome and alarming phantoms you are ever likely to deal with. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner sanctum. Lights out. Murder at midnight. The sealed book. Presents. Suspense! I am the Whistler. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved and unexplained. And in between the stories, I bring you some of the best dark, creepy, and horrifying old-time radio shows from what I've collected over the years. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come 
in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of your over-self. What is the man talking about? Over-self? What's that? Well, you might say it's that part of you where your imagination resides. The truth is that, according to any number of religionists, you don't exist at all. Only your imagination. When you refer to myself, you are actually talking about an illusion created by your over-self. Confusing? Certainly is to me. And it was more than confusing to Amanda Phillips. You are not a ghost, Morley? Of course not, Amanda. Oh, I dare say you would call me a ghost, but ghosts don't really exist. They're people. They simply live on a different plane of existence. I don't know what to say. But then don't say anything. That's the trouble with people on your plane. They say too much. But these different planes of existence... Morley, it's confusing. I simply don't understand. You will, my darling. You will. If you dare. Our mystery drama, Picture on a Wall, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Diane Baker. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. No, I didn't say you don't exist, that you are not really yourself. Those who devote lifetimes to the study of what we are and why we are here, who try to understand God and our relation to him. I'm talking, of course, of priests, ministers, Buddhist monks, even philosophers. They say it. They say that the self is your conscious, the over-self, your subconscious, and the super-self, your unconscious. You understand? If you do, you're far more knowledgeable than I am because I don't understand at all. And as I said earlier on, neither did Amanda Phillips. Well, here it is, Amanda. Hope you like it. Gil Franklin, it's beautiful. I figured it would grab you, even though you did say you wanted to live in Greenwich Village. <laughs> yes, I did. All my life in Gladesville, Iowa, I've yearned to be an actress living in Greenwich Village. But this, it's, it's so lovely. Who, who, what? May I come in? Oh, Mrs. Broly, of course. Let me introduce you. Amanda Phillips, rising young star of the Broadway theater, or soon to be anyway, Mrs. Broly, landlady. Delighted to meet you, dear. Is uh, everything all right? Oh, it couldn't be more so. I never expected to find anything as, well, really enchanting as, as this. <laughs> Not at what I can afford to pay anyhow. It is only $45 a week, isn't it? Uh, yes. Well, how can you afford to let it go at that? A place like this, furnished so nicely, those beautiful paintings on the walls, especially that big one over the fireplace, and the garden. You can walk straight from this room into the garden. It's just lovely. I should think you could rent this for two or three times what you're asking. Uh, perhaps so, but... Yeah, well, you see, dear, I'm not only extremely old, but I'm extremely particular about whom I went to. And as your fiancé will tell you... Uh, Mr. Franklin isn't my fiancé, Mrs. Broly. Oh, 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 I thought... I uh, have hopes, Mrs. Broly. High hopes. Well, now, you're such a nice man. I hope you realize them. Because certainly Miss Phillips is a most attractive and desirable... Uh, something wrong, Miss Phillips? That... Smell. Smell? Aroma, I, I should say. A, a scent. The, the scent of lavender. Why, it's a cologne I use. Yes, a cologne. Lavender. Now, uh, if there's anything I can do to help you get settled in, dear. Anything you need, now you just pick up the telephone. Uh, just to pick it up? It connects to a switchboard. I'll answer. Well, make yourselves comfortable. 
strange. What? The smell of lavender. I didn't smell it until at least several minutes after she came in here. And another thing, it seemed to come from that direction, out there in the garden. And Gil? Yes? She's gone, but the scent, it's stronger. You're imagining things. I don't smell anything. And no, I don't have a cold. Very strange. Look, I've got to get back to the office or the law firm of Belding and Maxwell will be firing their youngest partner. But I'll see you for dinner tonight, okay? Very okay. Pick you up at seven. Well, better unpack my bag, put things away. That scent. It is. It must be coming from the garden. Locked. And no key. Yes, Miss Phillips. Uh, Mrs. Broly, the French doors into the garden, they're locked. Yes, dear. I keep them locked. You do? For your protection. You see, anyone who wanted to could get over the fence around the garden and, well, an ounce of prevention, you know. Yes, but I want to uh, use the garden. <laughs> what I can see... Through the French doors, it's it's enchanting, that fountain. The fountain doesn't work, I'm sorry to say. Hasn't in years. Oh, even so, it'd be a nice place to sit. Those stone benches and everything. Would you bring me the key, please? Why, uh, oh, yes, uh, if I can find it. Find it? I'm not quite sure what I did with it, but don't you worry now. I'll do what I can to find it. I certainly shall. Well, I never. I just never. Never what, madam? Who? What? Who are you? Norcross is my name. Morley Norcross. Do please forgive me. I had absolutely no intention of startling you. I turn around to find you leaning casually against the French doors. The open French doors. And you... How? How did you get here? Over the fence, you might say. And how did you open those locked doors? I didn't find them locked. Well, I did. Well, perhaps it's one of those knobs. You can open them from one side, but not the other. Let's have a look, shall we? I'd rather not, if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry. You're angry with me. I've offended you, Amanda. You know my name. Tit for death. You know mine. But you told me yours. Then it's altogether possible that that rather huge label on your luggage told me yours. <laughs> <laughs> of course. See? For a moment, I... Well, you won't believe it, but I thought you might be some kind of, of ghost or something. I believe it. Might I have the pleasure of showing you your garden? If you will step through your French doors into your garden, then, Miss Phillips, you can all... But Smell fall in the air. And uh, lavender. Uh, yet, I, I, I don't see any in the garden. My cologne, I dare say. You use uh, lavender cologne? Yeah, old-fashioned, isn't it? For, for a man, I mean. Why, p perhaps, but uh, I like it, Mr. Renault. Well, I say, call me Morley. If we're going to be friends, that is. And I hope we are. Do you? <laughs> Why not? Why not, indeed? Beautiful fountain, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yes, it's beautiful. It's simple. A peasant girl holding a tilted pitcher on her shoulder. A pitcher from which the water used to pour into that large stone basin at her feet. Used to? Sixty years ago, or so, yes. Sixty? Well, how do you know that? Oh, uh, how... How do I, uh... Well, yes. You can't be more than, uh... Oh, 40, say? Thank you. Thank you, my dear. So how would you know that this fountain hasn't, uh, uh fountained in more than, uh, 60 years? 16 years, I said. 16. And, well, I know because I once lived where you're about to live. In that service flat, uh, living room and kitchenette? Mm-hmm. Well, what did you do? <laughs> oh, what kind of work? I was a dramatic coach. You don't mean it. A dramatic coach? An excellent one, I might say. Uh, would you... Um, well, I hardly dare ask this, but... Uh, uh, 
Would you coach me? Of course. I fully intended to. You? Yes. Oh, now, Mr. Norcross. Morley. Morley. Well, you might have got my name off the luggage label, but... But you couldn't... You couldn't possibly know that I, I want to be an actress. No? No. <laughs> What is it? Ever read Sherlock Holmes stories? No. That's too bad. They're fascinating. Fascinating. Holmes could look at someone he'd never seen in all his life before and tell him everything about himself. I was an avid reader of Holmes, and somehow I picked up the technique. For example, your makeup. Oh, what about it? Unless I'm mistaken, on your cheeks, that's panistic rosy glow, isn't it? Why, yes. And a touch of daylight orange in the corner of each eye. You're amazing. Of course, on stage, you'd use vermilion. But for daytime wear, you're most astute. And then, of course, your clothes are a dead giveaway. To say nothing, my dear. Nothing of your walk. Unbelievable, Morley. My elementary what? Elementary. <laughs> Would you like some tea? Do you have any? I mean, you will just moved in. In my suitcase. Then I'd love it. Come along inside. No, 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 I'll, I'll sit here. I'll, I'll sit here. It's such a, a pleasant afternoon. I'll be as quick as I can. Yes? Come in. Oh, Mrs. Morley. Found the key to the French doors, my dear. Well, thank you. Though I am not sure I'll need them now. Oh, I'm glad you've decided to leave them locked. Much safer. But I haven't decided to leave them locked. As you can see, the doors are... Oh, as I can see what? Closed. I didn't close them. And if Morley had, I'd have... I'd have heard him. Morley? Did you say Morley? Uh, Mr. Morley Norcross. <laughs> He's sitting in the garden... By the fountain. There's no one sitting in the garden, Miss Phillips. No one? Why, he's gone. And the door's locked. Of course. Why are you looking at me like that, Mrs. Bowley? Miss Phillips... Finding this key put a very old woman to considerable trouble. Now, I don't mind that. I'm accustomed to it and delighted to make my tenants as comfortable as possible. But I don't like having games played on me, Miss Phillips. I don't enjoy being made a fool of. There are the keys you ask for. Please take care to lock those doors before retiring at night. But, Mrs. Bowling... Amanda, you were dead tired, beat. You probably stretched out on that couch to rest and fell off to sleep. You dreamed it all. You had to. I, uh, I don't remember lying down, Gil. I, I didn't. I started to unpack, and and then the scent of lavender came to me even stronger than before. It came from the garden. I tried to go into the garden, but found the doors locked. And so I called Mrs. Brody. Yes, yes, you told me all this. But, sweetheart, it couldn't have happened. It just couldn't. Well, if, if it didn't... Oh, I don't know. I just don't know. And neither do I. One thing I do know, though. I'm taking you off for the best dinner you ever had. You need it. <laughs> I guess I do. Won't be a minute. Put on a new face. Okay. Know something? What? I did all right by you, finding this place. Comfortable, homey. Even the paintings on the wall. Not the usual crummy stuff you find in a place like this. Pretty good art. This one over the fireplace is a knockout. I haven't had a chance to look at it, really. It's by, uh... I don't know, some name here at the bottom. Can't, can't make it out. Dated... No, I can make that out. 1909. It's called The Dramatic Coach. Oh? Shows him the coach teaching a girl how to act. Very handsome guy. Mm, tall, wavy chestnut hair, worn kind of long. Blue eyes, I think. Gray at the temples, strong nose. Very strong nose. Oh. Ready so soon? Let me see that. The 
painting? Yes, the... Huh? Amanda, what is it? The man in the painting. The dramatic coach, Gil. That's Morley Norcross. Well, we may be talking about the self, the over-self, and the super-self. But so far as I'm concerned, Morley Norcross is a ghost. Now, maybe he isn't. Only my opinion. But the things going on in that Ninth Street flat, the things that happened to Amanda in that garden, you ask me, they're more than strange. They're uncanny. I wouldn't be concerned, except I remember Amanda saying she felt scared. I don't like that. It worries me. I'll be back shortly for Act Two. We're involved with an experience having to do with the occult, the esoteric. Or rather, lovely young Amanda Phillips is. As we know, she has come to New York City from Gladesville, Iowa, hopefully to become a successful actress. One can expect all sorts of things to happen to one in the Big Apple, of course. But what has already happened to Amanda on her first day is, well, uh, to say the least, odd. The man in the painting is Norcross? The man you think you met out there in the garden? Gil, I know you think I'm spaced out. No, no, I just think you dreamed it all. I fell asleep and dreamed. Dreamed about a man who was the living image of the man in that picture? A dramatic coach to boot? Well, it figures, doesn't it? What do you mean, it figures? Well, there he is in the painting. The painting is, is titled The Dramatic Coach. Your eyes may have just glanced at it, but your brain, it, it registered you clearly. You were tired, worn out from your trip. You stretched out to rest, fell asleep, and well, dreamed of the man in the painting. The man who said he was a dramatic coach. Hmm. Well, I don't remember falling asleep. But uh, what you say makes sense. That's what must have happened, I guess. Sure. And speaking of getting rest, young lady, you've had a long, tiring day, so uh, I'm going to split. Oh, it's only 10 o'clock, Gil. You don't have to... No, 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 you're tired. And now that I've got you here in New York, you uh, you can count on seeing a lot of me, if you want to. Oh, of course I want to. You sound as if you really mean that, Amanda. Oh, Gil. Sweetheart, you know how I feel about you. It's just that... It's the great white way beckons. It's a career on Broadway or nothing. <laughs> no, a career on Broadway or marriage and kids. Oh, Gil, darling. Look, I've, I've got to try it first. I've got to satisfy myself that I've, I've got talent or I haven't. That I can make it or I can't. That... Look, I, I, I've just got to have my chance. Be patient, please. For you, I'll outdo the patience of Job. Good night, honey. Good night, my darling. Oh, I am tired. Into bed, Ethel Barrymore Phillips. What? Lavender. The scent of lavender again. From the garden. He's there. Sitting by the fountain. And I'm not sleeping. Not dreaming. Oh, locked. Keys. Morley? Amanda. What are you doing here at this hour? Ah, it's such a beautiful evening. Full white moon. Yes. Isn't it an enchantment? The jet black buildings tall against the night sky. Lights shining yellow and orange and windows here and there. And here... Right here, in the midst of it all, a small oasis of peace and quiet, loveliness. <laughs> you keep talking like that, Morley, and you will cast a spell over me. I will, won't I? Amanda, do you mind my coming here of an evening, now and then? I won't, if you say no. Well, no, I... I, I suppose it's all right. You come when you want to. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Morley. Yes. There's a painting over the fireplace. It's, it's called the Dramatic Coach. And the man in the painting, the coach, looks exactly like you. Yes. Yes, he does. 
It was painted by Scott Costain in 1909. The man in the painting is my grandfather, whose name was also Morley Norcross. Oh. Uh, you didn't... I, I... You didn't think... Yeah, I'm afraid I did. No, you couldn't have. <laughs> but, look, if you haven't lived here in 16 years, you said? Yes, 16. Well, what's the painting doing there now? <laughs> you have no doubt heard of actors being forced to leave their luggage behind because of non-payment of rent. <laughs> and you? Oh, Morley. <laughs> well, it's quite all right, Amanda. It's quite all right, especially since I can look at it almost as much as I want to. I can take a peek now and then through the French doors. You poor man. You love that painting, don't you? You're very perceptive. Yes, I do love it. As much as I love this fountain. The fountain? Yes. Did Mrs. Broly tell you? No, no. I don't suppose she did. There's a legend goes along with this fountain. A legend? It's rather tragic. All the better. <laughs> the more romantic. Perhaps. A man, someone who lived in that flat where you live now, as I lived, a man committed suicide at this very spot. Oh, no. Why? I think the phrase of the time was unrequited love. Oh, oh, Morley, that is romantic. It didn't seem so then. What? I mean, to say, the man must have felt the very depths of misery, experienced the most frightful emotional horrors to kill himself. He committed the greatest sin known to man, or God. Suicide? No, 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 no. Despair. And in despairing, renounced his faith in God. No one who believes in God, truly believes, can ever give way to despair. Amanda, you remember that. Yes, Morley, I shall. As for the legend, the fountain ran red with blood, his blood. And then it stopped flowing, just stopped. They've tried to get it flowing again and again, but they have failed every time. According to the legend, it never will flow again until... Until? Until someone, somewhere, sometime, does something so supremely unselfish, so totally and completely selfless, that the sin of suicide committed here is paid for. Beautiful. Beautiful. And when that happens, if ever it does, the fountain will gush forth once more... Um, I was wondering... Yes? Would you have any objection if I came in, well, only for a moment, to have a closer look at that painting? <laughs> Why, of course not. Come along. Thank you, Amanda. Your grandfather, was uh, he a dramatic coach, too? Or did he just uh, pose for... No, no, a... no. He coached actors and actresses just as I do. Well, there it is. Yes, there it is. Amazing, the resemblance. Isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it? Was your grandfather, was, was, well, was he the man who uh, killed himself in the garden? Yes, yes. And she, the girl in the painting. Oh, he loved her. He loved her. And she loved him. Or so she let him believe. She was one of his pupils. Beautiful. Talented. I can't tell you how beautiful. How talented. Oh, I shouldn't think you could, since you weren't born yet. Yes. Yes, that's, that's quite true. Quite true. It's only hearsay. Well, what happened? Well, she began to get rather good parts and began to be known. And, well, she met a wealthy man and fell in love with him. Or some said his money. Oh, dear. It must have been tragic. It was more than I could bear. You? Oh, my... My, my, my grandfather, of course. Uh, but but you, you said more than you could bear. My imagination. I have a flair. I have a talent for placing myself in a situation of becoming uh, the people oh. involved. I imagine myself. Well, you've played the game called imagination, of course. No, I, I've never even heard of it. Oh, it's a wonderful game. And... Incidentally, extremely helpful to an actor or actress. Would you care to play it? Well, I... Well, let's do. Now, <laughs> let's imagine ourselves to be, well, those 
Those two people in the painting. All right. How do we go about it? First, look closely at the painting. Mm -hmm. Try to see every detail. Every detail. For instance, the furniture. Old-fashioned. High-backed couch with brocaded upholstery and anima That's right. And the table lamps, beaded lamps they call them, I think. That's right, that's right. And the gas jets on the walls. Notice? How could I help but notice? I feel as if those lamps are actually lit. As if the gas jets are really glowing, as if I... Yes, yes, yes. I'm in the room with him... His arms around me, his lips close to mine. God. It's all so real. I am that woman in the painting. You are, you are. You have become her. You have become Iris Jordan. Iris Jordan? That was her name. Is her name because you bring it to life again. Iris. Oh, Iris. 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 No, no. What are you doing? Darling, Let me go. I love you. I love you. Molly. Mr. Norcross. Please, Iris. Unhand me, sir. Iris. You hear me, sir? Unhand please, me. Please. I've told you I no longer love you. I love another, Thomas Broly, and I'm going to no, marry don't him. Don't do this to me, Iris. I beg you. Miss Phillips. I beg you. Don't. Door. I can't bear it. I can't Miss bear it. Phillips. I'll kill myself. Do you hear me? I'll kill myself. Miss Phillips. Miss Phillips. What? Is... Why were you crying out like that? We... I guess I... I got carried away, but... But we were only playing a game. A game? We? Morley Norcross and... Why? He's not here. Mrs. Broly? Broly? Is your first name... Iris? Oh. Oh, what if it is? Are you... Were you the girl in that painting? I... Well, you know, I, I... I I think you're out of your mind. You were the girl in that painting, weren't you? You were an actress. And you were in love with Morley Norcross, but you jilted him for a man named Broly. Thomas Broly. Miss Phillips, I will ask you to vacate these premises in the morning. This room, that garden, they're haunted, aren't they? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. Not only the room and the garden, but that painting, all haunted by the ghost of Morley Norcross, the man you loved and then jilted more than 60 years ago. I, I... That's why you rent this place so cheaply. $45 a week. Tenants just don't stay here very long, do they? How long has it been since the last tenant, Mrs. Broly? How long? Well, more than a year. I see. <laughs> What happened to the last tenant? Dead. Found dead in the garden. She'd been strangled. And that's why you weren't able to rent the place? No. The tenant before... Found dead? Strangled? Yes, I... Oh, my dear child, I only pretended to be angry with you and demanded you to leave to... To save your life after letting me rent the place. I hope the haunting was over, but I see now it isn't. Morley's ghost will haunt this place, haunt me till the moment I die. You must go in the morning. No. No. I'm not afraid of ghosts, Mrs. Broly. But more than that, I don't want to leave. Don't ask me why. I don't know. I'm afraid I do. What? Because you've done what I'm almost sure the others did. They couldn't bring themselves to leave either. And they didn't know why. Nor did I then. But I think I'm beginning to know that. You've fallen in love with Morley Norcross, Miss Phillips. You've fallen in love with a ghost. Well. There's a twist for you. Has Amanda fallen in love with the ghost of Morley Norcross? Or is some other power, some other force at work? Let's not forget that we've been talking about not ghosts, but the baffling, the mysterious complexities of the human mind. I'll return shortly with Act Three.
fall in love with a ghost. That surely must be a curious experience, to say nothing of a dangerous one. Especially when, if previous tenants of Amanda's little apartment did the same thing, they were strangled to death as a result. But why? Morley Norcross, his ghost, that is, seems a charming, gentle, anything but violent spirit. So why? Amanda certainly has no answer. As for Gil, the man who hopes to marry her... I just don't plain believe it. The story of yours of what happened here last night. True, Gil, every word of it. You can check it out if you want to. You're a lawyer. Go to police headquarters or wherever you go. Find out if two women were strangled here or not. If you believe all this, what are you staying here for? Mrs. Broly says, thinks, (laughs) I've fallen in love with Morley. (sighs) Now I've heard everything. You in love with a ghost. Amanda, you don't think you are, do you? If you think that, then you need help, sweetie. You need help in a bad way. No, you're telling me I'm crazy. Well, if you're not, you certainly sound it. I think you better go, Gil. Now, wait a minute. Please, Gil. I take time off from the office to come down here and drive you to a tryout. Your first audition for a Broadway play, and now you tell me to get lost. I'm sorry, but you're getting so upset, so angry with you, and we've never quarreled like this before, never. Sweetheart, I'm sorry. I really am. Now, come on now. Try the eyes. Oh, Gil. I can't believe you're in love with a ghost. But you wouldn't be in love with another man, would you? (laughs) Don't be silly. Let's go or I'll be late for my audition. Belling and Maxwell. Gilbert Franklin, please. One moment. Hello? Gil, Amanda. Oh, Gil, I'm so excited. You got the part. Not the little part, the walk-on. Gil, they listened to me for the ingenue lead. And I got it. I got it. Ingenue lead? Hey, that's fantastic. I can't believe it. I can't either. (laughs) This calls for a celebration. I'll take you out to dinner tonight. A champagne dinner. No, no, no. Let's celebrate here. At your place? I haven't cooked in a week. I'll go out and do some shopping. Okay, and I'll bring the champagne. Enough for the three of us. The three of us? You, me, and your ghost boyfriend. <laughs> I don't think that's very funny, Gil. Uh-oh, I put my foot in it again. Forgive me. Uh, now, come on, tell me you forgive me. I forgive you. And, uh, honey? Yeah? Ask Morley Norcross to forgive me, too. <laughs> well, I never, I just never. <laughs> I, I just never. You know, Amanda, that's virtually becoming a cue line for me. Why? Yeah, why have you gone so white? Why are you trembling so? I I know now that you're a ghost. Oh. It makes me feel scary. Oh, please, no. The last thing in the world I want is to frighten you. But you ought to know that, particularly since I did all I could today to help you get the ingenue lead in Hope Springs Eternal. You? Didn't you know? Yes, I did. I felt something. Something that lifted me above myself, above my talent. It made me act as I've never acted before. But I didn't know it was you. It was. I was there all the time, coaching you. Now, still frightened of me? No, not really. Only... Yes? Did you strangle them, Morley? (sighs) The two women who lived here before you? Yes. I confess it, I did Why? The painting there above the fireplace. I didn't tell you the whole story behind it. Why not? I was ashamed. Ashamed? Of what I did to Iris, or tried to do. You see, my dear, she didn't leave me for Thomas Broly just because she'd fallen out of love with me. I was the reason she fell out of love. My ungovernable temper. Temper? Rage is a closer word. Violent rage. Another word for it would be ego. My ego that demanded its way or I would fly into an insane fury. Iris, yes, the withered little woman who was your landlady, feared me. Loved me, but feared me. And that is why she left me. That is why, let me also confess, 
I killed myself out there by the fountain. Not from despair, as I told you. Not from misery. But from sheer, limitless, violent rage. And I have been paying for it ever since. Oh, Morley. You helped me today. How can I help you? Amanda. Are you sure you want to? Oh, yes. Very sure? Very sure. Then meet me. Meet me by the fountain tonight. At ten minutes of twelve. Tonight. Ten minutes of twelve? That was the hour I took my life. Promise you'll be there. I'll be there, Morley. I promise. All right, Amanda. All right, I'll leave. Gil, don't be angry, but... What'd you expect me to be? I invite you to dinner to celebrate. You say, oh, no, come to my place, I'll make dinner. I come, I bring the champagne, and from the minute dinner is over, you keep suggesting I leave. Gil, it's late. A quarter to twelve midnight is late. It is for me. I've had a long, nerve-wracking day, and I'm... Okay, okay, I'm going. Do you want to know something? I may not be back. Oh, Gil. 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 scent of lavender coming from the garden. Yes, Morley. I'm coming. Coming. Yes? Yes, who is it? Gil Franklin, Mrs. Brody. Just a minute. Just a minute. What do you mean, disturbing an old woman at this hour of the night? I need my rest. And I need my girl, Mrs. Brody. The girl I intend to marry. What's that got to do with me? (sighs) Maybe nothing, maybe everything. All I know, there's something queer going on here, especially tonight. And I intend to get to the bottom of it. Mrs. Brody, I want to know the whole story. The whole story, you understand? Of what's happened in that room since Morley Norcross committed suicide over 60 years ago. I startled you again. Not really. It's just ten of twelve. And a beautiful moonlit night. Very beautiful. You're ready. You're sure you're ready to keep your promise. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What do you want me to do? Amanda, you think of me as a ghost. You are. Ghost. Ghost. It, it's only a word, my dear, because, because I am dead doesn't mean I don't exist. I do. I am as alive as you. Only, I live on a different plane of existence now. A different plane of existence? You might even say a different level of consciousness. I... I don't understand. No mortal does. No mortal can. Try. It's... It's as simple as this. Nothing is. Nothing begins, nothing ends. It's all the same. A continuum. Only, on different levels, varying planes of life of living. To sum it up, my darling, there is no such thing as life. No such thing as death. I I guess I don't understand. <laughs> you know, the level I'm on, I don't understand all of it either. This only do I know. The world that was once mine and is now yours is nothing but illusion. Illusion, my dearest. That is all it is So it will be only an illusion you leave now. Leave? My world? To enter mine. Oh. You promised. Remember, you promised. Yes, but... Oh, Morley, how can I leave it? My world? Illusion. Illusion, reality, call it what you like. I don't know. But Morley... Morley, I'm I'm going to be the ingenue lead in a Broadway play... It's what I've wanted, dreamed of, yearned for since I was a child. I can't leave that. You must. I can't. I tell you, you must. Can't you understand? What you're you're leaving is nothing. Nothing to what you'll find on my plane. I'm not taking anything from you. I'm giving you everything. But what I want... You promised. You promised. Rotten hell if you didn't promise. You're strangling me. You promised. You promised me. (sighs) Keep my promise. I didn't say I wouldn't. Only that... That I... Wanted something else. So much. 
so much. You wanted it that much? You want it that much? <laughs> yes. But you would give it up for me? A promise is a promise. Oh, and a selfless act is a selfless act. What? Amanda? Amanda? She's not here in the room. The girl. Look, Amanda. Look. And listen. The fountain. It's flowing again. And birds singing in the garden. Remember I said the fountain would never flow again. The birds sing no more until someone, somewhere, sometime, did something so supremely unselfish, so totally and completely selfless that the act of suicide committed here. My suicide would be painful. Oh, Amanda. 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 I knew it would be you. I knew it. Amanda. And I was right. Amanda. Gil. Oh, Gil. Darling, darling, darling. Oh, the fountain. Oh, my God, the fountain. Yes, it's flowing again, Mrs. Foley, and the birds are singing. I, I don't understand. I Don't try. Just don't bother trying, Mrs. Broly. But, but I must, because I've always had the feeling that if ever the fountain started again, I... I would stop. You... you would... Oh, oh, oh. Gil, catch her. She's fainted. No, Amanda. She's dead. Not dead, Gil. Alive. Very much Alive. On another level, another plane of existence. And oh God, make it a happier one for her and Morley. Planes of existence, levels of consciousness, the self, the over self, the super self. What do I know? comes to that, what do you know? We don't. Because if what I read, what they tell me is so, our brains simply aren't equipped to understand. I once asked a Buddhist monk about this, and he said, you mustn't try to understand, just experience. <laughs> that says it all, I guess. I'll be back shortly. Amanda Phillips didn't become a Broadway star. She became Mrs. Gilbert Franklin. Oh, she played the ingenue lead in Hope Springs Eternal, all right. But the play folded in New Haven. Well, if Morley Norcross was right, it doesn't much matter. After all, the world we live in, you and I, nothing but illusion. Some illusion. Our cast included Diane Baker, John Newland, Anne Seymour, and Dennis Cole. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. I'm not with the police, I swear it. And why all the questions, huh? Why all the nosing around? Take it easy. I don't want no trouble in here. Hey, something. She's got to be. Best told her I do business in your place, and now she shows up here the next morning. Don't that sound fishy to you? Oh, well, it's funny. Oh, come on, baby. Jim. Jimmy, don't. I, I was just the statue. Oh, I just wanted the statue. The what? I, I guess she needs this thing. What's oh. the statue got to do with... Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. You... You're right, Wormer. She's not a cop. Yeah, she's been acting like a cop, but that's not what she is. Please, please. Oh, please let me go. I, I didn't mean any harm. Please oh, let me no, go. No, 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 sugar. You're not a cop at all. What you are is a nun. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. 
Until next time, pleasant dreams. Are you familiar with the concept of shrunken heads? You might think they're just stories from explorers about far-off tribes, plot devices from Gilligan's Island, or a scene from the horror comedy film Beetlejuice, but they're actually quite real. They might be small, but the practice of making shrunken heads has a big history. And that is the topic of this week's Mind of Marlar, which you can find right now by visiting mindofmarlar.com. You can usually count on psychic and counselor Maria de Andrea to provide upbeat, positive insight on a variety of occult matters. But even Maria has had her life touched by an evil, ghostly presence or two, as the following story from her contribution to knife-wielding demons and murderous ghosts demonstrates. What starts as an etheric sword fight between ghostly combatants crosses over into physical reality with terrifying results. This is how Maria tells the story. One cold and dreary night, I was doing some spiritual blessings at a cemetery at the request of a client to help his recently passed away relative through the transition from one reality to the next. As I walked through the grounds looking for the gravestone, I thought I heard a strange sound. As I tried to listen more, I realized it sounded like arguing but in a language I didn't know. I ignored it, thinking it had nothing to do with me, and kept walking in search of the gravestone. I found the spot I was looking for, did the blessing, and started back to my car. Soon it sounded like the arguing was closer, then it sounded far away, then again closer, like they were moving around everywhere in the cemetery. I was still thinking it didn't concern me, but I became curious as to what was going on, so I started to walk toward the sounds. Yes, I knew it was not my smartest move. As I headed in the direction of the sounds, I heard what sounded like metal hitting metal. I rounded a bend, and there were two etheric soldiers fighting. There were swords clashing and making a terrible clanking sound, one was a Confederate soldier and the other a Union soldier. Apparently, they didn't know the war between the states was over. They seemed out of control, vengeful, as though they were in a whirlwind and couldn't stop. I heard a few words, although not the entire sentence, and I wasn't paying attention to their meaning. They said the following words, ambush, conscript, and a few more, but those are the ones I remember. After all, I was more focused on the deadly fight. They were both covered in blood. Some blood looked dark with an eerie glow, while some looked like the blood was dripping off various body parts. It looked gruesome. As I stood there, transfixed at a distance, all of a sudden they both turned their heads and looked at me. At first I thought they were looking at something else, so why would they notice and see me? They both started running toward me, waving their swords. Initially, I thought that since they were spirit and non-physical, that they wouldn't harm me. I was wrong. As they ran toward me, one of them threw his sword toward me, and I heard it as it splintered part of the tree near me, so it could harm me physically. 
It didn't occur to me previously that anyone would throw a sword. I turned and ran toward my car. I knew when to retreat. I kept thinking as I headed toward the parking lot, I hope they don't realize their spirit because they would be able to gain quicker ground not being limited by physical laws. I didn't even look back since I still heard them yelling and they sounded like they were getting nearer. I heard the second sword hit a stone near me, but by then I was at my car. It seemed they were attached to the cemetery because they didn't follow when I got to the parking lot. Some days it doesn't pay to be curious. Hopefully nobody else will see them because if you don't see them, they might not be aware of you either. More true stories of homicidal ghosts when Weird Darkness returns. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment, for this is a time of mystery, a time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour. which held the mummy of Ptolemy III, these words were written, Death to him who disturbs the everlasting resting place of these sacred remains. Two weeks ago, William Cartwright, a famous Egyptologist, defied this curse, 
He bought the mummy, had it sent to his home. That same day, he slowly walked down the stairs from his upstairs study. His wife, Martha, heard his familiar footsteps in the hall, over the stairs. But she did not know that her husband was then walking into a nothingness. That he would completely disappear, leaving no trace of his whereabouts. Now, it is two o'clock the following morning. The Cartwright house is still. A taut feeling of mystery hovers in the air. Martha Cartwright is dreaming of her missing husband. And in her dream, as in her waking hours, she is haunted by the fear of Ptolemy's curse. William? William? Martha, I hear you. Do you hear me? William, where are you? Downstairs. I'm downstairs, Martha. Downstairs? Here in our house? In our study. Come to the study, Martha. I'll come. I'll come, William. Here in the study, Martha. Come to the study. Yes, William. The study. I'm here, William. Here at the study door. Look for me. Where are you, William? Look for me, Martha. Darkness. Can't see you. Come over the carpet to the mummy case. To the mummy case. The mummy of Ptolemy III. Yes. Yes, William, I'm here. Look at the mummy closely, Martha. I am looking, William. Don't you see? All I see is a strange, misty light. Like a halo. Shining, glowing about the mummy. Lean forward then, Martha. Look closely. Uh, Look closely. No, I can't. I can't. You must, Martha. Look at the mummy's face. The face? Can't you see, Martha? Can't you see what it is? No. No, it's just... I don't know what you mean. The features, Martha. Don't you see anything different about the features? Gray, shrunken, shriveled skin. Gray and horrible. But the lips, the forehead, the eyes. Don't you see, Martha? Have you forgotten so soon? Forgotten? I remember you, William. I'll always remember you. But if the eyes were open, if they were open, Martha, could you... Look, now they are open, Martha. Yes. I see. Now I see. William, the mummy has your face. Yes, Martha, that's it. The mummy and I, we're the same, Martha. The same. The same? William! Dr. John Crandall. This is he. Oh. Who, who's this, Martha? Yes, John. Uh, look, I had to call you. I'm so afraid. I thought the operator could never get my call through. Yes, I know. The long-distance lines are pretty well tied up. What's the matter, Martha? What time is it? It's very late, but I couldn't wait till morning. John, something's happened. Have they found William? Yes. I, I mean, no. I, I don't know. Look, John, I need you badly. I think I'm going out of my mind. Oh, nonsense. What happened? I've got to see you, John, please, tonight. I'm asking you this not only as a patient, but as a friend. But I can't come into town tonight, Martha. Oh, you're all right. It's just your imagination. Oh, no. I thought it was a dream. Well, I've got a job here that's got to be finished, but I, I can leave the hospital early in the morning. Come as soon as you can, please. I promise, Martha. Now, take hold of yourself. Control is the word. Remember. I'll try, John. I'll try. <laughs> It can't be. It can't be. Hello. Is this Mr. Crowell? Yes. Uh, this is Martha Cartwright, Mr. Crowell. I'm sorry to wake you up if I did. Oh, no, no, no. That is all right. I've got to see you first thing in the morning. It's important. It's urgent. Why, of course, Mrs. Cartwright. Will you come here to my house at 9 o'clock? At 9. I will be there. 
But what is the trouble? It's about that mummy you sold my husband. Oh, I, I see. Don't fail me, Mr. Crowell. Oh, no, no, I will be there without fail. <laughs> Mrs. Cartwright? You're Mr. Crowell? Yes. Come in, please. Thank you. You're the gentleman who sold my husband the mummy, aren't you? Yes. Well, I want you to take it away. Take it away? Yes, immediately. You're here right away. But, Mrs. Cartwright... I'm sorry. I'm terribly upset. No, I understand. How soon can you take it away? Perhaps tomorrow morning. But... What do you want me to do with it? I don't know. I don't care. Sell it or give it away. Do anything you want with it. Well, that would be very difficult. You see, one reason your husband was able to buy it was... Well, perhaps we'd better not discuss it right now. You mean it's cursed? Yes. Misfortune has always been attached to it. Do you believe in this curse? I have specialized in the art and civilization of the pharaohs for 20 years. My experience has taught me to respect their ideas. Yes, Mrs. Cartwright. I believe in the curse. Can you tell me what the curse says? Death to him who disturbs these sacred remains. A death of torture, of maddening pain. Death in its strangest form. And now, now that my husband is dead, I may be the next victim? Hmm. You must take it back. Please, Mr. Crowell, I can't have it here another night. I haven't slept for days. I can't keep my eyes open, but I'm afraid to sleep. Why don't you leave this house until tomorrow? I can't. I'm expecting my doctors. Then perhaps you will be able to take a nap before he arrives. Perhaps. Well, thank you, Mr. Crowell. You'll take it tomorrow, then. Yes. Uh, Goodbye, Mrs. Cartwright. William. Death in its strangest form. Not you, William. A death of torture, of maddening pain. They couldn't, William, they couldn't. Martha, do you hear me? William. Yes, Martha. Where are you? I'm in the study, Martha. You remember where you saw me last night? No, no, it was a dream last night. You were in the mummy case, then it couldn't be. Yes, I'm still there, Martha. Come and you'll see. No, William, I couldn't go there again, no. I haven't disappeared. I'm here in the house. You want to be with me? I'm here in the study, Martha. I can't come to you. I'm afraid. Afraid of me, your husband? Yes, William, I know. I'll come to you. Down here, Martha, in the study. I'm coming to you, William. I'll do anything you say, but don't make me look at the face. You must, Martha. No, William, I'll do anything. Not that, please. No, not that, no. Martha. Please don't make me. Well, please, I can't do it. Martha, Uh, wake up. It's John. John Cranston. I'm going to die. I know I'm going to die. I don't want to look at that face again. Please don't make me. William, please, please. Martha. John Crandall. You were walking in your sleep, Martha. I'm, I'm sorry I slapped you, but... I had to wake you. Oh, you're here, John. Thank heavens you're here. Is there anything left that you haven't told me, Martha? That's all I know, John. I'm not going crazy, am I? No, Martha. As a psychiatrist, I can tell you that you're not going crazy. This is all the result of the shock of Will's disappearance. But that doesn't explain the curse, John. What about... Oh, nonsense. Civilized people don't believe in curses. Those statements were inscribed on tombs to frighten away grave robbers. So hard for me to believe that now. Martha, I want you to make an experiment with me. What? Let's go into the study together and look at the mummy. Oh, no, 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 I can't. But you've got to. It's the only way you can overcome your fear. Uh, just let me prove that it's only your imagination and nothing oh, more. Please, if no. If you want me to help you, Martha, you have to help me, too. Come. All right. That's it. Here's the study. Where's the light switch? John, wait. Don't turn on the light. But, Martha, Look I... Look there, John. You see it? You see that misty light? 
just the moon coming through the blinds. No, no, it's the mummy. Look at it. The mummy. You see it? That gray light that shines around it. I'm not sleeping, John. I'm here with you. And look at that face. Look closely, John. I am, Martha. You see that face? William's face? As though it were dead for centuries? Is this a nightmare, too? No, no, it's not a nightmare. I see it. And that mummy is William's body. It's the curse of Ptolemy III. But you laughed at John. You laughed. Martha. Now William's gone. He's dead. Martha, please. And I'll be cursed just as John was. You don't believe that. I do, I do. Why didn't he believe it when they told him? Now it's too late, don't you see? Now I'll die as William died. Because now the mummy belongs to me. <laughs> Dr. Cartwright, a famous Egyptologist, purchased a mummy called Ptolemy III, despite the fact that it was known to be cursed. The same day, he vanished. Now his wife has been suffering from the delusion that the mummy has acquired Cartwright's features. In fact, is Cartwright. Dr. Crandall, a psychoanalyst and a friend of the Cartwrights, has tried to disprove this only to find that he, too, notices a strange resemblance. Now, we find Dr. Crandall attending Mrs. Cartwright in a hospital. It's daylight, isn't it? Yes. How do you feel? Better. What happened to me? Well, you were suffering from lack of sleep, Martha, and your nerves were so unstrung that I thought it best to bring you here for a while. Do you believe in the curse now, John? After what you saw? No. But you saw the same thing I did? Yes. How do you explain it? I'm not sure that I can explain it yet, Martha. But after I brought you here, I went back to the house again to look at the mummy. And? It was gone. Go? Oh, I suppose Mr. Kroll called for it. Who is Mr. Kroll? He's the man through whom William bought the mummy. I asked him to take it away. I see. Well, I'm going to leave you now, Martha. There are several things I want to take care of. But I'll be back this evening, and I want you to come with me to Mr. Kroll's place. Why? I want to see that mummy again. Oh, but, John, I... why must I do that? Are you still afraid of the curse? Yes. Well, I still intend to prove to you that there is no such thing. I'm going to buy that mummy. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Kroll. Oh, Mrs. Cartwright. And... Uh, this is Dr. John Crandall. No, oh, good evening. How do you do, sir? Mrs. Cartwright brought me here so that I could see the mummy of Ptolemy III. Of course. Of co May I ask why you wish to see it? I'm interested in buying it. I've tried to convince him that it's cursed, Mr. Kroll, but he doesn't want to believe it. Mm, many men have refused to believe it. It is only fair that we inform those we intend to buy. And the rest is entirely up to them. Now, if you step this way, please. The mummy is in my workshop. Thank you. <clears> hmm. <throat> I notice you have many other mummies here, don't you, Mr. Crow? Oh, yes. I am known as an expert in repairing them. They are sent from museums and collectors all over the world. Hmm. And which is Ptolemy the Third? In this sarcophagus, right here. Will you open it? Why, of course, certainly. <laughs> Now, just a moment, Martha. Don't go away. I want you to look at it. But John... It's very important. There. Uh, there you are, sir. There it is. Martha, is that the mummy we looked at last night? You see, I'm not sure. I saw it for only a few minutes. It looks the same, but... But what? The faces... I mean, the features are not so familiar. How do you mean? This one doesn't look like William. Perhaps the light is too sharp here. Uh, do you think you could turn the lights off for a second, Mr. Kroll? No, 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 Mr. Kroll, no, I'm afraid. Martha, you know I'm not trying to hurt you any more than you've already been hurt by this whole affair. But I must get you to believe that there is no such thing as a curse of this kind. But, uh... If you don't do as I say, your condition may grow even worse, beyond my control. Is that clear? Yes. 
Now, Mr. Cole, will you turn off the light? Of course. Are you looking at the mummy in that sarcophagus, Martha? Yes. Do you see anything now? No. So pitch black I can't see anything at all. Nothing. I see. John, you know I haven't been imagining all this. You... <gasps> what is it, Martha? Over there. Look near that other wall. Face. That's Williams, just as we saw it last night, John. With that glow all around it. And, and it's moving. Look, it's moving. John, make him turn on the light. John! Mr. Cole, will you turn on the light? Please, hurry. Why, certainly. Oh! Oh! Oh, John. All right, Martha, all right. We'll get you out of here. Will you open the door, Mr. Cole? Why, of course, Doctor. And uh, could I ask you to get Mrs. Cartwright a glass of water? A pleasure, I'm sure. Martha, Martha, listen to me carefully. Mm. I've got to explain quickly. As soon as you leave here, go straight to the nearest telephone and call the police. Tell them to come here immediately. I don't understand. I know now that William was murdered. What? Yes, Cole killed him, and I'm going to stay here with him until the police arrive. I beg your pardon, I, I have the water. Oh, thank you, thank you. Now, drink this, Martha, and take the pill I just gave you. Yes. That's it. Now I think you'd better go home, and uh, don't forget what I told you. Yes, John, I'll go home. Goodbye, Mr. Crowell. Goodbye, madame. Oh, it's terrible, sir. She's completely obsessed with the fear of that mummy, and it's destroying her. She loved her husband very much, I'm sure. Of course, of course. But more than anything else, it's her insane fear of that curse. And is that the reason you want to purchase the mummy, Dr. Crandall? Precisely. In that case, maybe I can help you. You can? Uh, yes, let us talk about it. Uh, but first, would you like to have a drink? I noticed you are rather fatigued after what just has happened. Yes, I guess I could stand something. Uh, will you join me? <laughs> Why should I leave myself out? <laughs> Why, of course, I, I have some very fine old spirits here. <laughs> and now, <laughs> there we are. Uh, I hope... What was that? What? Is there somebody else in your workroom? I thought I heard a noise from there. Well, there is nobody there that I know of. No, no. It must be your imagination, Doctor. Oh. Perhaps you yourself can take one of those pills you just administered to Mrs. Cartwright. <laughs> yes, she, she has been a very trying patient, I'll admit. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> to her early recovery. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> hey, dear, there is nothing quite like it, is there, eh, Doctor? Yes, it, it's very fine, I must say. Now, I don't like to hurry you, Mr. Cole, but I'm very much interested in your idea to help Mrs. Cartwright. Well, let us start at the beginning. When you first came into the shop with Mrs. Cartwright and she looked at the mummy, she did not see anything about it that frightened her. Is that right? Right. But when you suggested that we turn off the lights, it was then, for the first time, that she was aware of her, well, shall we say, her hallucination. And uh, what do you suggest? I suggest that she have the mummy return to her house and then have her practice looking at it while the lights are on. And in this way, she might forget the hallucinations of seeing her husband's face. But suppose she is not suffering from hallucinations, oh, Mr. Crow. Well, you yourself saw what a change came over her when the lights were turned off. But she was not frightened by the mummy you originally showed her. No? No, Mr. Crow. Mrs. Cartwright saw the mummy you didn't mm. want her to see. The mummy that you took from her house... The mummy that happens to be no mummy at all, but is, in fact, the body of her husband. You know that? That was why you hung a curtain in front of that mummy before we arrived. And how did you know it was behind the curtain in my workroom? Because of the glow of light around it. I could see that glow when the lights were turned off, so I took the curtain away completely. <laughs> that was what made Mrs. Cartwright think it was moving. Oh, I see. You are a very astute doctor. Could you tell me, perhaps, what you think made the misty glow? That's simple. It was the natural body gases and fluids which you forgot to extract before you applied your preservative to Dr. Cartwright's corpse when you mummy You are quite right. That was the only mistake I made. There are certain things that you can't hide, Kroll, such as your bleached hair and beard. Your real name is Cavarella, isn't it? Oh, so you are not only a doctor, you are a detective as well. Well, you see, I knew that William Cartwright was one of the foremost Egyptologists in this country. And as such, he was often called upon to testify as an expert witness in many fraudulent cases connected with the culture. How so? Yes. 
So I went through those cases with the district attorney on the assumption that one of those defendants was connected in some way with Cartwright's disappearance. And the district attorney told you about me? I found out that you'd been convicted in one of those and sent to prison for 12 years on the basis of Cartwright's testimony. Oh, well, we all make mistakes, Dr. Crandall. Even you. What do you mean? That drink you just had. It was poisoned. And in a few more minutes, perhaps, you will be dead. But I promise you one thing. I will not make the same mistake on your corpse that I did on Cartwright's. No, you... You... Oh, my throat! <laughs> you are beginning to feel the effect of the poison. You can't get away with this. I, I'll come back after I'm dead. I am not the superstitious one, Doctor. I... I can't breathe. My, my throat! <laughs> dead. And now, before Mrs. Cartwright can return with the police, as you have instructed her, I... Uh, Mrs. Cartwright. Yes, I want to talk to Dr. Crandall. You said... You killed him. Yes. And I am very glad you have returned. What are you going to do? Well, you see, I was just about to change Dr. Crandall's features completely so that I would not have a repetition of the same trouble. Although I did not want to kill him, I guess I was a little hasty. It was you I should have killed, my dear Mrs. Cartwright. Don't touch me. So you went out to call the police, eh? But they will never find out. Not with my way. You'll find out. You can't do this. You can't get away with to it. To the police, it will be just another disappearance. A disappearance caused by the curse of Ptolemy. People like to believe those things, Mrs. Cartwright. No. No. <coughs> you can't do it, Crowley. Well, you, Dr. You didn't Crowley. believe me, Crowell. I told you I'd come back. John! It's not true. It can't be. I... You feel the pain, Crowell. <coughs> the pain in your throat. I feel it. But... Yes, I do. What is it? In your chest, and now it's around your heart. No, no. No, Yes, it is. Come into my heart. I, I can't breathe. Oh, you're choking me. Choking me. It's dead. John, you're alive. I don't understand. I know how trying this is for you, Martha, but listen to me. I'll explain but it. But I just... Saw... I wasn't dead. Kroll offered me a poison drink but I distracted his attention by pretending to hear something outside. Oh. When he went to look, I switched the drinks, and he was the one who got the poison. When I saw you there, I thought the mummy's curse had worked again. No, Martha. That curse we talked about so much was only Kroll's own invention, and it came back to him. If he'd never thought it up, he would never have died as a result of it. and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, 
sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness, I'm Darren Marlar. And if you like Weird Darkness and you like even more of this kind of content, you can check out the free audiobooks that I've narrated at WeirdDarkness.com. I've got free audiobooks there from Stephen King, H.P. Lovecraft, Charles Dickens, Robert Heinlein, and more. You can listen to all of the free audiobooks I've narrated on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. We now continue with more true stories of murderous ghosts on Weird Darkness. Another contributor comes from researcher and author Adele Casales Rosa, whose book Portal – A Lifetime of Paranormal Experiences details numerous encounters with the unknown, her own as well as those of others. In a chapter called The Horror of Baguio, Rosa recounts a story of a young Filipino husband and father named Ernest who is crippled with depression because of a monstrous presence not everyone around him could perceive. The creature's continued presence almost every twilight, Rosa writes, consumed Ernest's waking hours. His apprehensions of being taken by the creature, body and soul, started to show in his poetry. His poems, which were an outlet for his internal turmoil, turned even darker, drearier, and more foreboding. His siblings, who read his opus, became concerned and from concern became alarmed when he wrote one poem which began as, The Bird That Flies Is False. Themes of death became prominent. The creature tormenting the young poet was described like this. Embracing the window with a wingspan of more than six feet from tip to tip was a bat taller than a man. Its leathery wings ended in a talon-like grasp at the edges of the window. Its yellow eyes were like a cow's. The semblance of horns protruded from its black head, and it had a goatee at the end of its pointed chin. The face of a goat with the eyes of a cow and a leathery body framed by the wings of a bat. It is an eerie thing to contemplate, that such a creature would repeatedly appear and yet never leave any physical traces behind such as animal tracks or bat droppings. In spite of its physical nature, its effect on the young percipient was decidedly psychological and emotional, as was its impact on his family. To learn the story's tragic end, you can read Knife-Wielding Demons and Murderous Ghosts and prepare yourself for a tale as sorrowful as it is strange. Scott Corrales, a most prolific writer and translator of Hispanic UFO and paranormal articles and books, has become a frequent contributor to Global Communications Books. For this particular volume, Scott provides a survey of cult-related murders and satanic secret societies. The following is an excerpt from his chapter in Knife-Wielding Demons and Murderous Ghosts. It came as a surprise to readers of Chile's La Tercera newspaper that the nation's Chamber of Deputies, similar to the U.S. House of Representatives, has held hearings in relation to the existence of 80 active satanic groups in their country, 40 of them classified as dangerous clandestine groups. The cults are allegedly involved in such ghastly acts as consuming human flesh, necrophilia, and self-mutilation. According to sociologist and cult researcher Umberto Lagos, satanic groups were proliferating throughout Chile since the year 2000. The groups are never large, size not being a consideration, rather the amount of damage they can cause being the major factor, and are formed by young males 30 and younger who cut off one of their fingers as a sign of belonging to the cult. Lagos, the government's main consultant on the matter, added that lonely, elevated areas such as La Pyramide are frequented by these cultists for their weekly rituals. A cross-section of the cult members 
would reveal disaffected youth who blame society for their ills and, in a Catholic country, rebel against one of the most visible societal symbols. Police officers report that these places are often marked by a hexagon with the number 666 and fenced with inverted crosses. The cultists drink alcohol and take drugs prior to engaging in sexual rituals. However, the Viticura Sheriff's Department, which is in charge of the La Pyramida sector, has not recorded any reports from local residents regarding strange rituals or situations in the area. It's believed that 300 such groups exist throughout Chile, acting in small cells, much like terrorist outfits. Many of them are not satanic but rather practitioners of Santeria or other Afro-Caribbean religions, which have gained considerable followings in South America. The Chamber of Deputies Committee on Cults was impaneled as a result of charges of white slavery leveled against the Center for Tibetan Studies in the city of Viña del Mar. The new anti-cult legislation would follow the European model, which makes manipulation of conscience and any form of mental manipulation or obfuscation a crime. None of this, according to the information in La Tercera, compares with the most violent case recorded, the 1994 incident involving a satanic neo-Nazi cult engaging in child abductions in order to torture them and subject them to all manner of sexual outrages. The cult celebrated its rituals at night in the vicinity of the sports club of the town of Sausalito. The Chilean newspaper does not go on to state if there was any link between the cultists and the members of the upper-class athletic club. While such a connection may at first seem startling, it has been seen elsewhere, as in the case involving a group of Mexican Satanists who carried out their rituals in Chapultepec Park, not far from the elite Restaurante del Lago eatery. Another case involving upper-middle-class practitioners of ritual magic appeared in Spain's El País newspaper on March 23, 1999, when it was reported that members of the Fraternidad Blanca Universal, or Universal White Fraternity, had performed a ritual designed to enhance both pleasure and longevity in the coastal resort town of La Alfas del Pai, which resulted in the death of Natalie Castleford, 38, a Belgian national. According to the press, the cultists placed a blanket over Castleford's body and several people proceeded to sit on her in order to interrupt her breathing process, a method which, according to the cult's beliefs, causes intense pleasure extends natural lifespan and purifies the body. At this point, it must be added that police officials in these countries, while at first baffled by the nature of the crime, tend to react swiftly and usually get their man after diligent detective work, often resorting to infiltrating the cults. In October 2002, Spain's El Mundo newspaper carried a story on how Italian law enforcement had successfully broken up the Angels of Sodom, a satanic cult in the city of Pescara in eastern Italy, led by a 32-year-old reverend known as Jan Ash. This cult leader had allegedly belonged to a number of U.S. cults, but decided to establish his own because of his interest in vampiric practices, according to the newspaper. The police apprehended Reverend Ash and three associates during the Pescara raid and confirmed 14 cases of abuse to minors adding that the total list may number in the hundreds since the cult had been operating clandestinely for seven years and reputedly had a considerable number of customers. Keep listening, I have one more homicidal ghost story for you, plus the ghost of a serial killer. Up next. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry too. 
So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Berry Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Berry Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Now, the Hermit. You gotta wait. I can't go a step farther. Gotta keep going. Oh, this heat. This desert heat. I can't go on. Listen, Taylor. We keep going. We're bound to strike civilization before long. Don't be such a devil, Dan. I gotta rest. All right. For a few minutes, then. Desert. Desert. I hate it. Walking for hours. Sun beating down. Uh, stop it, Taylor. You can't go on that way. If you do, you'll go loco. Come on. Let me have a drink of water. Uh, we should wait till the sun goes down. Do us more good, then. You are the devil. Holding out on water. My tongue's like a bale of cotton. All right. You think I'm a devil hold out and out? There isn't any more water. No more water? I drained the last one we took that drink four or five hours ago. I don't believe it. Let me have a bottle. Here. No water. No more water. No more water. Now, listen. Don't do no good to get panicky. Only make your thirst worse. Crying out like that. Just another day would bring us into a settlement. Lost. Our bones will bleach white here on the desert. Sit back and rest. It's getting cooler now. Dan, look. Look over there, atop that rise of sand. I'm looking. Do you see her standing there? I see the dead stump of a tree. So do you. I see her. A beautiful woman. The breeze blow on her dress. So cool, like. And Dan, she's waving to us, beckoning us to come on. Taylor, where are you going? Come back here. Wait, I'm coming. I see you. <coughs> Don't go away. I'll get up. Just wait, that's all. Wait. Follow me. I'll take you to our cabin. Cabin? Water. There's a well near the cabin. Follow me. Dan, she's real. She's telling us to follow her. Dan, hurry. Follow me. Follow me to the cabin. All the water that you wanted me. Follow me. Dan. Dan! Uh, Taylor, Taylor, you've got to get a hold of yourself. I talked to her. There was a woman here. It was no dead tree. She said to follow her. That way. East, she
she said to the cabin and water. Dan, you gotta believe. You gotta try it. Help me up, Dan. Uh, Taylor, you're seeing things. No, you gotta try. She was here. And she said to follow her. I can't believe you saw anyone. It's worth trying, isn't it, Dan? I talked to her. She said to walk this way. Come on. Uh, it's getting too dark to see, Taylor. We ought to... Oh, you're gonna try. Well... Come on. Where's the woman now? She went ahead. I saw her move this way. Hello? Hello? See? No one answers. You didn't see any woman. Well, we gotta keep walking... This way, Dan. Oh, it's crazy. Cabin. Water. The woman said this way. There wasn't any woman. You've gone off your nut, Taylor. If you don't stop this crazy stuff, I'm going to leave you in the morning. Psych out for myself. Look. <sighs> Look. Do you see? Why, all that's good. A light. I told you. Cabin. Water. <sighs> just as a woman said. You must have seen a woman, Taylor. I didn't believe. Come on, Dan, hurry. We've struck real luck. Luck and water. Hello? Hello? We're coming. Hello? No one answers. It ain't a light in a cabin, Taylor. It's a star we see. No. It ain't no star. It's a light in a cabin. Too big for a star. It is pretty big, Taylor. You're right. I can see the shack now. Sure. Come on. The cabin door is open. They've heard us. The woman is waiting for Hooray. us. Hooray. Water. Water. Uh, take it easy, partner. Don't drink too fast or too much at first. That's enough, Taylor, for now. Where's your outfit, stranger? Lost it three days ago. You ain't packing any guns? No, we haven't any. Then you're welcome to stay the night. It was mighty nice of your wife to tell us we were welcome here. What's that, stranger? Your wife, or the woman that told us to follow her here to the cabin and water. I don't savvy what you mean. Uh, funny thing. I could drink forever. But it don't seem to quench my thirst. Let me take the cup now. Both of you better take it easy. Like you said, too much ain't good all of a sudden. Strangers, what are you doing here in the desert? A storm overtook us four or five days ago. We didn't even have time to unpack the animals. And when the storm was over, horses, outfit, everything gone. I see. Now, what was this about you seeing a woman who directed you here to my cabin? Uh, Taylor here. He thought he saw a woman waving to him. A woman who said there was a cabin and a well of water near. But I figured all the time he was seeing things. Sort of a reflected image on the desert sand. Yeah. Folks drifting into insanity are always seeing things on the desert. Sure. I know it. Now, how far away from the nearest settlement? The nearest settlement is about 35 miles due east of here. Not as far as I thought. We can start out in the morning. Sure. I'll give you directions. Fine, partner. Fine. You live here all alone? Yep. My name is Fred Holker. Well, uh, glad to meet you. I'm Dan Torrance. My partner, Taylor Wiley. You're welcome for the night. I'll wrestle up some grub. And after eating, I'll tell you a desert story that'll put you seeing a woman on the desert in the small class as stories go. Yes. I'll tell you a real desert story, if you wouldn't listen. This story will tell you what horrible things a desert can do to folks. It was about three years ago that me and my partner got together all our possessions. We sold them for all the profit we could get. Then bought stuff to start out on a prospecting trip. For a while, we didn't strike enough gold to make expenses. Then one morning, Ab and me made a walloping strike and hightailed it to town with our samples. <laughs> what 
what's all the shooting about, yeah. boys? Me and Ed just come from the essay office, that's what. Go on, what's the news? We stuck it, boys. We stuck it rich. Do you hear that? All across an air that struck it. Well, see, we stuck it. No more grubbing for us. We're in the money, boys. We're in. <laughs> Yep, we was rich. And the first thing I did was to send back to the settlement for my girl to come out to me. Ab helped me get ready for her. We built this here cabin. Of course, it's no mansion, but it's a sight better than most desert shanties. Well, Lila came out, and we was married in Al Toro, and then came back here to the cabin. Lila, she brought things along to pretty up the place. Curtains and such... We was real happy, Ab, Lila, and me, and the gold was still coming in. Night times, Lila and me would make plans as to how we were going to the big cities and and live like king and queen. Then one morning, I, I comes into the cabin. Lila was sitting in that chair where you are sitting now, stranger, and Ab was standing there by the table. I could sense right away that something was up. I says, supper on, Lila? No. Time for grub, ain't it? Maybe so. Go on, Lila. Tell him. Tell me what? Lila don't want to stay here with you anymore, Fred. I reckon Lila's able to talk for herself, Ab. What's this Ab is telling me, Lila? Ab's got it right, Fred. I hate it out here. And you won't give up and say we got enough to move on. Well, now... Let me do the talking. I can't stand it here in the desert. Not any longer. I'll go crazy if I have to be here another day. But I thought... Go on, tell him all of it, Lila. It ain't only the desert you don't like. It's him. Lila's in love with me. Is this true? Lila, tell me. Is it the truth what I've seen? Yes. Well, Ab, you desert rat, I'll break every bone in your body. I'll take it easy. You won't touch me so long as I got the draw on you. Fight like a man, you yellow livid skunk. Put down that gun and fight like a man. Yes, don't listen to him. Don't you lay a hand on Ab, Fred. I ain't afraid to fight him. There's my gun on the table. Now, come on ahead. Yeah. Oh, you... Still fight this rat with one arm. Hit you. No, Fred. No, no. No, no. no. I give up. No. Ab. Oh. Ab, speak to me. You killed him. You killed Ab. You, you can't kill a skunk like him. He's not breathing. Look. His head's all smashed from hitting the table. Ab, Ab, speak to me. Let me see him. Dead, dead. You killed him, man, Fred Holcroft. Ab, Ab. Oh, Ab. You're to blame for this, Lila. You're to blame for it all. A no good woman. You tried to kill me. For all your sins, you have pay. You'll start paying right now. Did I tell the sheriff about you being a murderer? You ain't going to tell the sheriff and nobody else what's happened in this cabin. You're going to do just what I tell you to do. And no more. Strange story of murder. 
the woman who beckoned them to the cabin that night. Where is she? He? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> Now, the hermit again. <laughs> Fred Holcroft continues to narrate his strange desert story to the two men who were led to his cabin by a woman. Listen. <laughs> that night. What do you mean, we? Lila and me. The woman who had betrayed me. I made her handle the shovel. I can remember as well as if it were today. She was sobbing and carrying on. But I kept her shoveling. <laughs> Keep shoveling. Cover up the man you love. Make him a good deep grave. Don't look to me for mercy. Keep digging. You love me once, Smith. You gotta have mercy. I don't really recollect you have no mercy for me. I hope he can still feel things while he's there in the sand. Yeah. I hope the sand chokes him. Burns out his eyes. Get up on your feet. He's buried deep enough now. And you listen to what I'm telling you. If anybody comes this way, we don't know what happened to Abby. You hear? We don't know nothing. I can tell by the look in your eyes that you figure I was mighty cruel to Lila. But you got to remember, she had played me dirt. And what's more, she had tried to murder me to save that skunk of a man. I couldn't forget that. I didn't forget it. Every hour, I made her suffer for her sins. I made her work the mine with me. Made her stand out in the blinding storms. In the heat of the sun, till her skin was burned black and her eyes all puffed and faded out. Till her beauty was gone forever. Well, as for me, I was sorting away the gold. Burying it right underneath his cabin floor. Fighting my time. And waiting till I had enough gold to buy whatever I wanted from this life. Then, Lila... She took down with a fever. One night when the moon was riding high, and the sky bright as daylight on the desert sands, she got up from her bed. I tried to stop her. Don't touch me. I'm going away. You're sick, Lila. You can't leave the cabin. I'm going to Ab. To Ab, is it? Ain't you suffered enough for your sins? You still got to mention his name? Let go of me, Fred. I got to find out. Go then. And never come back to this cabin. Never come back. I stood at the door of this cabin watching her staggered away in the moonlight night. I never searched for her body. Her bones are bleached white by now from the sun. As for me, well, I always figured on moving on. But the sun and the desert, the scorching sands and the wild winds blowing, all of it sort of got into my blood. And I've stayed on here, hoarding my gold. But one of these days, I'll be pulling out for the city and the lights the music. All the rich things money can buy. I don't understand it. Why are you telling all this to us, two strangers? How do you know we won't report you as a murderer? I don't likely know why I'm talking. 
Unless it's that the loneliness in the desert is got me. You let the woman wander off into the desert to die? I told you just as it happened. Don't you understand, stranger? That woman didn't die. It was her we saw tonight. Her that beckoned us into this cabin. She never died at all. Taylor, you never saw any woman. You saw the dead stump of a tree. You thought it was someone moving. She talked to me, I tell you. What was that? Don't you know? It's her. Look. Look out the window. Lila. That's the woman who beckoned to Dan and me. She's standing out there at the window. No. She died, I told you. I never died, Fred. Never died. I've come for you. Don't let her in this cabin. Look. She walked right through the door. It can't be her. Look closely, Fred. I've come to finish up what I should have done years ago. Stop her. Don't let her do that again. I've got it now, Fred. This time I'll do more than wing you. <laughs> Grab him, Taylor. Look at the blood. Help me. I, I'm dying. I... Uh... He's done for. And the woman. She's disappeared through that door just like she came in. She's gone. And you and I, Taylor, we're going to be accused of this murder. <laughs> We're telling the story straight, mister. You've got to go out there and get his body. And you've got to believe it. Just as we told you. The woman killed him and vanished. We're not guilty. Sit down, stranger. Take yeah. it easy. What did you say the old guy's name was? Fred Holcroft, he told us. Old Fred, eh? Who struck it rich or thought he did? That's him. He's lying there in the cabin now with a bullet through his heart. <laughs> I guess you two were really touched by the sun. You've got to go out to the cabin with us and see for yourself. Listen, stranger... You ain't going to get anybody in Artura to go out to that desert shack to look for the body of Fred Holcroft. What do you mean? We mean there ain't no sense in looking for the body of him that's been dead for 20 years. I don't get it. Fred Holcroft's been dead for 19 or 20 years. I went out there at the time, recollected well. I was in the party that went out there, too. Sure. Found his body and that of his wife's, both stretched out on the floor of the cabin. Died of the fever, I reckon. Why, there ain't any cabin out there anymore. Blowed away long ago by the wind. Yes, sirree. You two have really been seeing things. But you ain't the first ones that have come out of the desert telling about seeing a woman standing out there in the sands, uh, beckoning them to the cabin in a water hole. Just a few months ago, a guy comes in here babbling about a woman who led him to a water hole. But ain't none of them ever been so touched before that they saw the old man or the cabin. Her... Uh, had a vision of a murder. Did anyone ever find old Hall across gold? Nope, nor his partner neither. Some folks reckoned he left Fred and his wife there to die and took the gold for himself. Listen, then. It may be we saw a vision, but you come out there with us to the spot where the cabin did stand. Maybe we can prove to you that the story we heard last night was true. Here's where we stopped. But you can see there ain't any cabin. You said the gold was buried underneath the cabin floor. That would be about here. All right, for the heck of it, let's start digging. Come on. Gold. Buy cracky gold. Just as we told you. Just as he told it to us. Visions, huh? Visions on a desert. But it was more than our being touched by the sun. We saw spirits of the dead. We saw them and heard them. And we've found the gold that brought about evil and murder. the mind alone, but rather a ghostly vision of the past, spirits that could not rest in their graves of sand, 
ghostly visions returning to earth to walk the desert on moonlight nights, to speak to the living, to relate over and over the stories of their sin and murder. Yes. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, Jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. If you'd like to check out the Weird Darkness merchandise like t-shirts, hoodies, even baby clothes, you can find them in the Weird Darkness store. You can search through all the merchandise by clicking on Store at WeirdDarkness.com. Global Communications great scholar of Greek mythology, writer and podcast personality Hercules Invictus adds some material of historical interest on the nature of the gods and spirits we encounter in the land of dreams, a realm that is a reality unto itself and occupied by dark powers we cannot begin to comprehend. Hercules also tells the story of a Grecian entity called the Moor, who could possibly be a daemon or a vengeful ghost. In any case, the Moor is a fearsome creature to encounter and a fascinating example of how the mythic and paranormal are handed down through the centuries with their fear-inducing qualities still intact. So-called poltergeists come in all shapes and sizes and inspire varying degrees of horror. What might be surprising is that poltergeists are not necessarily the spirits of the dead nor the overworked, disordered personalities of the living often thought to have become possessed by demonic forces. That which we call a poltergeist could just as easily include a wide range of other unearthly phenomena such as random denizens of the dark moving through time and space and other dimensions, as well as manifestations of cryptids, known collectively as shapeshifters and bedroom invaders, and possibly even representatives of numerous alien races. No one has ever completely explained why we enjoy being terrified. What is that perverse thrill we seek and never get enough of? Why does the case of the chills make us feel satisfied and well-served by scary forms of entertainment, whether entirely fictional or factual stories said to have literally taken place in our real and physical world.
traveling on my way to another haunted location, my spidey senses went off as I passed a run-down farmhouse. When I reversed and stopped in front of the property, I could almost hear screams and growls in my head. Strangely enough, there were no signs blocking the entrance to the property, so I grabbed my equipment and went in. I found it odd that the majority of the trees and plants surrounding the old house were either dead or dying. The house itself also looked like it was decaying from the inside out, along with the surrounding buildings and sheds. As I crept up to the front porch, I saw that it was crumbling around the concrete steps that led up to the front door. Stepping slowly and lightly, I noticed the cracks in the concrete and then the old boards nailed across the door. I switched one of my EVP recorders on, then I pulled on the boards, finding them flimsy and easy to rip down. The door opened on its own, creepy enough, but I had to remember that the dangers were more than structural. I walked slowly, testing the floorboards as I went, but the familiar pricking up of my hairs and the chills hit me fast. Surprisingly, the center of the house was sturdy, so I walked freely into the kitchen and then froze in my tracks. A woman was slumped on the floor under the sink with a large knife stuck in her chest and trickling blood. I was able to see through her and I realized I was in the middle of a residual haunting, but then she looked up. The pain in her face was horrible, but she managed to raise her hand and point upwards. Then she screamed. I looked around, but no one was there, so I turned back as I trembled in fear to see the woman standing up. Still screaming, she pointed up again. Her head began to twitch and shake uncontrollably, with her mouth open wide. I knew I had to investigate, even though I was nearly peeing in my pants, so I went out and ran up the stairs. When I got to the top, I heard the boards behind me creaking with slow footsteps. I spun around. Nobody was there. I felt like I was being stalked, but I had to push on, going to the bedroom at the front of the crumbling house. Again, the door opened on its own, making my flesh crawl. Then I saw a small boy lying in a pool of his own blood. I couldn't help the tears falling down my face but I was distracted by a nasty growl close to my right ear. Angry now, I turned around and yelled, Who are you? But I didn't get a response, so I looked back at the little boy. He lifted his head and pointed to the back of the house. My head was spinning as I didn't know what to do. Then the boy sat up and yelled in his tiny voice, Help us! while he continued to point emphatically and cry. I ran over to the room on the other side, feeling like someone was controlling me, while a chill ran through my body. When I got to the room, that door opened, violently this time, smashing against the wall while the handle rattled. A teenage girl was flung across the old bed with slashes all over her body. A river of blood ran under the bed. Then I heard menacing laughter in the distance, which fueled my anger. The girl slowly sat up and pointed to the left. I was weeping angry tears for this ghostly family who'd obviously been viciously attacked by a sadistic killer. I could still hear the screams from the mother and the little boy, along with the gurgling from the girl on the bed. It was clear she'd had her throat slashed, but she was trying to speak as she pointed to the back of the house. Feeling that I might find the killer there, it took some time for me to build up the nerve to keep moving. I was annoyed with myself for stepping into this nightmare without backup as I'd never faced anything like this before. Then I remembered my video camera, so I activated it and pointed it all over the place while I continued on my way. The gurgling, crying, and screaming went on as I crept down the landing to the room at the back, shivering in fear. Before I even got to the room, I heard the slow creaking of the door which made me shudder and move slower. My body shook as I made it to the door where I expected to face the killer responsible for the death of this family. 
Instead, I saw a grown man in a chair with an axe deep in his head. There was a pool of blood under the chair. Somehow I knew that this was the father and that he couldn't speak, but he slowly lifted his hand and he began to point. A chill swept through my soul as I realized his finger was pointing directly at me. Was I the killer? As I thought that, the father pointed more emphatically at me and the screams and noises from his family increased. While I stood there dumbstruck wondering what he meant, I felt a blast of evil hit my back, freezing my body. Then a putrid stench wafted over me and the father continued to point anxiously to the space behind me. Finally, I was able to turn around as an unholy growling began to filter through the screams of the whole family. This time I did pee my pants as I realized I was face to face with the most evil entity I had ever encountered. Keep in mind that until that day I'd only ever captured voices on my EVP recorder. I'd never seen a ghost. Now I was only centimeters away from a murderous monster who had slaughtered an innocent family in cold blood. At first, I had no idea what I had to do, and it was obvious the sinister specter found this fact amusing. He looked like a big gorilla of a man who had escaped an insane asylum, with huge black eyes and an awful sneer. Then I remembered that I had a mini Bible on my keychain, which my mother had given me before she'd passed away. I whipped my keys out, and with trembling fingers, I flipped the Bible open and shoved it in his ghostly face. It was all I could think of, but it worked. I yelled, leave them alone, go to hell where you belong. He screamed like a demon splashed with holy water. As I raged along with the family's screams, he disappeared. I turned around and the father was gone. When I raced through the house, I saw the entire family was now gone. The house was empty, free from evil. When I got back in my car, I finally broke down and cried happy tears. I wasn't even mad when I got back home and discovered that my equipment had malfunctioned with no evidence. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. took place one evening last October. It was Indian summer, and I had gone out for a stroll after dining alone at the Lamplighters Club. Suddenly, a young girl rushed up and threw her arms about my neck. Darling, how are you? I beg your pardon. Well, after that, I'm sorry I'm not the man you were... Don't pretend that you know me. I'm being followed. Followed? By whom? He's behind you, leaning against the bank building. Oh, no, no, don't turn around. Oh, there's a policeman on the corner. I'll call oh, no, him. no, no. A policeman would only make things worse. But... Oh, come, walk along with me. But... Here, I'll, I'll take your arm. He must be convinced that we're old friends. This is rather an amazing experience. Would you mind telling me your name? It's Claire Wesley. You've probably heard of my uncle, Howard Wesley. Howard Wesley? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, of course. He recently returned home after being marooned on the South Sea Island for more than 30 years. Oh, yes. Uncle Howard was the only survivor of the liner Bell Morrill. 
He had a most unusual experience. And what is your uncle's return to do with the man who uh, you believe is following you? A good deal. Barton Drake. Uh, oh, you know my name. Oh, yes. Oh, please trust me. I, oh, I need your help. Oh? When Uncle Howard was living on his island, he discovered a buried treasure. Buried treasure? <laughs> now come, Miss Watson. Oh, I'm serious, Mr. Drake. Uncle Howard drew a map. At first we thought, like you, that, well, perhaps he'd only been imagining finding a treasure. Mm-hmm. And uh, what convinced you otherwise? Well, he had removed part of the treasure and, and brought it home with him. Oh, I see. What type of valuables were they? Well, a few old coins dated in the 16th century. A brooch and, and a ring. You've uh, checked and found them authentic? Yes. Two experts have guaranteed their authenticity. Well, well. And why exactly do you need my help? Because, well, because someone is trying to steal the map. Oh. Ever since the newspaper story was published, men have been coming to the house. And what makes you think their purpose is to steal the map? Because of the way Uncle Howard acts. He's terrified half the time and... Oh, here, this is where I live. Mm. My advice to you, Miss Westley, is to get in touch with the police immediately. Oh, but you that's... don't understand. There have been threatening letters. Uncle Howard has been warned that, that he'll be murdered if he contacts the police. Miss Westley, I still don't understand why that Uncle would Howard people... has been away so long, you see... Well, he's afraid of civilization. He's told me he'd destroy the map if it would assure him of a peaceful existence for the rest of his days. I see. Tell me, are you uh, your Uncle Howard's only heir, Miss Wesley? No, no. There I am. Oh. And naturally, you don't want the map to be... Yes, you're quite right, Mr. Drake. Naturally, we don't want the map destroyed or stolen. Mm. It is worth a small fortune. I don't pretend that we're not interested in that fortune. I'd be a hypocrite to say otherwise. I admire your frankness, Miss Wesley. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Drake... Will you come in and talk to Uncle Howard? But if your uncle's frightened of people, if he suspects that everyone's attempting to steal I, his uh, map... I'll introduce you as my... as my fiancé. Your fiancé? You tempt me, Miss Wesley. Then... and you will come? How can I refuse? First, I'm accosted and kissed by a beautiful girl. Then asked to be her fiancé. Lead the way. <laughs> Mr. Drake, Uncle Howard's room is just down the hall. I'll call him. Thank you. Uh, Miss Wesley. Yes? Since we're, uh, supposed to be engaged, shouldn't we drop the formalities? Uh, just for appearance's sake, of course. Why, I... Well, I suppose so. Your uncle, I'm sure, would think it strange to hear his niece referring to the man with whom she's deeply in love as, uh, Mr. Drake. Deeply in... Oh, very well, Barton. Thank you. Claire? I'll be back in a moment. <laughs> uh, that is interesting. <laughs> By joke. Maybe something is the matter after all. I'm coming. Take it easy. Claire, what happened? Good heavens. Oh, it's Uncle Howard. He's been shot. He's dead. <laughs> really don't expect me to believe that stuff about buried treasure and maps and shipwrecked millionaires, do you? I was as amused as you are at first, Inspector. But now you believe it, I... I don't know. A man's been murdered. Apparently, there were no other motives but obtaining possession of the treasure map. Treasure map. <laughs> Look, how did this guy happen to be rescued after being lost for 32 years anyhow? Well, according to the newspaper, Inspector... A fisherman found a sealed bottle in which there was a note written 32 years ago by Howard Wesley giving the location of his island. Shades of Captain Kidd. <laughs> but have you been reading adventure books or something? <laughs> you don't believe it, eh, Inspector? Of course not. Look, have you seen the treasure map or the note that was sealed in the bottle? Not yet, though. I expect you shortly. Oh, Claire, come in. Claire, this is Inspector Noah Denton. How do you do, Inspector Denton? Hi. Uh, just a minute, uh, uh, but how long have you and uh, Claire known each other? Oh, uh, about an hour, Inspector. You see, Claire. Uh, an hour, he says. And already he calls her Claire. I'm trying to explain, Inspector. You Mr. See... Drake, if you don't mind, I, I think we'd better forget the fact that we were engaged. Engaged? After all, my uncle has been. is dead. Yes, I know. However. Uh... Oh, please, Mr. Drake, I. I'd rather not discuss it. Mm. Very well, Miss Wesley, but I really can't believe your grief over your uncle's death is very sincere. Uh, 
I beg your pardon? After all, you've known your uncle for less than a month. But I... According to the story, he disappeared 32 years ago. Are you, uh, 32 years old, Miss Wesley? Of course not. Which means that he disappeared several years before you were born. Say, that's right, isn't it? I'm afraid, Miss Wesley, that the bond of affection that you feel toward uh, your uncle Howard is based on something much more practical than deep human emotion. I see. Very well, Mr. Drake. Since that's the way you feel, I'll have to ask you to leave. Whoa, just a minute, lady. Drake stays. There's been a murder, remember? I don't care if there has. Mr. Drake was working for me and... and... Now he's working for me. Go ahead, Bart. Ask your question. Thank you, Inspector. I'm sorry, Miss Wesley. Uh, is that the map of the buried treasure you're holding? Yes. If you care to look at it. Thank you. And now, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go. Unless I'm to consider myself under arrest. Now, look, young lady, we haven't got time to fool around with injured pride and that sort of no, thing. No, wait a minute, Inspector. Huh? Miss Wesley, did you find the note that was taken from the sealed bottle? Find it? Mm. Why, oh, I think it's in my purse. Oh, yes, here it is. Thank you. In her purse, she carries it. Well, is there something wrong with that? Judd copied it off of the newspapers and I put the note back in my purse. Well, how can you possibly Who's think... Who's Judd? He's my half-brother. Why? Just asking... What's the note say, Bart? I'll read it, Inspector. Whoever finds this, please have the authorities broadcast by radio my location. At somewhere near 18 degrees south latitude and 175 degrees west longitude. Long ways away. Mm -hmm. Now, go ahead, Bart. I'm the sole survivor of the liner Bell Morrow, wrecked four months after leaving New York. I shall go mad unless soon rescued. We'll try and hold out until help arrives. Find Howard Wesley. It doesn't tell us anything. I read the same thing in the newspapers a month ago. Yeah, so did I, Inspector. Miss Wesley, yes? if your uncle valued his treasure map so much, how was it that you were able to put your hand on it immediately? Uncle Howard valued my confidence also, Mr. Drake. Oh, so. Then he told you where the map was hidden. Yes. Hmm. Did Judd Graham also know the hiding place? Of course. However, Judd is inclined to disbelieve Uncle Howard's story of the buried treasure. Well, it's nice to know that someone's being smart in this deal. <laughs> oh, well, you still discredit the story of the buried treasure, eh, Inspector? Sure I do. Why, doggone it. Why, Inspector? Why what? Why do you discredit the story? Because it doesn't make sense. No? Now, look, this is the room where Howard Wesley was found murdered, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Okay, look around. Everything's in order, nothing touched, no drawers open, no rugs pulled up. Nothing. Mm hmm. Well, if the guy who murdered Wesley was looking for the buried treasure map, he'd have turned the place upside down. You're forgetting, Inspector, that the map was hidden in another room. Miss Wesley just brought it to us. Okay. How about it, Miss Wesley? Was the other room ransacked? Why, no. As a matter of fact, it wasn't. There, I guess that proves my point. I'm not dumb, you know, Bart. You certainly aren't, Inspector. Your reasoning in this particular instance was most logical. Well, thanks, Bart. It seems nice to have you agree with me. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Inspector, but I don't agree with you. Huh? I think that the person who murdered Howard Wesley believes there is a buried treasure. I believe his motive for murder was to secure possession of that map. I also believe that the murderer will return here within 24 hours. Hello, Betty. Well, Judd Graham, where have you been? I got here as quickly as I could. Quickly as you could? That's a lie. You've been drinking. You stopped at Tony. Oh, Betty, listen to Take me. Take your I... hands off I... me. I told you what the deal was going to be. Well... Did you get the map? Oh, be reasonable, Betty. I did what you told me. I tried to find it. Oh, Judd. And you promised. I know I promised, and I'll keep the promise. Believe me, I will. Oh, how can I believe you now? Oh, Betty, listen to me. The map's around the house somewhere. It's got to be. You've been saying that for a month. Well, what if someone else finds it first? Oh, how can they? Claire and I are the only ones allowed in the house. Well, but Claire might... Oh, that's been... nonsense. Even if Claire did know where Uncle Howard had hidden the map, she wouldn't steal it. Are you sure? I'm positive. Claire... Well, Claire isn't that kind of girl. Oh, I see. Then you think that I am. No, no, I, I don't think that at all. I... I think you're the most wonderful girl in the world. Do you, Judd? You know I do. Judd. Yes, Betty? Love me? Yes, I... I love you so much, I... I sometimes think I'll go mad. Darling, kiss me. Uh, Betty, I... You, 
You will go away with me, won't you? Well, of course I will, Judd, darling. And we're going to be terribly happy together. Uh, only... Uh, yes, yes. Uh, only you want me to get the map. But, darling, don't you see? We haven't any money. It wouldn't be any fun without money. And, well, so many people would pay us for the map. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll try again. Well... You don't want to. Oh, I do, Betty. I do. I said I would, didn't I? It didn't sound very convincing. You don't seem to care what I want. Oh, Betty, stop talking like that. You know that's all I care about. Well. I'll get the map for you, Betty. If it's what you want, I'll get it. Even if I have to... If I have to kill Uncle Howard. Mr. Drake, I'm not much impressed with your method of solving a murder. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Wesley. What would you suggest I do? Oh, I don't know, I'm sure, but I'm not a detective. If I were, I'd certainly do more than merely sit around waiting for the murderer to put an appearance. Then you don't think he will? Certainly not. That story about a criminal returning to the scene of his crime is a, is a fallacy. Is it really? Oh, very well. Laugh at me. But I've read a dozen times where that theory's been exploded. I'm not laughing, Miss Wesley. Furthermore, I've read the same thing. But, of course, being Barton Drake, you're going to prove that the authorities are wrong. Mm, I'm going to attempt to. I can tell you better what my chances of success are after Inspector Danton has completed his search of the house. Just what does Inspector Danton expect to find as the result of his search? I don't know. Possibly he thinks the murderer might be lurking in some dark closet ready to pop out at us. I'm not amused, Mr. Drake. No? Well, then perhaps you'd like to accompany me on an errand I have to do. Well, under the circumstances... My destination is a reference room of the morning ledger. But I don't believe that I'm I... I'm quite sure I can show you something of interest, Miss Wesley. I see. You're not asking me to go. You're demanding. Oh, calm, Miss Wesley. You suspect me of murdering my uncle. All right. I'm your prisoner. But a very charming prisoner. Will you get your hat, please? <laughs> Let me see now. September 5th. September 6th. Here we are. Saturday, September 8th. If you're looking for the account of my uncle's rescue, it's on page 7. Thank you, Miss Wesley. Page 7. Here it is. Lost millionaire rescued after 32 years on South Sea Island. Well, do you know good to read the entire account, Mr. Drake? You'll find that everything I've told you is true. Are you bored, Miss Wesley? Well, I... Had more exciting times. <laughs> Miss Wesley, you are a very charming prisoner. Your flattery is wasted, Mr. Drake. Oh, I'm sorry. Pardon me, please. Howard Wesley, millionaire, who was believed drowned from his yacht the Bell Morrow. Well, what do you know about that? So, Mr. Wesley's taking up temporary residence with his niece, Miss Claire Wesley, at her home on Clark Street. Hmm. I suppose that that... Hmm... You mean to imply that you've made a great discovery? Indeed, I do, Miss Wesley. Well, what, for goodness sake? For one thing, I'm surprised to learn that your uncle was picked up in a small boat which he had manufactured himself. How remarkable. The fact that Uncle Howard manufactured a boat of his own gives Barton Drake a clue to the identity of his murderer. Yes, it's amazing, isn't it, Miss Wesley? Well, let's go back to the house. Inspector Danton will be uh, getting impatient. <laughs> Well, here we are, Betty. You wait outside Oh, nothing I'll... doing. This time I'm going to see to it that you really look for that map. Yeah, but Claire might be home oh, and I look... she is. Time I met that sister of yours. Say, you're not ashamed to introduce me to her, are you? Of course not. I... I want you to meet her, darling. Only... Only what? Uh, nothing, nothing. Hey, come along. Why did you ring the bell? Well, if Claire's home, I don't want to go barging in on her unannounced. Mm. Well, no one's answered the bell. Have you got a key? Hey, yes, I, I've got one. Mm. No one here that have heard us before now. I guess you're right. Well, where's your uncle's room? Hey, come with me. You're sure he keeps a map in the house? Oh, yes, he wouldn't trust it anywhere else. Mm. Uh, uh, this is Uncle Howard's room here. Well, at least he doesn't keep his door locked. Well, it wouldn't do him any good. The keys to all the rooms are the same. Nobody here. 
Uncle Howard and Claire probably went out together. They usually do at this time of day. Well, come on, let's get started. Well, you begin at the bureau, and I'll go through his desk. Mm, okay. Hey, what does the map look like, anyway? Oh, it's just an ordinary piece of oh. paper. All right, you two, get your hands up. Say, oh. what is this? Who the devil are you? Sandy Claus. Now, do you get your hands oh, don't up? Don't do it, Judd. He's after the map. Go, go and get him. Yeah, get him. get him. How about it, bub? Are you going to take the babe's advice or mine? I got the gun, you know. Well, what is it you want? If it's the map, you're wasting your time. Bob, in just a second, I'm going to waste a bullet. Oh, don't believe him, Judd. He wouldn't dare shoot. Lady, it looks like you're asking me to plug holes in your boyfriend. All now... right, all right, all right. I, I've got my hands up. Now, what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to tell this babe to shut up, for one thing. Oh, don't listen to him, Judd. He's going to try and make you tell where the map is. Lady, if you don't button up your lip, I'll... Tell him who you are, Judd. Tell him you live here. Tell him... Live here? Well, of yeah. course he lives here. Who do you think you are, breaking into honest people's houses? You're just a now, great... wait a minute. Wait a minute. Bob, is your name Judd Graham? Well, of course he's Judd Graham. You knew he was all the time. Now get out of here before we call the police. Oh, shut up. I won't shut up. You won't make me shut up. I know why you're here. Why? What? I said why. What? Now, just a minute, Betty. For heaven's sake, calm down. There's nothing we could do so long as he has the gun. Bob, you're smart. Now, look. Uh, What's that? Don't get excited. It's only Drake. Drake? Who's he? You'll see in a minute. Hey, Bart. Bart. Down here. Coming, Inspector. Well, well, what have we here? A talking machine and a guy who says his name is Judd Graham. A couple of cops. Judd, what in the world has happened? Perhaps you can tell us, Claire. If this man is a friend of yours, I wish you asked ask him to point that gun the other way. But why is he pointing it at you at all? Doesn't he know who you are? Sure, he knows who we are. We just told him, but the big flat foot hasn't got any sense. One more crack out of you, lady, and I'll... You uh, what? Just a minute, please, please. Inspector, whom did you think these uh, two people were? How should I know? They come sneaking in here, began poking around. I figured they were looking for the map. The map? Oh, then it's all a mistake. Judd wouldn't have to look for the map. He knows as well as I where Uncle Howard kept it. What was that? Uh, now, no, just a minute, Betty. Why, I... you double-crossing, two-timing chiseler. What kind of a sucker do you think you're playing me for? Oh, Betty, listen, you've got to listen. I didn't know. Honest. Honest, Claire only thought I did. Oh, Judd, that's not so. All the lousy tricks. Hey, I'm getting out of here. Just a minute. Get out of my way, Breaker, Jake, or whatever your name uh, is. Uh, Inspector. Yeah, it'll be a pleasure. All right, lady, relax. Keep your hands off of you. If Betty wants to leave, she can. Says who? Oh, Mr. Drake, will you please explain what this is all about? It's Judd's business if he wants to bring his his girls to the house. Yes, but it's not Judd's business when there's a crime involved. A crime? What the devil are you talking about? In a minute, I'll explain, Graham. Tell me, was it really the map you were looking for, or um, this slip of paper? What slip of paper? Where did you get that? Your sister gave it to me. She had it in her purse ever since you copied it off and gave the story to the newspapers. But that's only the note that Uncle Howard wrote and placed in the sealed bottle. But Judd... Do you want to tell her, Judd? Why, I... I, uh... Naturally, you don't. But suppose you tell me why you pretended to this young lady that you'd been searching for the map. Or shall I tell you? Yeah. Yeah, you tell us, smart guy. Frankly, I... I can only guess. Judd, are you in love with Betty? Well, I... Yes, I am. I thought so. Up until she read about your uncle's treasure map, Betty wouldn't marry you, is that correct? That's none of your business. But I'm making it my business for a very definite reason, Judd. When Betty read about the treasure map, she asked you to get it. She figured it would be worth considerable money. She threatened to break your engagement if you didn't get it. Now, look here, Drake, I'm you can't... I'm only uh, guessing, Graham. You can deny my statements any time you like. Oh, what's the use? Sure, you're right. I told Betty I'd get her the map. I... I didn't want to lose it. But you never found the map, even though you knew where it was all the time. Instead, you kept searching for this note. Yes, sir, that's but right. But why, Judd? Why? I'll answer that, Miss Wesley. Judd knew the map was worthless. He knew there wasn't any treasure. He knew that unless he found and destroyed the note which your uncle allegedly wrote, someone would reveal the hoax and his girlfriend would lose interest. Hoax? What do you mean, hoax? I'm sorry, Miss Wesley. The man who told you he was your uncle was an imposter. He was never shipwrecked. In fact, I doubt if he was ever out of the city. Well, now, isn't that just dandy? So Uncle Howard made chumps out of a whole bunch of us, huh? Well, okay, so we lose. Well, anyway, we're still alive, and that's something. What do you mean, we're still alive, miss? Well, we are, aren't we? And that old coot... Go he... on. Nothing. 
Now, I wasn't going to say anything. On the contrary, you were going to say that that old coot was dead. I wasn't. I don't know what you're talking I'm about. I'm afraid you do, miss. How did you know that Uncle Howard was dead? Well, I didn't. Hey, you're not going to pin this on me. Let me out of here. You're not going to get her, me. Hold her, Inspector. Don't worry. She won't get away. Relax, lady. Oh. You've got nothing to worry about. You're only under arrest for committing first-degree murder. <laughs> I guess we cleaned that one up pretty fast, eh? Yes, yes, I guess we did, Inspector. <laughs> you know, Uncle Howard wasn't so dumb at that. You are quite right, Inspector. He planned his hoax skillfully and nearly succeeded in fooling everyone. Yeah. If he'd sold that map, he'd have been set for life. He certainly would. Too bad for him that the babe decided to come looking for the map herself, got caught and had to shoot good old Uncle Howard. Yes, a pity, Inspector. The thing is, Uncle Howard fooled everyone but Drake, eh? Mm, you're quite wrong, Inspector. Judd Graham wasn't fooled for a minute. Is that so? Very much so, Inspector. It was Judd, you know, who gave the story of the sealed note to the newspapers. Well? Well, when Judd copied off the note for him, he omitted one phrase. One phrase? Yes. What is that? He omitted the phrase that said, Whoever finds this... Please have the authorities broadcast by radio my location as somewhere near 18 degrees south latitude and 175 degrees west longitude. No such location, eh? No such thing as a radio 32 years ago, Inspector. <laughs> well, I'll be a, a cross-eyed goose. Say, uh, yes, Inspector. Where are you going? Well, if you'll pardon me, Inspector, I'm going to find Claire. So, it's Claire again. What do you want to see her for? I want to explain to her, Inspector, in a negative sort of way, that among other things, mystery is my hobby. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. The following is written in first person from the point of view of the article's author. Once we had reached the site, 260 kilometers distant along Route 14, we entered Colonia Elia through a dirt road in search of the witnesses. As always, we employed an old but surefire strategy to get information. We stopped a man who was riding along on horseback and he quickly indicated the location of the Rostano family home. This was the family that had witnessed the events involving the unusual creature. The witnesses warmly welcomed us. They showed us evidence of the mutilations, which was among the reasons for our trip, and quickly told us the details of the occurrences. Manifestations of this entity began a year ago, around September 15th, when they found a dead chicken beside the granary, displaying strange marks and a large print on the ground. The family's boys... Matthias and Gabriel, fully knowledgeable about the animals that wander the fields, could not recognize the types of marks left on the chicken's breast 
and much less identify the footprint found near the dead animal. In an effort to glean further evidence, they found tear marks made as if by claws in the back of the henhouse. The following night, early in the morning, they heard noises that prompted them to go outside to see what was happening. Matthias, 16 years old, was startled when he saw a bizarre figure scurry away among the vegetation at the back of the house. He described the figure as large, standing at least 1.7 meters, and swift in its getaway. Upon inspecting the hen house, they found a dead chicken with a large rip in its chest. From that moment on, the family's boys would not have a normal life again, as each night turned into an episode of chase and attempted capture of this creature, which turned the family's life into a strange adventure. According to a family member, the critter, as they've dubbed it, seems more frightened than them. Whenever the possibility of an encounter exists, the reaction is always the same – flight. All manner of snares have been laid out to trap this creature. Otter traps, cages lent by a neighbor who cares for endangered animals, and they even prepared a trap using old bedding elastic. The creature was captured in each of these, but managed to free itself. The otter trap, however, inflicted serious injury, given that blood traces remained on the trap and on a nearby stone. These samples were taken for analytical purposes. Manifestations have been constant. The witnesses see fleeting shadows and the entity's claw prints, such as the ones left on a tree, as though it had used the wood to sharpen the claws, or its footsteps which are easily seen because the boys, in their urge to secure evidence, began spreading ashes and rice powder around the henhouses. The best was yet to come, and it would happen inside the house at three o'clock in the morning. Matthias heard a noise behind the kitchen but within his home. This experience allowed Matthias to clearly see the entity that had been engaged in the chicken mutilations. We managed to obtain an oral picture of the creature. We showed him a series of figures from our files, and he identified one of them as very similar, and based on that, he outlined the description of what confronted him that night. He seized his carbine 22 caliber and quickly headed to the front of the house. When he drew the curtain of the room that houses his mother's pantry and the cheese-making churns, he found the critter on top of the freezer, clearly intending to grab the churn. Matthias's immediate reaction was to fire, which he did four times without wounding it. The animal jumped through a window, spilling chicken entrails throughout the room. Amanda Eller felt drawn to the Makawa Forest Reserve on the Hawaiian island of Maui to connect with nature and get grounded. She had rarely been to that park and hadn't been in months, but that day she was called to go. The 35-year-old physical therapist who had a whole day to herself figured she'd go for a three-mile hike and spend a couple of hours in the woods. I don't really know what happened, she said Tuesday morning, speaking to reporters while in a wheelchair. All I can say is that I have strong sense of internal guidance, whatever you want to call that. A voice, spirit, everybody has a different name for it. My heart was telling me, walk down this path, go left, great, go right. It was so strong. She said it turned out to be not nearly as strong when, after meditating on a log, she wanted to go back to her car. She tried one path, and it didn't get her back to the car. She tried another. No luck. And another. She came to the realization she wasn't on a human path. She was on a boar path. At that point, I had no choice because everything looked the same. I said, the only thing I have is my gut. I don't have a compass. I don't have a cell phone. She said, so, spirits, or whatever you want to pray to, I said, I need your help right now. She said she listened to her sense of guidance, which instead of taking her back to her car, took her on a five-mile journey, one she called a spiritual boot camp. Eller ended up spending 17 days in the woods, trying to get back to her car, and then just trying to stay alive and catch the attention of searchers and helicopters. She spent two days in a Maui hospital being treated for a severe sunburn, a twisted knee, and ankle problems before she went home Monday night. She hopes to be back at work in a couple of weeks. 
Heller thinks the days she spent alone in the woods, surviving on berries and stream water, is part of something bigger, something that's been changing her life since she moved to Maui four years ago. It taught the physical therapist, who often treats people in great pain, what it's like to be on the patient's side. Eller, who's also a yoga teacher, said she'd get down and feel like a victim. This is not your punishment. This is your destiny. This is your journey. This is a part of your path, she said. She said she eventually accepted that this would be a gauntlet of painful endeavors and she had to choose life. Eller said she'd find things that she could use to spell out SOS, and she'd hang pieces of clothing where it could be seen from the air. But as helicopters passed over, she estimated that there were at least 20 times they were nearby they couldn't see her. Until Friday morning, when a helicopter surveying areas to put search crews into the forest spotted her. She'd been sitting out on a rock, frying in the sun, and here came another helicopter, but she saw someone pointing at her, I just fell to the ground and just started bawling, she said. In hindsight, Eller says that even though she hates cell phones, she should have taken hers with her into the forest. She also will take a water bottle next time. That next time, though, in this park, won't be any time soon. And maybe next time, she won't listen to a voice that intentionally got her lost. New technology isn't just for the living anymore. When the dead want to make contact, they will use any means. Radio, TV, mobile phones, cars, you name it. The other side just won't be quiet, and technology often helps make their presence felt. Whether it's a last goodbye from a loved one, a warning from beyond the veil, or just making sure we know they are still there, Ghosts in the Machines Scary True Stories of the Paranormal by G. Michael Vasey tells how ghosts, demons, and the dead use our own technology to communicate with us, using true and often creepy stories from people just like you. Ghosts in the Machines – Scary True Stories of the Paranormal by G. Michael Vasey Narrated by Darren Marlar Here are a free sample of this audiobook on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Roger Elliot, otherwise known as the Mystery Man, welcoming you to another storytelling session here at the House of Mystery. Today we continue with Chapter 2 of our current story, The Monster in the Lake. And since we have a lot of ground to cover, I suggest we get right into it. That all right with you? All right, Johnny, if you'll turn down the lights, we'll let you give us a brief synopsis of what's happened in the story so far. That's fine. Go ahead, Johnny. Well, um, it all started when you got a letter from a man named Martin Dobbs. You used to know him at college, but uh, you hadn't seen him for 15 years. In the letter, he said he was in some kind of trouble, and he asked you to come and visit him at Macklin Lake, his place in the mountains. When you got there, everything was kind of mysterious. Steve Harris, the caretaker or handyman who met you at the station, just kind of hinted at certain things, only he wouldn't tell you what. But he did tell you that his wife, Bertha, did the cooking and uh, that uh, she also took care of Mrs. Dobbs, who was sick. You didn't have much chance to talk to Mr. Dobbs himself because he had to go in and see his wife. So uh, you and uh, Steve Harris 
walk down to the lakefront, and uh, you were on your way back when all of a sudden you heard a woman scream from one of the cottages. Yes, and it was a shrill, high-pitched scream, born of fright and terror. Steve Harris started up the path toward the cottage. It's Mrs. Dobbs. She's seen it again. Seen what? You'll find out soon enough. Too soon. We hurried up the path. When we reached the cottage, Martin Dobbs was waiting for us on the porch. His face was ashen gray and there were beads of perspiration on his forehead. He looked like a man who thought he'd seen a ghost. But he hastened to reassure us. It's all right. Everything's all right. Well, if I can be of any help, Martin. Oh, thanks, Roger. Thanks just the same. But everything's all right. Bertha's with her now. Uh, Steve. Yes, Mr. Dobbs. Would you drive into town and tell Dr. Newcomb I'd like him to come up here as soon as possible? Yes, sir. Well, don't you have a phone here, Martin? Uh, yes, but it's been out of order since Sunday. Bad electrical storm. Now, oh, I'm sorry that had to happen just when you arrived, Roger, but... Oh, forget it, Martin. The only thing is I feel a little helpless. Perhaps if I knew what this was all about, I might be able to do more than just stand by. I'm going to tell you, Roger. I'm going to tell you everything just as soon as I can pull myself together. No, good Lord. What's the matter? I promised you buckwheat cakes for breakfast. <laughs> a cup of coffee is all we really, really all I want. Uh, we can get that ourselves, can't we? Uh, you don't mind? Of course not. Well, let's go into the kitchen. Bertha should have some coffee on the stove. After you. Thanks. This way. How long have you had this place, Martin? I bought it three years ago. A Wall Street man owned it, a fellow named Macklin. That's why it's called Macklin Lake. I hope I wasn't wrong about Bertha having a coffee on the stove. You weren't. I can smell it. Matter of fact, she's even got the buckwheat batter mixed and a skillet warming. I'd better close this door. If you like, Martin, I can fry up a batch of buckwheat cakes. They may not be as good as Bertha's, but they'll be edible. Now, go ahead if you want to. But don't make any for me. I couldn't eat a thing. Now, I'll pour the coffee. We'll hold the buckwheat cakes until tomorrow. I'm sure the batter will keep. Do you take sugar and cream? No, just sugar. Uh, it's on the shelf right above you. Mm-hmm. Now, Martin, suppose you tell me what this is all about. Well, frankly, I don't know where to begin. Well, suppose we sit down and you begin wherever you want to. Tell me as much or as little as you think you'd like to tell me. Here, take this chair. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it isn't that I want to keep anything back, but... <laughs> now that you're up here, there doesn't seem very much that I can tell you. Well, it's quite evident, Martin, that something unusual is going on. I'd have to be blind not to see it. And it's just as evident it has something to do with the lake. Who told you that? No one actually told me. Neither was I told that it has some connection with Mrs. Dobbs' illness. But that's true, isn't it? Yes. Well, here's the story. It may sound ridiculous to you, but you might as well know it. As I told you, I bought the Macklin Lake property three years ago. I bought it particularly for Evelyn, Mrs. Dobbs, because the doctors said that the mountain air would do her a lot of good. And they were right. She gained weight, slept well, and the hacking cough she developed disappeared almost immediately. Each spring, she looked forward to opening the cottages and getting back up here again. Well, this year, we came up a month earlier because she hadn't had a very good winter. You won't believe it, but 48 hours after we arrived, she was herself again. Why shouldn't I believe it? You have a wonderful spot here. It used to be wonderful. is isn't any more. The trouble started about a month ago. When the weather was nice, Evelyn liked to take a beach chair down to the dock and sit in the sun. There's something about the calmness of the lake that relaxed her. She spent hours at a time down there. The day it happened, I was in town with Steve, picking up some tulip bulbs and some fertilizer. I remember we had difficulty parking because of the county fair that was on, and everybody and his cousin was in town. We got back here about... Oh, about four o'clock. I found Evelyn in her room, crying, hysterical. She said she'd been sitting on the dock when suddenly she heard something splash off to her left. She'd been asleep and the sound awakened her. And when she looked around, all she saw were some ripples in the water, which she imagined had been a jumping fish. She settled back in her chair and prepared to doze again, when suddenly she heard another splash, even louder than the first. This time, she saw the head and shoulders of what she described as a huge monster rising from the lake and coming toward her. She learned nothing about what happened after that, but evidently she must have screamed because Bertha heard her and rushed down to the lake. She found Evelyn lying on the beach, half-conscious. Her face and neck were bruised, and her hands were lacerated. Now, how did that happen? I don't know. But she must have put up a terrific struggle. 
Well, that means the monster actually attacked her? If there was a monster. What do you mean by that? No, it's all very confused, Roger. She sees the thing in her sleep, but honestly, I don't know whether it's all in her imagination or not. Ever since this happened, she's refused to leave her room. She sits at the window all day long, watching the lake. And five minutes ago, when you heard her scream, it was because she thought she saw the monster rising out of the water at the end of the dock. Has anyone else seen the monster? You, Steve, or Bertha? No, but there's an old fisherman who lives in a shack at the north end of the lake. I asked him whether he'd seen anything. He said no. But at night, he heard strange noises. Like someone groaning. Is there anyone else who has access to the lake? A few people from town fish it every now and then, but oh, I didn't want to ask too many questions and get this thing noised around because I wasn't sure. You weren't sure of what? Frankly, I wasn't sure there was anything in Evelyn's story. Anything real, I mean. You see, Roger, there's a history of insanity in her family. One of her brothers is in an institution now. And she had an aunt who lost her mind. Ah, too many people believe that insanity runs in families. Good doctors will tell you it isn't so. A dozen good doctors have told me, but now I don't know. You mean you think your wife's out of her mind? She's having hallucinations? It isn't that I want to think it, but... I understand. Tell me, Martin, has anything like this ever happened before? Has your wife ever, well, ever imagined she was seeing things? No, never. That's what frightens me. Is she seeing things, or is this monster real? That's why I wanted you to come up. I thought you could do more than any doctor to convince her that it's all her imagination. But you're not sure that it is. No, I'm not sure of anything anymore. Oh, that must be Stephen, the doctor. I don't know why I keep calling him. He's been up here a dozen times and hasn't done any good. Dr. Newcomb's here, Mr. Dobbs. I'll be right out, Steve. You'll excuse me, Roger? Of course. Do you mind if Steve and I do a little exploring? Not at all. Uh, Steve, you stick with Mr. Elliot, will you? Yes, sir. I don't know how long I'll be, Roger, but go right ahead and do anything you wish. Okay, I will. I think we'll go back to the lakefront, Steve. Back to the lakefront? Yes. <clears throat> I think we'll take a boat out and see whether we can meet the monster face to face. <laughs> Now, now about a quarter of a mile offshore. Is the lake deep at this point? Twenty, thirty feet. All right, suppose you ship your oars and we'll drift. Well, the wind's south. Just a breeze, but it should carry us to the north end of the lake where that fisherman has his shack. Coincidentally, what's his name? I don't know. Everybody around here calls him Pop. Mr. Dobbs told you about him, didn't he? Well, just that he lives in a shack at the north end of the lake and says he hears peculiar noises at night. Like someone moaning. You can't believe anything he says. He's crazy as a bed bug. How does he live? Catches a few frogs and fish and sells them in town. You should see his shag. It's like a pig pen. Tell me, Steve, what do you honestly think about this monster business? I don't know, Mr. Elliot. Bertha and me was talking about it last night. She says Mrs. Dobbs is going out of her mind... She thinks Mr. Dobbs ought to take her away from here before she really gets bad. Bertha doesn't believe that Mrs. Dobbs saw a monster in the lake? No. Well, what about you? Well, I guess I don't believe it either, except it. Except what? I don't see how a person could start seeing things just all of a sudden. I figure maybe it was a big bass or a pickerel. You think Mrs. Dobbs might call a fish a monster? Just getting a glimpse of it coming out of the water, she might. A 10, 12-pound pickerel's a big fish. What was that? Bass jumping. See him? Jumped again. Yeah, not a very big one. That's funny. What? Bass don't jump like that over and over. That's the fourth time. Yeah. I'll bet something's chasing him. Look at how the water's boiling where he went down last. Can you paddle over there? <laughs> Maybe we hadn't better. Why not? You've got a rifle and I've got a pistol. We certainly don't need any more protection than that. Here, let me get up at the bow. Watch it. These round-bottom boats ain't very steady. Watch it, Mr. Elliot. I didn't do that. I was standing still. Well, you... There's something under the boat rocking it. Use your oars. Pull away. 
weren't quite sure at that point, Johnny. All we knew was that the rowboat suddenly began to rock violently and then turned over, spilling us into the lake. Well, weren't you afraid? Well, I wasn't very happy about it. Monster or no monster, the water was pretty cold. I would have been scared stiff. Well, don't make any mistake. I didn't feel like any hero. As a matter of fact, I made a beeline for the overturned boat. The only thing that stopped me was what happened to Steve. What happened to him? Well, I'd better save that for tomorrow, because if I tell it to you now, you'll be staying up all night trying to figure out the solution. Anyway, there isn't time. But I can assure you, Steve and I spent a few very exciting minutes in that ice-cold lake water. And for Steve, they came close to being his last minutes. But you'll hear all about that tomorrow at the same time, and for our radio listeners, this same station. I'll be waiting for you at the House of Miss. This is Roger Elliott, your mystery man, saying good night. Roger Elliott tells a new story every week at the House of Mystery, and you're all cordially invited to attend the meetings of the Mystery Club Monday through Friday at this same time over many of these stations. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. According to newspaper and spiritualist accounts of 1874, some very strange things were happening on a small Vermont farm near the town of Chittenden. Allegedly, all manner of bizarre phenomena was said to be taking place in the home of William and Horatio Eddy, two middle-aged, illiterate brothers and their sister, Mary. The Eddies lived in an unkempt, two-story building that was reported to be infested with troops of supernatural beings in such numbers that had never been reported before or since. The events at the farm were said to be so powerful and so strange that people came from all over the world to witness them. Spiritualists began calling Chittenden the spirit capital of the universe. Needless to say, not everyone was convinced of the legitimacy of the reported events on the Eddy farm. One such man was a successful attorney named Henry Steele Olcott. Prior to hearing of the Eddy brothers, Olcott had no interest whatsoever in the burgeoning spiritualist movement. However, one day as he returned to his office from lunch, he picked up a copy of the spiritualist newspaper, Banner of Light. In the paper, he read a graphic account of the strange happenings that were being reported in Chittenden, Vermont. It's unlikely at that time that Olcott had any idea 
how a simple newspaper article was going to change his life. It's important that we establish the fact that Henry Olcott was not connected in any way to the spiritualist movement, nor was he a proponent of the paranormal. What might have prompted him to pick up a copy of Banner of Light that day is unknown. Olcott was born in New Jersey in 1832 and attended college in New York City studying agricultural science. While still in his early 20s, he received international recognition for his work on a model farm and for founding a school for agricultural students. During this same time, he published three scientific works. He went on to become the farm editor for Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. When the Civil War broke out, Alcott enlisted in the Union Army. He was appointed as a special investigator to root out corruption and fraud in military arsenals and shipyards. He was soon promoted to the rank of colonel, and after the war he was part of a three-person panel that investigated the assassination of President Lincoln. Alcott went on to study law and became a wealthy and successful attorney. So how would an agriculturist and military investigator go on to become one of the first American psychic researchers? After buying a copy of the Spiritualist newspaper, Alcott read with interest the reports about the Eddy farm. Although skeptical, he knew that if the stories were true, this was the most important fact in modern physical science, he later wrote. A short time after reading the story, Colonel Alcott traveled to Vermont, accompanied by a newspaper artist named Alfred Capps. Together they planned to investigate the strange events at the Eddy farm, and if the stories were a hoax, they would expose the Eddy brothers in the Daily Graphic newspaper as nothing but charlatans. If the Eddies were true mediums, though, Alcott would announce the validity of spiritualism to the world. In either event, Alcott was determined to be fair and open-minded in his judgments. Alcott and Caps traveled to the secluded town of Chittenden in the Green Mountains. The trip out to the farm was uneventful, but the first meeting with the Eddy brothers was anything but ordinary. The two distant and unfriendly farmers were rough-hewn characters with dark hair and eyes, and New England accents so thick that the New York attorney and writer could scarcely understand them. Olcott would later learn that the brothers were descended from a long line of psychics. Mary Bradley, a distant relative, had been convicted of witchcraft at Salem in 1692. She had escaped the village with the help of friends. Their own grandmother had been blessed with the gift of second sight and often went into trances, speaking to entities that no one else could see. Their mother, Julia, had been known for frightening her neighbors with predictions and visions, although her husband, Zephaniah, condemned her powers as the work of the devil. Julia quickly learned to hide her gifts from the cruel and abusive husband. However, the supernatural could not be hidden once the couple began having children. Strange poundings began shaking the house, disembodied voices were heard in empty rooms, and occasionally the children even vanished from their cribs. They were likely to be discovered elsewhere in the house, or even outside. As William and Horatio got older, their strange powers strengthened. On many occasions, Zephaniah would see the boys playing with unfamiliar children who would disappear into thin air whenever he approached. When these visiting children vanished, he would take his boys to the barn and beat them with a rawhide whip as punishment. The strange children returned again and again, though, earning the young Eddie boys countless beatings. Eventually, they would grow to both fear and hate their own father. The boys soon learned they were unable to attend school. The initial attempts were marked by inexplicable happenings and disturbances as invisible hands threw books, levitated desks, and caused objects like rulers, inkwells, and slates to fly about the room. Zephaniah tried everything he could to stop the disturbances, although this mostly consisted of him beating and abusing the youngsters. The strange events continued, though. When he realized that he couldn't stop the weird antics, he grew furious. Each time the boys fell into a trance, he would berate and verbally abuse them. He would try to rouse them by pinching and slapping them until they were black and blue. Once, 
On the advice of a sympathetic church-going friend, he doused the boys with boiling water. When this didn't work, he allowed his friend to drop a red-hot coal into William's hand, hoping to exercise his devils. The boy never awakened from his trance, but he did bear a scar on his palm for the rest of his life. On occasion, the spirits would attempt to defend the boys, appearing in front of Zephaniah and driving him from the house. Needless to say, these eerie and frustrating happenings were more than the man could stand. So, tiring of the boys but realizing their money-making potential, he sold the Eddie brothers to a traveling showman, who for the next 14 years took them all over America, Canada, and Europe. The long series of performances can only be described as sadism run rampant. As part of the performance, their manager would bind and gag the boys and then would challenge audience members to try and awaken them from their trances. The cruelty inflicted by these audiences made their father's abuse look tame. The Eddies were locked into small, wooden boxes to see if they could escape, and hot wax was poured into their mouths to see if they could produce spirit voices when they were unable to talk. The skeptics poked, prodded, pinched, and punched the sleeping brothers, leaving them scarred and damaged for the rest of their lives. On several occasions, they were even stoned and shot at by angry mobs. William Eddy bore a number of bullet scars on his body. Infuriated mobs attacked them and their promoters for every reason except for the justifiable one of stopping further child abuse. Some of the protesters were religious fanatics, convinced the Eddies were in league with the devil, while others were skeptics who felt that they had been cheated out of their money and had watched a performance of trickery. They barely escaped from Danvers, Massachusetts with their lives. In Cleveland, an angry mob seized William Eddy and only a last-minute rescue saved him from the pain of hot tar and feathers. In some of the larger cities like New York and Philadelphia, they were safer from mobs but were still subjected to threats and indignities. In spite of all of this, the Eddies gave performances so sensational and so profitable that only the death of their father ended their tours and their suffering. They were finally allowed to return home but that is nowhere near the end of their story. We'll continue with the strange mystery of the Eddie Brothers when Weird Darkness returns. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Makers of Fleischman's Fresh Yeast present I Love a Mystery. Presenting the latest adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie, specialists in crime and adventure, 
now engaged in traveling secretly from the Mexican border to the Canadian border by underground railway in the face of death. You know, just yesterday, I heard a woman say... I tell you, Sarah, if I were a man, I'd enlist in the Army or Navy right now. I want to do something. But what can a woman do to help the defense program? Now, I just hope that lady's listening in. Because I want to remind her and other American women that there's plenty you can do to help. As a matter of fact, you women are already faced with one of the biggest civilian defense problems. The problem of making Americans strong and healthy and more efficient. And it's not an easy job. It's been stated that 40% of the people in the United States have poor and inadequate diets. This means they're not getting enough of the right kinds of foods, enough of the essential vitamins. And because it's your duty and the duty of every American woman to see that your families enjoy health plus, I want to tell you that you can get many of these important vitamins easily and inexpensively in Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast. But remember, no other yeast has all the vitamins shown on the Fleischmann label. So for a good supply of vitamin B complex and other important vitamins, drink two cakes of Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast every day. Yes, drink it, America. To your health. Secret Passage to Death, a new Carlton Morse adventure thriller. Five o'clock in the afternoon, far off the beaten path in the mountainous backcountry, somewhere in Inyo County in southeastern California. It's been three months now since the nightmare case of the monster in the mansion was completed. And it's only been a month since Reggie got out of the hospital, recovered from the injury received on the case. Just a week ago, a very correct gentleman walked into the boys' A-1 detective agency offices and made them a very strange proposition. As a result of the proposition, the three left their luscious secretary, Jerry Booker, in charge of the office and filtered unobtrusively, and they hoped unobserved, down to the Mexican border. There, in the back room of a border hangout of doubtful repute, a Spanish girl gave them a message, which sent them stealthily to a riding stable on the outer edge of town. There, they were mounted on three fine horses and added instructions murmured into Jack's ear by a Mexican stable boy. And here they are on the final stretch of the first lap of their strange mission, racing against time and someone who is following them. Yeah, ain't no doubt about it, Jack. Yeah, they come over the ridge. We're being followed. They're coming fast, huh? Like Billy, oh, how much farther, Jack? About a mile. No more talking now. Dig in and ride. Woo-hoo! I say, mountain stream ahead. Never mind the mountain stream. Here we go. Get out of that sand. Here's the road over here. And water road. Come on, baby. Show us, Texas boy, what you can do. Come on, up. Stop banging with you. That's that girl. Up, up, stay down. Hey. Hey, y'all. What's holding you back? Jack, I've been watching over my shoulder. They still haven't caught sight of us. Never mind that. Right. This year road show ain't travel much. We're nearly up to our knees and leaves. Yeah. There's a stretch just ahead, Carl, of a rock cliff, so keep your horse's head up. You bet you. I say, we're about to descend through sheer rock cliffs. Yeah. This is the stretch I was telling you about. Watch out. Whoopee, boy, what a ride. Hang on to your head, kid. Hey, Doc. Cut the clowning and ride, will you? Well, okay, son. I say, I hear running water. Yeah. I hope there's a bridge there when we come to it. That's an awful deep ravine on our left. Son, you ain't kidding. Hey, Jack. There's a bridge up yonder. Yeah. It's a narrow one. We'll have to take it one at a time. Okay, lead off, son. You bring up the rear, Doc. Well, look here. A belly swinging bridge. Over. Here I go. That's 
Jack's up, boy. Red Jack's up. We must be out riding the men behind us. Haven't seen them since that last bridge. Way back. I hope so. They shouldn't have been behind us at all. You know, it's not a bridge ahead. It's a wide one. We can all take it at once. That's the bridge I was looking for. Not far now. We turn to the right just ahead onto a gravel road. Follow me. There's a farmhouse yonder among the trees. Is that our destination? It is if there's a white gate open. Yeah. What, son? There's your white gate, and it's standing wide open. Okay. Inside and head across the pasture for that barn. Come on, baby. We're heading for the barn. What do we do when we get to the barn? The big doors at the front should be standing wide open. Yeah. Here they are, too. I can see them. Right, right into the barn. Come on, this is the last lap. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold right over, Mike. Ready? Oh. Uh, oh. Okay, son, here we are. Now what? Shall I close the doors? No, I'm supposed to press a button here in the wall someplace. Press a button? Yeah. Oh, here it is. Wait, you press a button, then what happens? Watch. Hey. Why, it's the elevator. The whole darn barn's going down into the glass. No, no. Not the whole barn, just the room. Oh, really? Well, I'll be a skin skunk and hung up to dry if this don't beat anything I ever did see. Pretty clever, huh? Yeah. Well, okay, we're down now. What? We wait. For what? I don't know yet. Huh? Say, Jack, what's up above? Do you know? What takes the place of this room up at the entrance of the barn? A hay mow. Anybody who tries to get into the side of the barn we came in, all they find is a mouthful of hay. Ain't this the silliest darn thing you ever did see? What's a contraption like this doing way up here on a mountain ranch in a half? Didn't you ever hear of an underground railway? I say. Huh. Well, you mean this is one? This is one of the stations. Well, I'll be. Jack, I swear to my grandma, I never knowed we was getting into anything like this. You mean they use this to smuggle folks in and out of the country? I've told you everything I know about it. All I know is we're here to do a job. Well, what kind of a job? That's what we're here to find out. Well, what happens if we don't want the job after we hear about it? I don't know. Well, that sounds great. Yeah. How about getting the saddles off these horses and giving them a rub down? Rather. My neck's steaming like a boiler. Yeah. How'd you like to spit out that bit for a while, baby? Oh, leave the bits in. Huh? Don't want to take any chance of their whinnying for a while. Hey, you uh, find anything to rub them down with, Reggie? Here's some old pieces of saddle blanket. Some horse blankets here to cover them with after we finish, too. Oh, good. Good evening, gentlemen. Oh, I see. Hey, where did you come from? Through the door yonder. But I thought we was down underground. You are. But I don't see... Hey, I... You will in a minute. Uh, are you Jack Packard? No, ma'am. I'm Doc Long. I'm Packard. Oh, well, well, I'm Mrs. Tom Blair, Mr. Packard. My husband owns this ranch here, Stop Nant. Oh, I see. Uh, and you men are to come with me. But the horses. Oh, they're Tom's horses. One of the men will take care of them. Oh, I see. Now, come with me. You go on through and wait while I lock the door. Uh, yeah, how about me helping you? No. Well, all right. Hey, we're in a kind of a tunnel. What do you mean, a kind of a tunnel? It is a tunnel. Well, okay, so it's a tunnel. Uh, now, then, will one of you hand me that kerosene lantern off the peg? You bet you. Hey, y'all, Mrs. Blair. Thank you. Come this way. Hmm. Fine, sandy dust underfoot. This tunnel must stay dry the year round. Mm, yes, it does. Hmm. Are the others here? What others? I don't know. That was just a shot in the dark. Oh, there's no use questioning me. I, I don't know a thing about anything. Oh, but your husband, uh, Tom Blair, does, huh? Well, Tom's a rancher. Uh, why would he know anything? Uh, just a minute. Hey, it's a door. Is this way out? No. Uh, you gentlemen, wait in here, please. I see. Nothing but a bare, sod room. Yeah. Come on in. Huh. I don't get it. I'll leave this here lantern on the peg inside the door so you'll have some light. Hey, uh, you just going to leave us here? Uh, my husband will be along directly. <laughs> Joe, locked in to boot. Jack, what you make of this setup anyhow? You know as much as I do. You're taking it mighty calm. Well, why not? There's a $500 retainer fee in our bank in Hollywood and another 2000 to go with it when we finish the job. Yes, but what job? I don't know. Yeah, we've been riding the tails off them plugs for six hours without a let up, and instead of getting a chance to wash you up and tuck some grub away and go to bed, what happens? We get stuck away underground in that old sod room. Oh, relax, Doc. Why should I? You'll live longer. Oh, yeah. 
Uh oh. Somebody's unlocking the door. Good evening, men. Good evening. Hello. Hello. I'm Tom Blair. I'm Packard. Glad to know you, Packard. Mm -hmm. This is Doc Long. This is Reggie York. Howdy, Mr. Blair. I'll take you to where you can clean up, and then we'll throw some food into you presently. But first, I gotta ask you a question. Yeah, shoot. Those horsemen who were following you get a good look at your faces? Well, as far as we know, they didn't. Certainly not after we knew they were on our trail. When did you know that? Oh, about six miles out the other side of this place. How'd you come to know you was being followed? Well, first we didn't. Reggie happened to look back and noticed a posse coming up on us fast from over a rise. We didn't have any idea whether they were after us or not, but we didn't like the look of it, so we lit out. It didn't take long after that to figure out who they was chasing. Oh, yeah. They'd like to catch up to you, all right. Well, why? Well, that's nothing to do with me. Well, who does it have to do with? You'll get all that after you've eaten. Well, would you mind answering me this, then? What would have happened to us if we had have been caught? Oh, a couple of slugs in the liver. Carcasses tossed down some out-of-the-way canyon. I see. Hey, who was them bandits anyhow? That I wouldn't know. You don't know nothing, do you, Spoke? Oh, never mind. Uh, we're sorry we lured whoever they were into this neighborhood, Blair. Are they liable to suspect your hiding us and make trouble? No, we took care of that. How? Three of my men were waiting on horses in the woods where you turned off to the barn. For what? They took up the ride down the road where you left off. That posse chasing three of your men now? Sure. Must be 10, 12 miles away by now. Still going strong. Oh, I say, what happens then? Oh, when my boys get tired, they'll lead them up some blind mountain road and lose them. Well, pretty clever. Yeah, and who would ever think a nice little old farmhouse like this for... think it was an underground railroad station anyhow. Don't... Just a minute. Yeah? What is it? Tom, honey, they just brought an unconscious girl in on a stretcher. An unconscious girl? Yes, and the queerest thing... She's Chinese. The beginning of adventure. The first station in an underground railway. A posse of killers, and now they bring in a Chinese girl on a stretcher. They? Who are they? But first, a brief message from the makers of Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast. Now, I'll bet that when you modern housekeepers buy things for your families, you're pretty careful, aren't you? Pretty careful isn't the word, Mr. Dahlstead. We're regular Sherlock Holmes, looking for evidence that tells us we're really getting our money's worth. Well, that's the way you should be, especially when you buy food for your families. Because right now, it's more important than ever for busy Americans to have properly balanced diets. And this means getting adequate amounts of important vitamins, especially of the vitamin B complex, which you find in natural foods like yeast. So, before you or other members of your family start taking yeast for an added supply of vitamins, I want to suggest that you read the Fleischmann's yeast label first. Is there a difference in the vitamin content of various yeasts? You bet. Fleischmann's yeast is not only one of the richest natural sources of vitamin B complex, it contains other important vitamins as well. Just look at the label. Vitamin A, 3,100 units. Vitamin B1, 150 units. Vitamin D, 400 units. Vitamin G, 40 to 50 units. And remember, Fleischmann's is the only yeast with all these vitamins. And that includes fresh yeast, dry yeast, and any other kind of yeast. So, friends, if you want to add vitamin B complex and other essential vitamins to your diet, drink two cakes of Fleischmann's fresh yeast every day. Yes, drink it, America. To your health. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. That was the best food I've clamped down on in I don't know when. How about that, Jack? I'm more interested in that Chinese girl. Oh, sure, only that don't keep me from getting hungry. 
What you grinning about, Red? Nothing. You had just as much as I did, I noticed. When you reckon we're going to get a look at this sleeping oriental... Well, hello, Mrs. Black. Uh, if you've finished eating, come this way, please. Yeah, we're finished. And doing good food, too, my... Uh, follow me, please. Now watch where you step. I'll hold the lantern so you can see the floor. Hmm. Seems to be in some kind of a storeroom. Look at them shelves of canned fruit. Quite. Bins of potatoes, cabbages, and apples. She said to keep your eyes on the floor. Oh, uh... Wait, please. Huh. Well? The gentlemen are here. Yes, let them come in. You're to go in here. Thanks. Hey, uh, ain't you coming in? No. Good night. Huh. That's funny. Well, never mind, Mrs. Blair. Come on. Hmm? Shall we come in? Yes, please do. Be careful you don't fall over something. Yeah, I ain't used to candlelight. This is Mr. Blair's carpenter room. Close the door, please, Mr. York. Okay. Sit down on whatever's convenient. Well, I can't see you good, but your voice sounds like a fellow that made us a proposition back in our office in Hollywood. Exactly. I'm Rupert Knight. You've carried out your initial instructions very well. My congratulations. Well, I thought you'd say just the opposite. Why, Packard? Well, the enemy, at least I suppose it was the enemy, he picked up our trail and were hot after us when we arrived. My dear Packard, the enemy is going to be hot on your trail every minute of the night and day until you've completed the commission I'm about to give you. You got here safely and the enemy's been thrown off the scent for the moment. That's all we can expect. Hey, um, am I seeing things or is that the figure of a little old female gal sitting over yonder in the shadow? Yes, she's Eve Bartley. Eve, these men are Jack Packard, Doc Long, and Reggie York, who to be your companions on this occasion. Good evening, gentlemen. We're to have Miss Barkley on our hands and the unconscious body of the Chinese girl on the cot beside Eve. I'm beginning not to like this. What's the unconscious Chinese girl for? This little oriental girl is in a hypnotic sleep. She was hypnotized seven days ago in a Spanish seaport of her own consent. Placed in a casket and flown to Africa, then across to South America, and finally to the Mexican border where she was smuggled across to me. Why? She has vital information for a certain unnamed international society with headquarters in London. When she arrives in Canada, she'll be taken to the proper quarters, awakened, and permitted to divulge her secret. What, you mean she's flying halfway around the world to get some information to London from Spain? Well, why didn't somebody fly straight to England with a secret? Yeah, or, or give it to this so-called unnamed society's representative in Spain, or radio it through to England. It's not the type of information which can be given by word of mouth alone. You mean she's got some papers on her? You've had all the information concerning the secret I'm permitted to give. Well, you still haven't said why she didn't give her information to the society's representative in Spain. Or even in Africa. Yeah, I fly it there. And what is this, your unnamed international society with headquarters in London, anyhow? You are here to perform, not ask questions. Hmm. How about that, Jack? Mm, that's right. Okay, sports, you talk. For the last six months, headquarters has been trying to get this secret. Three times, planes started out with it and simply vanished. Seven of the society's officials have been murdered after receiving portions of the information. Two in El Porto, three in The Hague, and one each in Nice and Bordeaux. And I know of five members of a private intelligence organization who have died over it. Jove, what kind of an enemy is your ballet society up against? Exactly. If we knew, we'd be better equipped to fight it. Well, if this is true, then what chance do you think we've got? Well, we've got to keep trying. We've got the girl this far. But you really don't give us much chance, eh? Do you know who you're up against? You told us nobody knew. I mean, do you know who you'll be battling from the Mexican to the Canadian border? Who? Oh. Every criminal and every criminal organization in the country. Oh. Where do they come in at? The society's enemy has put $50,000 in an American bank which will be paid to the man or men who kill or capture, it doesn't matter which, this Chinese girl. Hey. No strings attached? Only one. The body must be delivered to a certain known person in San Francisco for the payoff. Well, ain't that a pleasant thought. Mm -hmm. And who is Miss Eve Barclay? Eve is the Chinese girl's companion. Oh, I see. I was with her when she was hypnotized. Her control insisted that I must be with her when she is awakened. Look, you mean to tell me that a person can be kept in a hypnotic state indefinitely? On the other hand, such long periods are most unusual. And I'm told in certain cases might prove fatal. This little Chinese girl is different. Yeah? That is so. She has been a subject for a hypnotist for a number of years. On a number of occasions, she has been under a spell for two and three weeks without harm. That's why she was chosen for this mission. Yeah? You mind if I look at her? You may, if you wish. Yeah, I don't care if I do. And it's going to be our job to get Miss Barkley and this Chinese girl north to the Canadian border? Yes. 
with every trigger man and would-be killer hot on our trail? From groups like Murder Incorporated right down to the meanest little petty thief in the street. Oh, it's a job. Believe me, it's a job. I understand as well as you do that it's ten times the job with an unconscious girl to look after. Oh, she's not going to be as difficult as Miss Barclay. You would have very little trouble with me, Mr. Packard. I hope so. I've been looking after myself for several years now. You two had better start getting together. You're practically going to be sitting in each other's laps from now on. Does she understand I'm boss in the outfit? You do understand that, don't you, Eve? Yes. Understand this, Packard. You aren't being turned out on your own when you leave here. You'll follow a secret way which has been worked out with all the cunning of clever men's minds. You're to travel from point to point, stations in the Underground Railway which have been tested and made as secure against danger as possible. Yeah, he told us that back in Hollywood. The only time you will be in grave danger... The only time we cannot help you is while you're traveling from one station to the next. Then you're entirely dependent on your own resources. Well, that's what we're getting paid for. Exactly. You men were chosen because your past record shows exceptional resourcefulness and danger. Resourcefulness and a loyalty to the man or cause you're working for at the moment. What was that last crack? I just want it well established in all your minds that if this Chinese girl and Eve Barclay here are betrayed... You will be hounded to the very ends of the earth. Oh, we're impressed right down in the bone. For your sakes, I hope you are. Hey, Doc, haven't you seen enough of that sleep in Hong Kong beauty by this time? Jack, come over here. I want you to see something. This girl is a man, too. Come here. Come here, Jack, and look at her face. Hmm. Tiny thing. Doesn't look much more than a child. She's 18. Well, I'm glad of that. This country's got some pretty strict ideas about what you can and can't do with minors. And I'm not at all sure that hypnotizing a young girl and lugging her around the country isn't one of the things you can't do. Now, there's nothing to worry about there. The girl is 18. Did you ever see such a little face? Pretty, too. Like a little piece of porcelain or something. Uh, what's her name? Does it matter? No, I suppose not. I say, how are we supposed to handle her? We better well can't take a stretcher wherever we go. Yeah, that's something. Treat her exactly as you would any sleeping or unconscious person. You shouldn't have much difficulty carrying her about, Mr. York. Hey, what you look at Reggie for? I'm the one who looks after the female women in this outfit. Except for the actual lifting and carrying her from place to place. I'll do all the looking after this girl that will be necessary. Yeah, I reckon you will at that. You can believe me. I will. And now it's time you learn that you've still another ten miles to go tonight. Tonight? Yes. What the heck? Only ten miles? We'll be there before you know it. What about a horse? There'll be no horses on this trek. Oh, ten miles on foot? You're going places where a horse couldn't go. Carrying the Chinese girl? Yes. Well, I'll be doggone, Jack. They hired us for a string of pack horse. And you've wasted enough time. You start immediately. You ready, Eve? Yes, certainly. Packard? Where is that? Uh... Good. Here's a detailed map of your route and your instructions for making your next contact. You've got two minutes to digest it and then it's to be burned. Oh, well, why two minutes? Don't bother him. He must concentrate. Leave him to himself. Mr. Knight, may I ask a question? Yes, of course. I should think strange activities around a place like this would soon bring neighborhood gossip and inquiry. I mean, how do you keep the station of your underground railway secret over a long period of time? You've got the wrong idea, Mr. York. This farm hasn't been used as an underground station for over a year. It may not be used for another year, perhaps never again. The railway is flexible. The stations are always being changed. So if one is spotted, it's simply abandoned. Sure, that must require a tremendous organization. That we will not talk about. Well, what the heck is it for? I can see it comes in handy for getting this little old Chinese gal to Canada, but the rest of the time, what's it used for? That is none of your business. Oh, well, it ain't, huh? Definitely not. Well, pardon my lifted pinky. Ain't I just too curious for words? Okay, okay, Doc, break it up. Jack, I don't like the way a somebody thinks he can shove me around. You'll finish with the instructions? Yep, then burn it. Jack, I said I don't Hey, like... Doc, will you hold still? Here's a match, Jack. I say, that must have been greased paper the way it went up in a puff. It was. All right, Packard, take over. It's in your hands now until you reach the next station. All right. Miss Barclay. Yes? Stick out your feet. Let me see your shoes. Yes. Mm. Mm-hmm. Good climbing shoes. Are they broken in? They are. You got a good warm sweater under that jacket? I have one in my knapsack. Okay, we're going pretty high. It's liable to be snappy towards morning. Reggie. All right. You'll carry the Chinese girl to start with. Uh, but Jack... Shut up, Don. Uh, Pick her up, Reggie. Go ahead. There. I have it. Okay. Now, after we leave this room, I'll lead off. Reggie, you immediately behind me. Miss Barkley behind Reggie and Doc. You bring up the rear. Okay. Well, let's do something instead of standing around here talking. All right, Mr. Knight. Everybody keep close to me. See you sometime again, Mr. Knight. Definitely. We're depending on it. Good luck. Here we go. Here's where we take to the woods.
We start to climb pretty quick? Yep, almost immediately. No more talking now. It's hard walking on this granite and gravel and stuff, especially toting this little old Chinese doll. Want me to take it back for a while? No, I'm doing all right. All right, all right, hold it. We must be darn near on top of this mountain. Yeah, just about. It's now two o'clock in the morning. I say, we've been climbing steadily almost six hours. Yep, yeah, we're about a mile from the second station. I own out, Miss Barkley. Why do you keep asking that? I'm perfectly all right. Well, it was quite a climb. <laughs> I don't think so. Well, I'm glad of it, but you don't need to be so snide about it. In this business, I take your instructions. Otherwise, I act as I choose. Mm. One of them coal mamas that was weaned on her icicle. Okay, let's leave it that way. Mm. How do we get to the station from here? Well, I don't know. You don't know? No, but according to my instructions, there should be a man waiting under that scraggly oak tree over there who can show us. Well, let's get to going. It's cold and messy. You've barked his heart standing around here. All right, lay off, Doc. Reggie, you stay here with Doc and the Chinese girl. Miss Barkley, come with me. Why? I want to leave two men to guard this girl at all times. You come with me to contact the outpost who's waiting for us. Certainly. Come along. You fellas wait here. Well, hurry up. Is this the tree you meant? Yeah. Hold it. Hmm. Doc, I'm seen under that tree. Hey, there. Last call for the boys in blue. What's that mean? You know. Huh. Funny I don't get any answer. Stay here. I'm going under the branches. Yes. Hey, what's this? Is the man there? Yeah, he's here. Hanging by his neck from a limb. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. The following is Part 3 of Secret Passage to Death from I Love a Mystery. Unfortunately, the quality is very poor, but I didn't want to leave you hanging by not sharing the rest of the story with you. The following is about 28 minutes. If you can't handle it, just fast forward. Makers of Freshman Fresh Yeast present I Love a Mystery. Sounds reasonable to me. But 
Sorry, could one really notice a difference after taking Fleischmann's yeast for just one week? Well, recently over 150 people completed a special test of Fleischmann's yeast. And six out of ten said they benefited the very first week. And after four weeks were up, nine out of ten reported definite benefits. Say, Fleischmann's yeast must be all right. You bet. Fleischmann's yeast is one of the richest natural sources of vitamin B complex. And many people need more of this important group of vitamins to help them feel brilliantly alive and fit. Well, I believe I'll try Fleischmann's yeast for a week. I'd like to see what it can do for me. Swell. And remember, you can keep the whole week's supply right in the refrigerator. Then, last thing every night, first thing every morning, drink Fleischmann's fresh yeast and tomato juice. Yes, drink it, America. To your help. <laughs> Secret passage to death. A new Carlton Morris adventure thriller. o'clock in the morning on the brow of a rugged peak somewhere in the mountainous and sparsely inhabited eastern California county known as Inyo. Three o'clock in the morning over a mile above sea level, lighted by a white frosty moon and freezing cold. And instead of being met by a friendly guide, the trail ends in the chilling shadow of a gnarled oak with the body of a man swaying from a limb hanged by the neck. That's where Jack Packard, Doc Long, and Reggie York are now, looking up at this dangling corpse which was to have been their friend and guide. Crouched in the protective shadow of a jagged granite rock out of the numbing cold is Eve Barclay, and with her, the unconscious small form of the Chinese girl. That's the whole object of this excursion into death and destruction. Jack, Doc, and Reggie have been hired to safely carry the Chinese girl, who is in a state of hypnotic sleep, from the Mexican border to Canada, and all the forces of evil in America are out to stop them. Eve Barclay is the sleeping oriental girl's companion. The route they are traveling is the mysterious underground railway. Their first station was a hideout on the Mexican border. Their second station, a respectable but isolated farmhouse in Inyo County. And now, here they are approaching the third station. The man hanging from the limb was to have guided them to it. Reggie, you go to the rock and stay with Miss Barkley and the Chinese girl. We're going to remain here for a few minutes. Doc and I are going to cut this body down. Stay with the girls and keep your eyes open. You may depend on the fact that still have one in jail. No, no, there isn't. He's a dead pigeon. But I gotta get some kind of a clue. Huh? Don't you realize we have got the famous clue to the third station of the Underground Railway without this man's help? At least I think this is a man. Hey, I try. Without your knife, I'll support the body when you cut it down. Okay, but you don't think that anybody who'd take the trouble to kill this boy would leave him without going through his pocket, do you? Especially if he's killed to keep us from having something from helping out. That's why he was killed. Don't worry about that. You right? Yeah. Just say the word. Okay. Oh, I've cut him down. Yeah. Hey, Phil, I just got me an idea. Suppose the sports that's thrown up Oscar here are still around. You just thought of that. Yeah. What do you think I sent Reggie over to the girls for? Well, then you think maybe they are around? What's to prevent? Then why don't we get the heck on out of here? Unless I get some information off this body, there's no place for us to go except back to the last station. Starting over. Okay, hey, son, after we spent practically all night getting this for? My idea, exactly. But I don't see how it... Hey... What's this he's got in his left hand? Uh-huh. Look, he's got something clutched in his fingers. If we could fly him open. Oh, never mind, I can see it. You can? Yeah. It's a little gold cross. Oh. I thought it might be something we could use as a team. Oh, maybe it is. Look. The same gold chain attached. He must have reached up and dragged it off his neck in his last instant of life. Yeah. Probably kind of religious. Poor fella. Or maybe in one last desperate effort he was trying to leave us a message. Gold cross? Don't leave no message to me. I wonder. Come on, let's get out of here. Now, wait a minute. What about the Oscar here? If you have friends, we'll find him. Our job is to get away from here fast. Let's do it. You think you got on to something? Maybe. Hey. Isn't this where we left Reggie and the girls? Yeah. Hey. Hey, Reggie. Around here, Jack. Come around the rock. Oh, oh boy. Did I get me a scare for a minute? Here we are. Dark, what? Right here, there's more shelter from the cold. Miss Parker was worried about the sleeping Chinese girl. Uh, it's quite all right now. I put an extra sweater on her. All right, now listen. In spite of our guide being dead, I think I got a clue to the third station. We came up to the prow of the peak from the south. There's a sheer hundred-foot cliff just the other side of the oak tree over there where we found the body. That cliff 
cuts off any possibility of getting down on either the east or north side. So there's only one direction for us to go. West, I know. This is every country, Jack. Unless we've got a path to follow, it's going to be rough going. Mm, it's just too bad. Stop. It's your turn to carry the Chinese girl. Right now. Huh? Yeah. Is she ready, Miss Barkley? Yes. Okay. Up you come, honey. <sighs> Well, Paul, if she don't remind me of some little kid, she can't weigh more than about 80 pounds. Doc, uh, you fall right behind me with a girl, and you, Miss Barkley, and you'll answer it anything. The easiest walking is right along the edge of the cliff to begin with. Watch your step. Come on. Oh, I'm plenty thankful for that move. Never mind a moment. I'm dry, but I'm sure what might be waiting in the shadows. Yeah. Those are the men who hanged our guide. Who do you think? That shot came from behind. Don't shake, Reggie. What? Okay, we're going back. Keep on your hands and knees. Hey, hey, what about me? You stay right where you are. Lie on your stomachs. All right, come on, Reggie. Oh, that's great. A swell fight me laying here on my stomach with two female women. Are uh, Mr. Packard and Mr. York armed? Stay armed with what it takes to stomp out the kind of vermin in back yard. Well, I hope. We ain't getting off to such a good start, looks like. I've been fighting this kind of thing ever since I left Spain with this sleeping girl. Yeah, you have had a time. Spain to Africa to South America to Mexico. Maybe you've been doing all right with that little Chinese doll. Well, wait until she's been delivered to the International Society's headquarters in London before we start to pat ourselves on the back. Oh, I'm calling that one to pay. That sounded like somebody went off of the cliff. Well, I hate that. Yeah, listen, listen. Well, whatever happened, it seems to be all over. You, you think... I this ain't no time to think. This is a time to just wait and see. Well, if, if that was Mr. Packard or Mr. York who went off the cliff... Oh, don't be such a darn fool. Zachary Ridge wouldn't make a noise like that and the being cut up into little pieces. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, me too. That's why I'm kind of upset at that. Hey, listen... Is somebody? Who is it? Can talk fast. It's okay, dog. Relax. Oh. Is Reggie all right? I don't want it. Okay. Up on your feet. Let's get on our way. Uh, all over, huh? Enemy encountered and badly discouraged. Yeah. That baby that went over the edge sounded mighty discouraged. Mm, it's too bad. The other one didn't make a sound when he went over. Too bad, huh? Was it necessary? Then there was. All right, here we go. Hey. Hey, hold it. Bells. Well, I'm doing if that don't sound like it was a church somewhere down below. It does it then? What time do you suppose it is? Somewhere around four o'clock in the morning. Come on. We've been coming down that dirt mountain for five hours. Well, we're down at last. Where does it get us to? See any bacon and eggs around anywhere? Well, let me take the girl for a while, Reggie. Well, I can keep it for a while yet. You better help us, Barkley. Well, I'm afraid my feet are blistered. Yeah, and that roll down into the ravine didn't do any good. Let me give you a hand. Oh, forget it. It's part of the game. Oh, look. Look through the trees. I say, where? The church spire. That must be the mission whose bells we've been hearing. Yes, ma'am. They ain't going to catch jump away. Man, do I hope they got a lot of bread and cheese. Come on, let's hold it up back. But I say, children, see it. Oh, there must be a school in connection with the mission. Dog. 
God, ain't that sweet? Fish. All right, come on, keep walking. I really go for that. All my life I've been crazy about kids. What I ought to have is a family man. <laughs> Maybe a great family man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's go right straight across the lawn to the mission building. Ain't gonna care much about us walking on that lawn, I bet you. Oh, well, this is the place we're looking for. Yeah. I say, the, the singing stopped. Oh. Probably caught sight of it. Look, there comes one of the sisters out on the porch. Well, let me do the talking a little bit. Good morning. Are your people in trouble? I'm afraid they are, sister. Uh, put the Chinese girl down, Mr. York, please. What's the pleasure? You are one of the sisters of this Catholic mission, aren't you? Oh, you're mistaken. I'm not a sister. And this isn't a Catholic mission. Oh. No. It's interdenominational, if anything. Oh. Are you head of the mission school? Oh, no. I'm only a teacher. Yes, ma'am. We, we heard them singing as we come up. Yes. They sing like little angels. But something must be done for this little Chinese girl. I'll send one of the children to Dr. Lester. Dr. Lester, the head of this mission? Yes. Excuse me while I start one of the children on the errand. Yes, certainly. Mm. Nice lady, huh? Yeah. Jack, do you think this is the third station? I don't know. I'm anxious to take a look at this doctor less than Well, here come teacher. Yeah. We'll have Dr. Lester here in no time now. I I suggest you men wait here until he comes. And I'll take these girls to the women's quarters. This this Chinese girl. What's wrong with her? She's fallen into a coma. We're trying to get her to a specialist. I see. But do you carry over to the women's quarters for Miss... Uh... Miss Walter. Yes, yeah, Miss Walter. This way, please. Right up. I hate to leave those girls underground. Well, you can't expect us to go to the women's department. What would they say? Yeah, hold on. Here he comes. Dr. Lester. Looks like a mighty fine, upstanding gent, if you ask me. Good afternoon. You gentlemen wish to see me? You the Reverend Dr. Lester? I am. I'm Jack Packard. This is Doc Long. I see. Were you expecting us? Three men and two women, one a Chinese girl? Was I expecting? My dear sir, I was expecting no one. And certainly not a Chinese girl. Not even an unconscious Chinese girl. This gets more curious every minute. Now, if we can be of any assistance oh, to you. you don't go right, you can. I'm so hungry I could eat ham and eggs in the row. Food? Oh, of course you shall be fed. Oh, just a minute. It's no concern of yours that one man was hanged and two others went to their death over a cliff on that mountain peak up there? Mountain peak? Yes. The death of my fellow men is always of concern to us who minister to men's lives. The man who was hanged had a gold cross in his head. Yeah, it's good that he was thinking of his maker when his sword left his body. That's all you have to say? I'm afraid I, I don't understand. No, uh, it's okay, Dr. It's our fault, not sure. We'll accept your invitation to eat. Uh, excuse me, Dan. I, I'll give orders for first preparation. Uh, just resting, please. Not the third station, huh? No. Well, oh, yeah. What about it, sir? Oh, boy. Now you know how it feels to be absolutely and utterly lost. <laughs> Society with headquarters in London to whom the boys are trying to deliver a sleeping Chinese girl has, for the moment, disrupted the underground railway system. This is only the beginning of adventure. But first, there's just time to tell our friend here in the studio how to make Fleischmann's yeast the new pleasant way. All right, sir, here's all you do. Just mash up a cake of Fleischmann's yeast in a dry glass with a fork. Add 
just a little tomato juice and stir it till smoothly blended. Fill the glass, give it another stir, and drink it immediately. Say, that sounds easy. I'll start drinking flashman's juice first thing tomorrow. I could use more vitamins. Well, then just be sure that you always ask for Fleischmann's yeast. You know, Fleischmann's is not only one of the richest natural sources of vitamin B complex, but no other yeast has the other vitamins shown on the Fleischmann label. And that includes fresh yeast, dry yeast, and any other kind of yeast. So, friends, if you want to find out what yeast can do for you, go to your grocer's tomorrow and buy a week's supply of Fleischmann's yeast. Then try it for just one week. The last thing every night and the first thing every morning, drink one cake of Fleischmann's fresh yeast and tomato juice. Yes, drink it, America. Your help. Jack, shut that door, Ed. Oh, the door's awful close. Hey, Jack, what 
are we going to do? We're surrounded. Yeah. Getting pretty thick in here. There's a couple of runners further down the wall. Maybe we could break in and get some air. Well, you can get out that way. Well, I don't know about that. We'll show up in the far light. It's a good storm. Well, come on. Here's what I mean. Grab up something to break the glass. A little fresh air. Hey, what's the matter? Did you cut your hand? I didn't break that window. There's something from the rocky from outside. Give me a better chance. Oh, so now they're throwing rocks there. Right. Here it is. I say, Jack, there's a paper tied about it. Paper? Yeah, let me see. Tied about with a string. Here you are. Can you get enough lead from the hay marks on fire? Yeah. Hey, look. Dr. Lester says go to the back of the grave. There's a door leading down into a stone cellar. There is plenty of ventilation, so you will not want to suffocate. Sign, last call for the boys in blue. Well, you better find that brain room that quick. Follow me. Here it is. This is a door. Gotta help you keep out the heat and smoke. Now you go. Watch your step. Closing the door. Better use your flashlight, right? Okay. Boy, show us quiet, that means. Let that barn just burn on down right here. Who cares? Well, there we are. Well, when you look around, this must be the storeroom for the mission. Well, you look at all the supplies. Yeah, it's clean and cool in spite of the fire up the road. Yeah. You better lay that there china dog down before Miss Walker jumps down your throat. Oh, right. Oh, I know. Right here, please. Yeah. Hey, now what are we going to do? Wait until the fire dies down, the embers cool up above. Which will be sometime toward morning, I reckon. I see. Is everyone awake? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah, me too. What time is it? Just three in the morning. Oh, boy. Oh, you'd think the embers up here would be cool enough for them to come down and get to it by now. Yeah, I thought I heard some movement a short while ago. Hey, you did. You hear that, Jack? Yeah, I heard it. What's it? Here we are. It's like they've come for it. They got it open. are not appreciably lost in the oven. They go right into the bread. The 
further adventures of Jack, Doc, and Gretchen on the secret passage to death will come to you next week at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written by Carlton E. Morris, comes to you through the courtesy of the makers of Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast. lovers enjoy truly great coffee. Chase and Sanborn's wonderful, super rich blend. It's brimming with extra flavor and fragrance. Rich, heady, delicious. A blend that puts you in a holiday mood every day in the week. Your choice of drip or regular grind, both economical, both supremely satisfying. For downright coffee pleasure, for the blend that's friendship in a cup, ask your grocer for super rich Chase and Sanborn. This is the Blue Network of the National Broadcasting Company. What makes someone kill? Not only innocent people, but sometimes the very people who loved and trusted them. What imagined wrongs could drive a deluded individual to seek revenge by taking another person's life? What lengths will people go to to get what they want? Murderous Minds, Volume 2, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escape the Headlines is the latest offering in a series that takes you inside the life of killers who committed cold-blooded murder for a glimpse at events that drove them to kill. Each tale is sordid, twisted, and worthy of newspaper headlines. By weaving a tale in which dark fantasies turned reality, this book invites you to see life from a perspective few ever witness, that of the killer. Paired with an in-depth account of each case, it will be a nightmarish journey to the darkest reaches of the mind of these real-life murderers. Murderous Minds, Volume 2, written by Ryan Becker, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. We continue now with the mystery of the Eddie Brothers. When we last left the story, they had just finished being performance monkeys, for lack of better words, being abused by crowds and their own father. We'll see what happens next as we continue. They moved on to their family farm with their sister Mary and opened the house as a modest inn called the Green Tavern. Unfortunately, by then the brothers were warped men, hostile and suspicious, trusting no one but each other. Colonel Alcott later described them as two men who could easily make newcomers feel ill at ease and unwelcome. As unsociable as they were, the Eddies rarely had a vacancy in their inn. They took in spiritualist boarders who flocked from all over America and Europe to take part in the seances that were held on every night but Sunday. The Eddies charged $10 per week for a room and board at the inn, which was high for the time, but not exorbitant. Overflow visitors found other lodging in Chittenden and neighboring homes, for though the Eddie house was large, it was unable to serve the huge number of visitors who gathered for the nightly seances. Colonel Alcott obtained a second-floor room and, like all of the visitors, was given the run of the house. Apparently, all but the most gullible guests used this freedom to search the premises, hoping or fearing to find theatrical props and assorted items that might aid in hoaxing those who came to see the seances. Where did the Eddies hide the mirrors, wires, and sheets? Where were the costumes they used in the hoax? Alcott prowled the house from cellar to attic, but was unsuccessful in finding anything to show the events were a fraud. On Alcott's first day at the farm, he was witness to an outdoor seance. In the bright moonlight of a warm summer evening, 
a group of ten participants traveled down a path and into a deep ravine. They assembled in front of a natural cave, formed by two large stones that had collapsed atop one another, forming a large arch. Alcott later learned that it was called Honto's Cave, in honor of the Native American spirit who often appeared there. Alcott suspiciously investigated the cave, but no exit could be found at the back of the rocks. He determined there was no way that anyone could slip in or out of the cave without being seen. Horatio Eddy acted as the medium for the seance. He sat on a camp stool under the arch and then was draped in a makeshift spirit cabinet formed by shawls and branches that had been cut from small saplings. As Horatio rested there, a gigantic man dressed as a Native American emerged from the darkness of the cave. While the medium addressed this spirit, someone cried out and pointed up toward the top of the cave. Standing there, silhouetted against the moon, was another gigantic Indian. To the right, a spectral female had materialized on a ledge. In all, ten such figures appeared during the seance. The last, the spirit of William White, the late editor of a spiritualist newspaper, emerged from within Horatio's cabinet. He was dressed in a black suit and white shirt and was supposedly recognizable to some who had read the newspaper and recognized him from his picture. He vanished at the same time the others did. Moments later, Horatio appeared from the cabinet and signaled that the seance was at an end. After the bizarre display was over, Alcott and Caps carefully searched the cave and the surrounding area for footprints in the soft earth. They found no trace that anyone had been there. Alcott found the seance to be convincing, but was sure that he'd be able to more easily detect fraud within the controlled setting of the Eddy house. He and Caps thoroughly examined the large circle room which was located on the second floor of the farmhouse. He drew maps, charts, and diagrams and took numerous measurements, sure that he would find false panels, secret doors, or hidden passages. However, he found nothing out of the ordinary. He was determined not to give up, though, and he convinced the newspaper to hire men to come to Chittenden and examine the place. Using carpenters and engineers as consultants, another thorough search was conducted. The experts also found nothing out of the ordinary. After this, Alcott and Caps were finally convinced that the walls and floors were as solid as they seemed. Because of this, what Alcott witnessed during the nights that followed became even stranger. Each seance was basically the same. Six nights a week, visitors would assemble on rough wooden benches in the seance room. A platform was lit only by a kerosene lamp, recessed in a barrel. William Eddy, who acted as the primary medium, mounted the platform and entered a small cabinet. A few moments later, soft voices began to whisper in the distance. Often there would be singing, accompanied by spectral music. Musical instruments came to life and soared above the heads of the audience members, disembodied hands appeared, waving and touching the spectators, and odd lights and unexplained noises appeared and filled the air. Then the first spirit form emerged from the cabinet. They came one at a time, or in groups, numbering as many as twenty or thirty in an evening. Some were completely visible and seemed solid. Others were transparent and ethereal. Regardless, they awed the frightened spectators. The spirits ranged in size from over six feet to small – it's worth noting here that William Eddy was only five feet nine inches tall – most of the ghostly apparitions were elderly Yankees or Native Americans, but many other races and nationalities also appeared in costume, like Africans, Russians, Asians, and more. Where had they come from, Alcott wondered. He'd examined the spirit cabinet and platform and had found no trap doors, nor hidden passages. In fact, there was no room in the cabinet for anyone other than the medium himself. Alcott had studied the workings of stage magicians and fraudulent mediums, but could find none of their tricks present at the Eddy House. The apparitions not only appeared, but they also performed, sang, and chatted with the sitters. They produced spirit articles like musical instruments, clothing, and scarves. 
In all, nearly every type of supernatural phenomena was reported at the Eddy farmhouse. These included rappings, moving physical objects, spirit paintings, automatic writing, prophecy, speaking in tongues, healings, unseen voices, levitation, remote visions, teleportation, and more. And of course, the full-bodied manifestations of which Alcott observed more than 400 during the weeks he visited the house. He concluded that a show like that, which he had seen, would have required an entire company of actors and several trunks of costumes. Yet, Alcott's inspection of the premises revealed no place to hide either actors or props. The idea of stage actors was further dispelled by the convincing manner of the spirits. One woman spoke in Russian to the alleged spirit of her deceased husband. A number of other dialects were also heard. How was this possible when the Eddies could barely read and write and were scarcely capable of speaking coherent English? In addition, such an elaborate show would have cost a fortune to produce each night. They would have had to pay the actors, invest in costumes, and hire someone to create the marvels of the spirits. This would have been impossible given that the brothers were almost penniless. Most of the visitors who came to the farm did not pay, and the rooms only gained them $10 per week for room and board. No admission was ever charged for the seances. In Olcott's mind, fraud would have been physically and financially impossible. The investigator's ten-week stay on the Eddy farm was surely a test of endurance. He left disliking the house, the food, the weather, and the Eddy brothers themselves. However, he was convinced of the fact that the two men could make contact with the dead. The farm attracted many international visitors, but none of them was as flamboyant as Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, who arrived during the time of Colonel Olcott's investigation. Madame Blavatsky had not reached the height of her fame at this point, but she already commanded great respect in occult circles. She was a theatrical woman with a powerful personality and a flair for the dramatic, and she made an impression at the rural farm by smoking cigars and appearing in a variety of veils and flowing dresses. Many of the visitors in 1874 were already aware of Madame Blavatsky. She had been born in Russia in 1831 to German parents with excellent social credentials. She married young but later abandoned her husband to explore both the physical and spiritual worlds. She visited an odd assortment of places, such as Canada, Mexico, Texas, and India, and made a first attempt to enter the forbidden country of Tibet. A short time later, she vanished. For a decade between 1848 and 1858, Madame Blavatsky was not heard from, and she would often refer to this time as her veiled years. Her cloudy allusions to this time period were always vague and always intriguing. She may not have spent seven years at a mountain retreat in Tibet, but she truly did learn much of the Indian mysticism and acquired more than a dabbler's knowledge of the Jewish Kabbalah. From this learning, she would later piece together the novel religion of Theosophy, a curious mixture of many faiths and philosophies. Madame Blavatsky returned home to Russia in 1858 and began offering performances of spiritualism, mixed with overtones of the mystical East. She came to America and soon established herself as one of the best-known practicing mediums and occult teachers in the country. This is the reason why she made such a dramatic appearance when she came to Chittenden in 1874. She not only attended seances at the farm, but also volunteered to play appropriate music on the pedal organ that the brothers had recently acquired for the seance room. The Eddies were quick to latch on to her services. Everyone expected something marvelous to happen, and they were not disappointed. The group gathered that night in the seance room as Madame Blavatsky played the organ. William sat entranced in his cabinet as suddenly the curtains swept aside and a curious figure walked out. He was a tall, swarthy man who was costumed in velvet, decorated with gold braid, bedecked with tassels and wearing high leather boots. The man bowed, made gracious gestures of welcome, and then walked toward the observers with his hand pressed to his heart in greeting. Then, apparently from nowhere, 
a lance appeared in his empty hand. It was nearly ten feet long and decorated with what were said to be ostrich plumes. The man stomped across the platform, returned to its center, gave a military salute, and then began to melt in some sort of mist. The mist, or smoke, apparently emanated from the man's body and he gradually blended into the cloud and then disappeared. The crowd roared with both bewilderment and approval, but Madame Blavatsky regarded it all with equanimity. She was, after all, accustomed to oddities and was somewhat of a puzzle herself. Madame Blavatsky did not remain in Chittenden for long. In three years, she was to publish her acclaimed Isis Unveiled, the classic textbook of theosophy that would attract more than 100,000 followers around the world. Always drawn to India, she went to Madras in 1879, where she established the world headquarters of the Theosophical Society. She performed so many alleged miracles in India that an investigation was warranted by the Society for Psychical Research in 1884. The miracles collapsed under scrutiny, but her disciples rationalized that a few outward, even though questionable wonders, are necessary to draw the masses to the true inner faith. We'll wrap up our story about the Eddie brothers when Weird Darkness returns. My doc agrees that I need to lose a few pounds. I knew that going in, but he also told me that the meds I'm taking for my type 2 diabetes aren't going to do me much good if I finish each meal with ice cream or cheesecake. I kind of knew that in advance, too. But cutting back on carbs and sugars is, is a lot easier said than done. I've tried a lot of protein bars while on the road, but I swear it's like eating non-sweetened, chocolate-dusted particle board. But now I travel with Built Bars. Built Bars taste like candy bars. In fact, I'm now using them for my dessert. And at about 150 calories per bar, less than 3 grams of sugar, up to 19 grams of protein, I can satisfy my sweet cravings guilt-free. Visit WeirdDarkness.com built and try a box. You can go for a variety pack of several flavors to try or pick and choose to build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com built. The name of James Watt is invariably associated with the invention of the steam engine and with little else. It is not generally known that he was also responsible for numerous other less important but still useful contrivances. Nor do many realize that one of his major discoveries belongs, because of its curious origin, in the chronicles of the strange and the incredible. Within a few years after it was first conceived, James Watt's steam engine was a commercial success and in the year 1783, its inventor was enjoying both the income and the prestige to which his great scientific contribution entitled him. It came, therefore, as something of a surprise to Dr. McCregor, the pastor of the local church, when Watt appeared at his door early one summer morning, clad in a workman's overall. I'd like to climb the church steeple. The church steeple? What for, Mr. Watt? It's an experiment I want to try. A crazy idea I got in my brain, and I can get to do and I came by it in a crazy way. What way was that? I cannot tell you no for fear you'd laugh. But if you let me claim, Doctor, and if the experiment works, why then I'll tell you the queerest story you ever heard. A few moments later, the inventor appeared carrying a large kettle in his hand. Perched precariously at the very top of the steeple, he raised the kettle and, with a sudden gesture, overturned it. Unable to restrain himself longer, Dr. McCregor ran down the porch steps and raced toward the church. But even before he arrived there... James Watt had descended from the steeple. The pastor found the famous man knee-deep in the waters of the moat, shouting excitedly. It worked! Dr. McGregor, it worked! I stumbled on a new scheme for making ammunition. You drop molten lead and it turns into gunshot. Yes, Dr. McGregor's church steeple proved to be the first shot tower ever used. More than a century thereafter, leaden shot was the chief ammunition employed in the wars of Europe. And even today... Similar shot towers are still in operation. But it is doubtful whether even their owners know the story that James Watt told Dr. McCregor that same morning. 
the strange story of what had led him to his experiment. But I do not see, Mr. Watt, how you knew the lead would disintegrate when you dropped it. I came by the idea in a queer sort of way. It was in a dream. A dream? Aye, a dream that kept coming back to me next after next after next. I'd be standing in an open field, and all of a sudden, the clouds would burst and the rain would start beating down around me. Then I'd hold out my hand to feel the drops, and it'd be hard on my hand, like little balls of metal. And I'd say to myself, Well, man, it is rain and little raindrops, and that's a queer thing indeed. And then I'd wake, and the remembering of those drops wouldn't let me sleep again. And so at last I said to myself, could it be that fallen lead disintegrates, as you call it, and forms the shape of gunshot? And so I decided to find out, and I did, and that's all there is to it. It is a strange thing, I know. How would you explain it? But neither the man of God nor any other man since has been able to explain James Watt's strange dream. Had he unconsciously grasped the principle of his remarkable discovery and then projected it in the form of a ring symbol... Or was the dream what he himself intimated it was? A miracle. A miracle incredible but true. This is your host to welcome you once again into the inner sanctum. Come on in, and never mind looking back over your shoulder. Whatever it is that's behind you can't be half as bad as what's in the front. <laughs> as the man whose throat had just been made the scene of an experiment with a razor while he slept says, I'm going from bed to hers. <laughs> All right. Settle down now. It's coming. And there's nothing you can do about it. Just keep a good hold on yourself. And your wife, if your life insurance paid off. <laughs> Joe Harris. 21, wearing a cheap blue, blue serge suit and a thin top coat. Cold and wet. On a cold and rainy night. Just like a change. Kansas City's okay, but there's nothing there for me. I gotta get out. My wardrobe ain't built for a hard winter, so... I figure it could be more comfortable on the coast, California. But I ain't paying for rail transportation this year, so I head for the KC Freight Yards. And I... Pick me out a nice long freight job that happens to have an empty car. And pull the sliding door over. Leaving just a crack for air and finger hole for when we reach the land of oranges. The old boiler up front's got the steam up. And we're off. Ah, I relax. All I gotta do is let a couple of days slide by and... <laughs> Sunshine. Hey. What? I... I didn't notice nobody else was in the car. Didn't you now, Pally? No. Hey. He leaned back into the darkness of his corner so I couldn't see him very good. He was a young guy, maybe my age, maybe a couple of years older. My size, too. Same color hair and eyes. Almost close enough to be brothers, but there was something in his eyes that had never been in mine. I was scared. You know something funny? You look like me. Yeah, I kind of noticed that myself in a... Why? Well, lots of guys look a little like each other. No. I mean... Huh? Nobody looks like me. Well, okay, so I don't. You're trying to. That, that means you must be one of... One of what? 
They have ways of changing their appearance. You're one of them, you hey, look, You're talking, you're talking about. It's no use. You can't fool me. I'll have to punish you. Hey, watch out with that knife. I'm going to cut the resemblance away and find out what you really look like. You're crazy. Stop it. Let go of my hand. I've got to cut you away. No. I cut your arm. Twist it. And the knife is pointing at your heart. Now drop it. No, or... nobody's as strong as me. I'll stop it. I warn you, stop it. Oh. Then I gotta do this. No. I, I told you. I told you. I, I told you. Dead. Hey. No, he's dead. I gotta get out. The door. Slide it open. The odd bones. Ah, I don't know how they slide into us. Why don't they slab them proper? Give me a hand, Charlie. Okay. You locked it. Now I can't get out. I can't get out. There I was, locked in with him, in the dark. He was dead, so I wasn't afraid of him at first. I I even gave him a going over. His eyes were open, but I, I flopped him over, went through his pockets. Just a couple of bucks and some small change and his draft card. Huh, funny, he was 4F, just like me. His name was Martin Pell. That's a laugh, too. Finding out who a guy is after you kill him. Kill him? Yeah. I was a murderer. I just realized it. They'll hang me for that. No. No, it was self-defense, but... But what chance have I got to prove that? Me with a record, too. But... Maybe I can lose that record. Maybe. Yeah. So I switched draft cards with him. And now he's Joe Harris. And I'm Martin Pell. Martin Pell of, that says on his card, of Wisey, Oklahoma. And the hours go by... And I'm there with him locked in a boxcar. And the wheels keep pounding underneath. And he's dead. I... I gotta get out. There's gotta be a way. The door. Shut. I... I gotta think. Think. Hey, wait. We're stopping. Now what? We're stopping. Yeah, he's covered up. Maybe they won't spot him. Anyways, I gotta get out. I'll yell. I'll yell and I'll pound on the door. Yeah, that's the way. That's the way. Help! Help! Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! Somebody hear me! Somebody! Andy! They heard me! What's going on? Uh-uh. Catching a ride, bum? Get out of here. Yeah, sure. Sure. Don't you know it's against the law riding a freight? Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, maybe it's a hump you remember. No. Now get out of here. Get fast. Fast as I could, I got away from there. The yard bull took a quick look into the car, but he didn't spot the body under the second. And the train started up. And it began moving away. With Martin Pell lying under a pile of dirty sacking. With a knife in his heart. And a funny look in his eyes. Only, I'm Martin Pell. There was only a watering stop where the train stopped, so I walked across the prairie. Not knowing where I was going and not caring much. Well, I... I keep walking across the dark face of the land until I spot a light. 
a couple of lights. A small town, it looked like. A small town. Somewhere. Where? Right on the edge of town, there's a lunch wagon, and it's open. And there's a light shining on it, and I'm hungry, so I go into the lunch wagon. Hi. Uh, how about something to eat, huh? Sure thing, Martin. Sure thing. What? What did you say? I said, sure, you can have something to eat, Martin. What'd it be? Martin? What? What town is this? Why, you ought to know, Martin. This is Wisey. Wisey, Oklahoma. Wisey? But but that's the same place he... It can't be. Oh, that's no way to talk about your own hometown. Of course, you've been away quite a few years. You look good now. Well, wouldn't you say I, I've changed? Oh, no, Morden's not true. Of course, you're only around 16 when you left. <laughs> kind of an advanced 16, though. Yeah. Hey, many kids that age would have stuck up the bank, knocked off the night watchman. Watchman, I, I kill him. Oh, don't get modest, fella. Sure, old man Henshaw. Hey, hey, I was near forgetting. You said you're hungry. Not anymore. Oh, come on, have something to eat. But don't you believe in putting anything in your stomach before doing a job? Doing a job? Me? Why do you think I said? Why should I promise you a grand? I don't remember. Oh, for Pete's sake, Martin. How many men do you kill that you don't remember a job like this? Never mind the act. Play it straight, huh? Okay, okay. Don't get nasty. It's uh, too late to talk business anyway. Come on, I got a room fixed up way in back. Get a good night's sleep. We'll talk in the morning. About an old man that's lived way past his time, hmm? About how you, uh... I'm going to take care of that. Martin, I sent for you because I need money. I ain't got any. My uncle has. Old man Carew. I'll get it from him. When he dies, I will. So? So I want him to die. Oh. I got a grand in cash. That's yours. For what? For my uncle dying a little earlier than expecting. No dice. No dice. Martin, you take care of old man Carew, so help me. I'll turn you in on that bank, John. Go ahead. Turn me in. I can prove that I... And then I shut up quick. Blitz was watching me with those little pig eyes in his fat face. Sure, I could prove I wasn't Martin Pell, that I'd never been in Wisey, Oklahoma. Life. Sure. But to do that, I'd have to admit I was Joe Harris. And when they found that corpse in the boxcar with my draft card on him, that'd be fine. A lot of attention the jury had paid to my plea of self-defense. No witnesses and me on the lam and me switching draft cards in panic. Sure, even the hangman had burst out laughing when he slipped the noose around my neck. I shut up quick. Bliss watching me close. And then I said, Okay, Bliss. It's a deal. What's the layout? I'll pull in here. Trees will cover the car in case anybody happens to be out late on the highway. Can't be too careful. Ain't that so, Martin? That's so. It's only a short walk. Let's get going. Oh, uh, yeah. You better take this. What? Oh. A tire iron. I picked it up in a junkyard. They never trace it to me. It's for old man Crew. <laughs> they bother you? I ain't used to them. Any more, huh? <laughs> the house. Old man Crew never believed in buying curtains for the windows. There he is. Rocking in his chair. I watch the porch step. It's busted. I guess we knock. It's polite. Yeah. What's it now? Uncle Carew. It's me. Yeah. What you want? Just to come in. I brought a visitor. An old friend of yours. Yeah. Yeah. That's 
set where you like. Set in my rocker. Yeah, nobody sets in it but me. Now, well, who's the man with you? Don't you recognize him? Yeah. Looks like Pell, boy. That's who it is. Martin Pell. Yeah, that was any good. Like you, Bliss. All right, you visited. Going home now. Kind of cold out. Give us a chance to warm up, huh? Yeah, I don't care what you do. Yeah, I don't care what you do. Just dosing off a bit. Go on, Martin. What? You ain't looking this way. Now's the time. I... I ain't gonna... He's an old man. Man. What do you... Give it to me. Uh, all right, here. Yeah. Uncle... Uncle. Yeah. Uh, that'll be that, huh? Pockets. Yeah. Uncle was carrying quite a bit of dough on him. Martin. Here. Huh? Here, take the money. It's very important. Oh, I'll put it in your pocket myself. That's very important. When they find you here and knocked out, tripping over that busted porch step, they'll know why you killed old man Carew. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Sure, and knowing you're a reckon Martin, they'll never look for anybody else. Now, when they find you on the premises with the old man's ducket and your fingerprints on the tie No! After right. <laughs> I was walking up a long flight of stairs with nothing nothing at the top but more stairs and more stairs and my head was hurting. And then I woke up. Woke up lying outside of old man Carew's house with a blood-stained tire iron in my hand. I pulled myself to my feet and then... I heard cars. They were coming. And there I still was. I had to get away fast. I, I didn't know the country, but I was hunted. And the hunted animals got an instinct to hide, to run, and to hide from the killers. They didn't find me that day because I fooled them. I didn't try getting out of the county, the town. Oh, no. That's where they were watching for me. So I stayed put close to town, which fooled him. And also, I had a job to do. Who is it? Martin. Me. What? What are you doing here? I got paid for a killing I didn't do. So I figured maybe I better do a killing now for no pay at all. Stay where you are. No, we're alone here. Uh-uh. I got this knife. No, no. Bliss, you got a pencil? A pencil? Yeah, sure. Then sit down and write a little note about how you killed old man Carew. No. no. I got the knife against your heart. No. Sit down and write. What? All right. All right. Well, Just write. I killed. I killed my uncle because I wanted his money. You got it? Good. I... Got it. Now sign your name pretty. I... Oh, I signed it. Take that knife away. Sure. After I... <laughs> yeah. Goodbye, Mr. Bliss. Oh, I'd better put the knife in your hand like this. Too bad your nerves went back on you. You committed suicide, Mr. Bliss. That's what you did. And now they'll stop looking for me. I hold in and waited until they found Bliss. So the law was called off. There was nobody to look for. So I headed for the water and stop and the freights because it was cold. And I was heading for sunshine. 
There was a train getting ready to head for the coast, so I sneaked close to it. On the far side, there was a couple of bulls around chewing the rag, but they didn't... I spotted an open box car and I climbed in. I got away. The bulls were coming along checking. One of them sounded like the guy that had thrown me off the night before. Ah, this time I didn't care. I was hoping he'd lock the door on me. So I curled up in a corner and waited. Yeah, Mike, that was quite a wreck they had up ahead. Quite a wreck. Held up the line for 24 hours. The freight here had already pulled out when word came into the wreck up ahead, so they backed her right back here and let her stand. All right, she's on her way now. Uh-uh. One of them sliding doors is open. Give me a hand with it. Hey, wait, wait, wait. If this is the same train, same train... It can't be. This car. It's train. This sack of wood be over there. Let me see. The sack. Yeah, it's the sack. And under it. I gotta see. Yeah. It's him. Martin Fell. <laughs> And I'm locked in with him. <laughs> Me and Martin. The killers. <laughs> we... <laughs> We're going to the sunshine together. <laughs> and that's how the cops will find us. Together. <laughs> him dead. And me. And me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well. Alas for poor Joe, who couldn't keep out of boxcars. He he was a nice boy, but he couldn't stay put. I guess they'll give him the order of the Rolling Stone. Tombstone. Hmm? And believe you, when I hear a freight train whistling, whistling in the night, think of Joe and wonder, is he still in it with Martin rattling? Well, friends, it's time once again to close that creaking door. Until next week at the same time, when we'll be back with a little hunk of horror. <laughs> You'll be sure to listen, won't you? Until next week, then. Good night. Pleasant dreams. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Let's finish up our story about the strange mystery of the Eddy Brothers. The Eddy's most famous guest left, and Colonel Alcott departed as well. Not only did he chronicle his visit in the newspaper, he also wrote a massive book called People from Other Worlds. The book, more than 500 pages long, is full of precise drawings of the apparitions, the grounds, the house, and even detailed plans of its construction, proving that no hidden passages existed. 
He also recorded over 400 different supernatural beings and collected hundreds of affidavits and scores of eyewitness testimony to the amazing events. He reproduced dozens of statements from respected tradesmen and carpenters who had examined the house for trickery. A modern reader would have to look really hard to discover anything that Alcott did not investigate. His extensive documentation, along with his investigative skills, suggests that the events were not part of a hoax. Alcott remained skeptical and analytical throughout his ten-week stay at the farm, and yet he came away convinced that the Eddies had the power to contact and communicate with the dead. In short, Colonel Alcott came away from Chittenden a believer. He was so convinced that not only did he write his book, but he also helped Madame Blavatsky found the Theosophical Society. The once skeptical military investigator was convinced that the dead could and did communicate with the living. Eventually, the Eddy brothers and their sister Mary went their separate ways. Bickering and feuding had driven them apart. They began turning away the spiritualist boarders and, except for a rare seance, lived off the farm and their savings. The glen at Honto's cave became overgrown, and the unhappy Eddies were more or less ignored by their neighbors. Horatio moved out and took a house across the road, where he took up light gardening, occasional seances, and doing magic tricks for local children. Mary moved to the nearby village of East Pittsford, where she became a full-time professional medium. William dropped out of public life altogether and became a bitter recluse at the family farm. The first of the Eddies to die was Horatio on September 8, 1922. William lived for another ten years. He never married and refused to ever participate in spiritualism again. He died on October 25, 1932, at the age of 99. If either of the men had any secrets about the weird events at their home, they took them to their grave. So what really happened on the Eddy farm? In 1969, writer John Mason reported that almost no one living in the area of Chittenden was familiar with the Eddy brothers' strange story. A few local residents recalled stories told by their parents that led them to believe the whole thing had been a hoax, a fraud. And perhaps they were right, for just about everything about the story of the Eddy brothers seems to be worthy of serious questions. Too many of the events and details are reminiscent of well-known deceptions and the work of tricksters, who, unlike the Eddie brothers, were unmasked as frauds. But if the Eddie brothers were fakes, how did they do what they did? There were no uses of clever light projection or mirrors, smoke machines, or easily detectable wires. No matter which way we turn, we are confronted with the choice between the impossible and the preposterous. Whatever you choose to believe, it can't be denied that something amazing and mysterious occurred on the farm of the Eddy brothers, although what this may have been, we may never know for sure. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. 
WeirdDarkness.com slash Incognate. Every door has a key. There's a key to every situation. Behind every unopened door, there is a mystery. And the opening of this door introduces us to another in the series, the key. Oh, good morning, sir. Uh, Fifty dollars, sir. You want to cash this check, sir? Sure. I'm sorry, I, I don't recognize the signature. Uh, are you a customer of this branch of the bank? As of now, I am. Oh, if it's a new account, I'm afraid just I'll have to... Just do nothing. Check. Just keep quiet and keep smiling. What? Under this coat over my arm is a gun, pal. And the same right at your heart. Now keep calm and push your door over here. And smile, act normal. One step out of line, you're it. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, here. Not that, the big stuff. No. That's better. That don't look so sick. Nothing's going to happen to you. If you just be a good boy, you... You can't get away with this. Come on, come on. I don't have all day. Why are you stupid? I didn't do anything. I, I warned you, you come. <laughs> hey! Hey, you stop! Please, help! Miss Perino, you say you didn't see the man's face at all. No, no, he had his arm up around his face. I, I couldn't see anything but his eyes. He was holding his overcoat over the arm. Would you be able to identify him if you saw him again? No, 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 I wouldn't. I see. Miss Perino, the bank accountant who ran out of his office when he heard the shots, has told us that the gunman did not put his arm up over his face until he'd come face to face with you. Well, he's mistaken. The man's face was covered. Look, Miss Perino, there's nothing to be afraid of. We have reason to believe that there were two people who saw the face of the hold-up man. One was the teller who handed the money to him and then pressed the alarm button. That man, the teller, was shot down in cold blood by the gunman and he's dead. The other person we believe capable of identifying the killer is you. And I shouldn't have to remind you that if you cannot help us, the killer may never be brought to justice. It's therefore your duty to do everything you can to help us. I'm sorry. I, I told you all I know. Think, Miss Perino. You must have caught a glimpse of his face. No, no, I Miss didn't. Miss Perino, you are not telling the truth. Captain, please. Angela cannot help you. You're making her scared. Angela's a good girl. She would help you if she could. Wouldn't you, Angie? Hmm? Oh, please. I don't know anymore. Let me go home. Oh, okay. You can go home. Please. Me too, Captain. I'm our uncle. She lives with us. Mama will be worried about this. Okay, okay. Get out of here, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, Angie. Don't cry. We go home now. I'm all right. Oh, Miss Perino, if you happen to remember that you can identify the killer, you know where to find me. Uh, sure, Captain. We know. Sure. Well, what do you think? <laughs> sure seemed upset about it. Like maybe she recognized the hood but wasn't telling. Yeah. Yeah, but Why? Look, the type to be on speaking terms with a killer. Tell you what, Al, get me a rundown on her. Family, background, acquaintances, a lot. Will do. What about the old guy? You said he's her uncle. Yeah, him too. The girl lives with him and his wife. Yeah, what's the name again? Oh, it's here someplace. Um, yeah, uh, Vitelli. Giuseppe Vitelli. Vitelli? Yeah, funny thing. Hmm? The name rings a bell. So? Mm, no, can't get a fix on it. Oh, there must be dozens of Vitellis in town. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get checking on this one. Let's hope you come up with something. It'll be about the only lead we have. I tell you, Mama, it was the most terrible thing. The poor little Angela, she nearly bumped into him. 
I was writing my check at the table, and I did not see it. You know I do not see too good, and I must write slow. I keep telling you, Papa, you should see the eye doctor. Ah, I tell you, I am glad I did not see good today. I look up when I hear the gun go off, but all I can see is this man with his back to me. He has a hat on, and all I can see is the back of him. He turns to run, and Angela is just going up to the counter, and she is right there in front of him. And she screams when she sees him, but... He puts his arm up over his face so she cannot see it. And she said he had his arm over his face all the time. Yeah, she's a good girl, Mama. The police captain, he was very angry with her. But she's a good girl. She would help him if she could. Of course she would help the police if she could. She's good, that one. She has been like a daughter to us all these years. Yes, yes, like a daughter. It was terrible that Mario and Francesca should both die so young. But their going brought little Angela to us, Mama. She's such a good girl. I hope she will rest. I gave her one of my pills. The ones the doctor gave me for sleeping. Yeah, she will feel better in the morning. You know, Mama, there is only one thing. Yes, yes, you are always saying. And why not? Why should I not want to see our little girl married to some nice boy? When she is ready, she will marry. Yeah, that DeMarco boy, he's a good one. And I think Angela likes him. She likes him, and he is a good boy. He is a good worker, and he will do well. But Angela always waits for Nicola. You know that, Papa. I know it, but I do not like it. You do not like that Angie should marry your own son? What are you saying? It is not that. But Nicky is not here. He has been gone two years. He will go and make a lot of money, he says. But how, Nicolo, I say, How? Never mind, Papa, he say. I will come back with a pocket full of gold, you see. Yeah, maybe, but he is still not a here. He is a good boy. Smart, too. He will do well. I think Angela should marry the Damarco boy. He's a good worker. And Angela is very fond of him. And he is here. But she's in love with Aniki. Now, come to bed, Papa. It is very late. Come to bed. Angela, are you awake? What? Oh, who's there? Angie, it's me, Nikki. Nikki, what are you? Shh, quiet. You wake Mama and Papa. Nikki, you shouldn't be here. No. The fire escape. I'm glad you don't lock your window. Well, aren't you pleased to see me? It's been a long time, Angie. Has it? You've been gone two years. Honey, I could have sworn I saw you in the bank only this morning. But you didn't, Angie. You didn't swear you saw me. You didn't tell the cops. No. No, I didn't tell anyone. Why didn't you? Oh, Nikki, you've got to get out of here. They'll be looking for you. No, they won't. Because only you can identify me. And you told them you couldn't see my face. I read it in the afternoon papers. Oh, Nikki, how could you? You of all people, you, you shot that man. I had there. to see you. I had to tell you about that. I, I couldn't bear the thought of you... That I might change my mind and tell the police? That you might hate me. I'm in love with you, Angie. I always have been. Oh, how can you talk about love, Nicky? A man's dead. You killed him. I couldn't help it. It was an accident. He, he tried to grab me through the grill. The gun I had was an automatic. It goes off very easy. I never meant to use it on him or anybody. I swear I didn't. But how can I believe that? You ran. I panicked, that's all. I was scared, but when I cooled off, I realized there was only one thing to do. Come back and give myself up. You've been to the police? Not yet. But I'm going to see them. I had to see you first. Oh, I don't know what to think. It's all so... Oh, Nicky, I've hoped and prayed you'd come back someday, but not like this. How could you try to rob a bank? Papa's always talking about the time you said you'd come back with a bucket full of gold. Was that the gold you meant? I got 10,000 bucks out of that bank. Where is it? Safe. Nicky, you can't use a penny of that money. No, no, of course not. I'll hand it over to the police when I give myself up. Oh, Angie, I've been a fool, such a fool. Oh, this is a terrible mess. That poor guy's dead. I never meant him any harm. I never meant to harm anybody. It was just that everything I'd planned hadn't worked out. I've had a run of out since I left home. I felt I couldn't come back empty-handed. I was just going to do this one job. It was wrong, Nicky, terribly wrong. It was wrong for you not to tell the cops about me, but you did it. You kept quiet. Yes, I... I know that was wrong, too. 
Now I'm glad you've come. You see, you must give yourself up. Otherwise, I'd have to tell them. Nicky. Yeah, now, take it easy, honey. Everything's going to be all right. I made a bad mistake. I guess I've made plenty. Leaving you in the first place was bad enough. Anyway, now I'm going to take my punishment. Maybe if I give myself up and they realize I didn't mean to kill anybody, I'll get out with a year or two in prison. When I come out, maybe I can make a fresh start. Where is it? I can take it, honey. As long as I know I've got you. That's why I had to come here first. I had to know you loved me in spite of everything. I'd always wanted to come back and be your big hero. Yeah, yeah. The big hero you'd be proud to marry. Oh, Nicky, you know I've always been in love with you. I've waited long for the day you'd come back. Oh, honey, I love you so very much. Yeah. Better now? Oh, Nicky, I can't help it. I love you. If only we could... Say, why not? What, Nicky? Honey, maybe you think I'm crazy, but why not let's get married right away? Just as soon as I can get a license. Married? But Father Pacini, he wouldn't... Oh, no, no, the church wedding can wait. We can go through that later. With all the trimmings. I mean, just a civil marriage. Just let's make it legal and keep it to ourselves till it was all over. You mean not tell anyone? Yeah. Not even Mama and Papa. Not till afterwards. Oh, no, they'd be hurt. I, I couldn't do that to them. Nicky, they'd be like a mother and father to me. I could Darling, you make it sound like you don't really want to marry me. Oh, you know it's not that. Look, honey, I've got a pretty terrible time to go through. All that business of a trial and everything. I've got to know you're mine. I've got to have that to hold on to to keep me sane. You do love me, don't you? Tell me you do, honey. Oh, yes, Nicky. I love you so very, very much. Oh, Nicky, hold me. Hold me close. Take it easy, honey. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah. Everything's going to work out just swell. I tell you, Captain, that is all we know. She left a note, that is all. She has gone suddenly to visit her father's sister. Uh Uh-huh. Funny thing to just go off like that without saying goodbye. I keep telling you, she left this note. I do not understand all this, but she will be back in a couple of days, she says. She needs a rest, Captain. All this shooting business, it made her very upset. Yeah, I guess so. This relative of yours, Mrs. Vitelli, you let me have her address? Yes, I can, but why do you want it? Well, I may need to get in touch with Angela Perino quickly. I'd just like to know where I can contact her at short notice. I will write the address down for you. Wait, I'll get the pencil and paper. Please, Captain. Haven't you asked enough questions? Angela has told you all she knows. Has she? What about you, Mr. Vitelli? Me? I do not know anything. I told you I did not see the face of the man in the bank. I knew. You have a son, don't you, Mr. Vitelli? A son? Sure, I have a son. Niccolo. Everybody knows that. Has he been around lately? No, I... I have not seen him for a couple of years. Uh What's he doing these days? Doing? uh, I do not know what he is doing, but uh, whatever it is, he will be doing it well. He's a clever boy, Nicky. Uh Uh-huh. You haven't heard from him or of him for the last two years, huh? No. But... I don't understand all this. Well, why do you ask me questions about Nicky? You wouldn't know, I suppose, that he's uh, been in jail. In j- Did you say in jail? Our Nicky? Yeah. Not here, over the border. Broke into a drugstore, stole a few dollars and some goods. Nicky? Our Nicky? A burglar? A thief? Oh, no. Here you are, Captain. I have written down the address where Angeli is. Oh, thanks, Mrs. Vitelli. Well, I'll be going. Uh, oh, um, if you happen to hear from your son, Mr. Vitelli, I'd appreciate you letting me know. You do that? Yes. Yes, of course. I I let you know. Thanks. Well, what's he say about Nicky? 
Papa, what do you say about that boy? There must have been some mistake. Not a Nicky. He wouldn't do a thing like that. He's a good boy. Do a thing like what? Papa, what are you saying? What has Nicky done? The captain said Nicky is a thief. He has been in prison. What? Oh, no. Not our Nicky. Mama, mama. What have we done that such a thing should happen? I don't believe it. There is some mistake. Surely there is some mistake. Hello? Giuseppe Fitelli speaking. Angela, where are you? What he... But, but... Angie, it can't be. Angela, wait. Hello, hello, hello. She hung up. It was Angie? Yes. Mama and I don't know what to think. She said she would explain it all tonight. They are coming here tonight. They? Angela and Nikki. Nikki? Mama, Mama, what to think? What to think? Angela and Nikki are married. Well, Mama, don't you have a big kiss for your little boy? Especially now he's got himself married. Nikki, it is all so. Oh, of course, my son. <laughs> there. And Angela, a little girl. Oh, Mama, <laughs> we wanted to tell you, but... Well, we just felt it was best to get married right away. But where did you get married so quickly? I don't think Father Pacini would like this. Oh, we're going to see Father Pacini later. We'll have a church ceremony, of course. But how... You, you, you have not been married in church? It wasn't time, Mama. The justice of the peace married us. The justice of the peace? It's legal. Legal? Who cares for legal? You marry in the church, no other place. Mama is right, Nikki. This is not a good thing you do. I tell you, you worry us, my son. We hear things we do not like about you, and now you do this thing. And Angela, we had wanted something better for you. Just a minute. What's this about things you hear? I was speaking, Niccolo. You have not kept your good manners since you go away. Manners? I'm supposed to worry about manners when you start accusing me of something I haven't done? I did not accuse you of anything, Nikki. But I am told you have been in prison. Nikki! That? It's nothing. Forget it. Nothing? Madonna, nothing that our son is called a thief? Nothing that he has been in prison? Oh, Niccolo. Two years ago, you left this house with my blessing, and you said you would return with your pockets full of money. You were going to be rich and successful. Rich and successful? Okay, how about this? Here, my valise. Take a look at it. Your valise? What is in it? Nicky, no. Papa, don't open it. What's the matter? Go ahead. Take a look at that pocket full of money I brought you. Okay. I'll open it for you. What is in it? I don't... What is it? Let me help. Nice. Ten thousand bucks. Ten thousand, do you hear? Well, is that a pocket full of money or isn't it? Nicky, you shouldn't have... Why not? It's mine. I got it. Yours? Nicky, you don't know what you're saying. You promised... That, that... was yesterday. Yesterday? Nicky, what are you saying? Niccolo, where did you get so much money? I picked it up. What's the difference? I got it. You did not get it by honest work. Not so much money. Tell them, Nicky. It's mine. And it's staying right here in this valise. So don't you or anybody get any different idea. Nicky, you, you can't do this. You promised you'd give yourself up. You must. There's no other way. That's what you think. What is going on? What is everybody talking about? I don't understand. I will go. Oh, good evening, Mr. Vitelli. Sorry to trouble you again, but the man I've had watching this place has reported that you have some interesting visitors. The police? Well, I, I don't know. It's, uh... If you don't mind, I'll just join you for a while. Good evening, Mrs. Vitelli. And I guess you're Nick Vitelli. That's a crime, is it? What do you want, copper? Well, Miss Perino, you get around. Or do you? Mrs. Vitelli gave us an address you were supposed to be visiting, but you haven't been there, have you? No, It's I... not Miss Perino anymore, Copper. It's Mrs. Vitelli. I object to you asking my wife a lot of personal questions. Your, your wife? Sure. We were married yesterday. Any objections? Plenty. Look here, Miss Perino, or Mrs. Vitelli, if that's what it is. There are a few things I want to talk over with you. 
I don't know if you realize... Maybe you don't realize, copper, that under the laws of this state, a wife cannot testify against a husband. That's something any cop should know, even one with flat feet like you. Listen, Vitelli, you're just... Testify? What is testify? Why does everybody talk the double talk? Nicky, you have done something? Uh, Something bad, huh? I'd say murder was pretty bad, wouldn't you, Mr. Vitelli? What? Murder! What are you saying? What I'm saying is that your son is a man who robbed the local bank and shot a man dead doing it. And I'm saying that your niece saw him in the bank and recognized him. Oh, no, no. Nicky. <laughs> Niccolo. My son. This is not true. See, it is not true. Say it. You do not say it. You do not. Shut up. Keep no. out of it. Too late. Too late. You. Cop. Get out of here. Get out of here. here. You got nothing on me and you know it. Just as you know, my wife can't testify against me in any court. Get your things, Angela. We're leaving. That's why you married me. So I couldn't identify you as a killer. You don't love me. You never have. Niccolo, I must have the truth. Did you do this terrible thing? Answer me. What do you think? Don't expect me to answer a lot of questions in front of a cop. Work it out for yourself. My son, a murderer. Now cut that out, my Nicola, you are a bad, wicked boy. A wicked, evil man. Murderer, murderer. My son, a murderer. Stop it. Stop it, I tell you. Stop it. Okay. Nicky. Mama. <sighs> you animal. You did your own mother. Your own mama who bore you, loved you, raised you from a child. You'd strike your own mama. I told her not to hit me. Nobody hits me, nobody. What a hero. What a big, wonderful guy. Proud of your husband, Angela? Mama, Mama, are you all right? (laughs) Never mind, then. Never mind. Okay, tough guy. What now? You may be running out of women, but the next move is up to you. No, Captain. The next move is up to me. I wish to go with you to the station house. I wish to make a statement. I wish to say that I was confused. I had a bad memory, but I'm all right. I remember seeing his face. The face of the killer. I remember. I saw him very clearly. No, Papa, no. Yes, I saw him. I saw him very clearly. He's standing there. The killer is my son. You're crazy. You were behind me when... Papa, Uh, please do not know. I saw him. He was there. He's the one with the gun. He he killed a man. He's a wicked man, but he would strike his own mother. A murderer. My son, I... I saw him do it with my own eyes. I will testify. I will testify. I will testify. Well, take it easy, Mr. Vitelli. Nicky, I guess we better take a little ride. I'm not going anywhere. Nobody move. Nicky, Don't I... be a fool, Nick. Put that gun away. I'm no fool. Don't worry about that. My own father. Perjuring himself to send me to the death cell. That's just great. I'm supposed to be proud of my parents, huh? They sure are fond of me. I can see that. Well, anybody make some move. Grab him, Joe. Oh, ah! Nicky! Nicky! Oh, my boy. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to do that. He might have... (laughs) Mr. Vitelli, Angela... Well, it had to be one way or another. This was the only end of the road for Nicky. Maybe uh, this way was was better than the other. I could not have done it. I could not have testified. (laughs) I, uh... I'll go call an ambulance. Closing door finishes the story. Next week, another key will open another door to another story. Mystery. Romance. Or adventure. All start when a door is unlocked by... The key.
first letter seemed harmless enough, possibly even just the result of a mistaken delivery. The second one drew concern, and paired with the unexplained visions of something darkly unsettling, Sam Morris finally caves. The everyman safe world he lives in is about to take a drastic and dark turn. He quickly falls into a world of insanity, the morbid and the macabre. He's drawn into a darkness that is just as deadly as it is mysterious. A darkness that dwells in a house that could only be conjured up by a mad brain. It is a house that calls you, a house that haunts you with its ghosts. They'll scratch and claw through your fragile hide, bringing madness bubbling to the surface. Come see the ghosts for yourself, if you dare. Weird Darkness Publishing presents Of a Mad Brain by Scott Donnelly. Now available on paperback, ebook, and audiobook versions through Amazon and WeirdDarkness.com. On June 8, 1908, an unmarried immigrant nurse named Sarah Coton finally had enough. After she lured the doctor that she worked for to an abandoned house, she shot and killed him. Never once did she believe that her actions were wrong. In the investigation that followed, it was discovered that her boss, Dr. Martin Nospitz, had raped her at work and she had become pregnant. When the police and courts refused to help her, she took matters into her own hands and carried out a sentence of death. Sarah's story became a national sensation. The press portrayed her as a powerless woman who had no other choice than to shoot her attacker. But Sarah saw things differently. She was an avenger who killed her attacker before he could hurt other women. When I thought of my broken life and the lives he might break, well, I felt it was my duty to kill him, she told a reporter but Sarah was soon on trial for her life. What would the courts decide? In 1907, Sarah Coton was working at a sanitarium in New York City. Like many staff members of the day, she also lived at the hospital. She was training to be a nurse under Dr. Martin Nospitz. He was bullying, aggressive, and threatening to her, but Sarah was determined to stick it out. Dr. Nospitz promised her that she would become a trained nurse if she stayed in his employ. I was frightened and did not want to stay, she later explained, but the doctor wanted me to stay. One morning, Ospitz broke into Sarah's room. He chloroformed her, and while she was unconscious, he raped her. The rape resulted in a pregnancy. When he found out that Sarah was pregnant, the doctor pressured her to have an abortion. Sarah refused and quit her job but struggled to find new work. She had immigrated from Russia in 1902, and now she was an unmarried pregnant woman with no means to support herself. In 1908, she took Ospitz to court. She brought a suit charging him with rape and demanding financial support for the unborn child. Ospitz denied the accusation and used his brother and brother-in-law to attack Sarah's reputation. They claimed she had a poor character, implying that she had seduced Ospitz and initiated a sexual relationship with him. The judge ruled in favor of the doctor and dismissed the case. Sarah then went to the police for help, but they turned her away. She then visited the district attorney, who told her that there was no legal recourse that could be taken against Sarah's rapist. That's when Sarah decided to, quote, be my own judge, unquote. On June 8th, she lured her rapist to the home of a pretend patient. When Ospitz arrived, she shot him through the heart. She didn't protest when the police took her away. Never did she proclaim her innocence. She simply stated that her actions had been justified. She had done it to protect other women. She was correct, at least as far as that went. Sarah had not been Ospitz's only victim. It was later discovered that Ospitz had a history of wronging women. Before Sarah killed him, at least two other women 
brought complaints against the doctor. One woman, Agnes Deffa, tried to attack Ospitz in court when he claimed that she had initiated a sexual relationship with him. The other woman, Anna Jensen, had been a patient at Ospitz's sanitarium. After Ospitz raped her, she burst into his office with a gun. She tried to shoot him, but the cartridge in her revolver failed to fire. This attempted murder happened only a few months before Ospitz raped Sarah. The police had been aware of the incident and yet still did nothing to help Sarah when she lodged her complaint against the doctor. As Sarah waited in prison for her trial, her case became a media sensation. At first, the stories were negative. She was called wretched, a frenzied girl, and a total wreck. The stories painted a picture of hysteria and criminality, an immigrant who was naturally a vicious killer. But all that changed after she gave birth to her son Abraham in prison. The newspaper now told a new story of a woman who must be innocent. Abraham was the proof of her story. The evil doctor had tried to pressure her to abort the baby and Sarah's refusal made her popular with the public. She was a model mother, they said, who was only defending her honor. Reports compared her case to the unwritten law that applied to gentlemen in the 19th century. If a woman's honor was at stake, gentlemen were allowed to retaliate, even if it violated the law. By the turn of the 20th century, that same law began to apply to women themselves. Women had little power to stop men's aggression and violence, the unwritten law argued, so it was acceptable for women to protect themselves in any way they could, even with a gun. At the end of Sarah's trial, Judge James A. Blanchard accepted her plea of insanity. He gave her a suspended sentence, sending her to the care of the Council of Jewish Women. Sarah's defense inspired other women. In early 1909, a woman named Elizabeth coerced Charles Schmidt into marrying her, saying if he didn't, she would, quote, blow out his brains like Sarah Coton did, unquote. Sarah Comiskey attempted to kill her father for abandoning his family. Nellie Walden killed her ex-boyfriend for running off. These women claimed they were inspired to violence because of Sarah Coton. As for Sarah herself, she walked out of prison after her trial and vanished from history. The Council for Jewish Women helped her to find a suitable home where she might change her name and rear her child in ignorance of the crime its mother had committed. The Council concluded its statement on Sarah's case with this, "...while no one can consistently condone murder or any other offense against the law, it is gratifying to know that this suffering woman is not to be cast into prison for a crime that she primarily was not to blame for." On December 18, 1931, gangster and bootlegger Jack Legs Diamond was shot to death in a rooming house in Albany, New York. Diamond had already survived five attempts on his life between 1916 and 1931, causing him to be known as the Clay Pigeon of the Underworld. In 1930, Dutch Schultz, an enemy of Diamond, remarked to his gang, "'Ain't there nobody that can shoot this guy so that he don't bounce back?' This time, Diamond didn't bounce back. Diamond, whose real name was John Moran, was born in Philadelphia on July 10, 1897. His parents, John and Sarah, were Irish immigrants. In 1889, a younger brother, Eddie, was born. The two boys struggled through grade school while their mother suffered from health problems. She died December 24, 1913, and their father moved them to Brooklyn soon after. Jack almost immediately fell in with some of the young street gangs of the era, notably the Boiler Gang. His first arrest for burglary occurred when he broke into a jewelry store on February 4, 1914. More than a dozen arrests would eventually follow. After a brief stint at a juvenile reformatory, he was drafted into the military during World War I. Not surprisingly, he deserted after less than a year and was sent to Leavenworth. When he got out of prison in 1921, he returned to New York, where he began associating with Charles Lucky Luciano, 
who was then a young but up-and-coming gangster. Diamond did odd jobs for Luciano, who introduced him to gambler Arnold Rothstein, who was the most powerful mobster in the city at that time. He eventually became Rothstein's personal bodyguard and was cut in on the new heroin racket, which was making a lot of money. Diamond, who had taken in his younger brother Eddie, was now making a lot of cash and the brothers decided to start their own bootlegging business. It was a common practice at the time to hijack liquor shipments from other gangsters and then sell it, hurting the competition and making a huge profit. Unfortunately, the brothers decided to hijack truckloads that belonged to Owen the Killer Madden and Big Bill Dwyer, two of the most ruthless Irish mobsters in the city. They were also connected to a larger syndicate that was run by Dutch Schultz, Luciano, Meyer Lansky, and others. Once word got around that the hijackings had been carried out by the Diamonds, the brothers lost any protection they might have had and became targets for everyone. On October 24, 1924, Diamond was driving his Dodge sedan along Fifth Avenue and stopped at the intersection at 110th Street. A large black limousine pulled up next to him. A shotgun appeared from the back window and, according to witnesses, opened fire on Diamond. He ducked down and hit the gas. He drove an entire block without looking over the dashboard. When he did, he saw that the black car was gone. He drove himself to nearby Mount Sinai Hospital where doctors removed shotgun pellets from his head and face. When the police questioned him, he shrugged the whole thing off. They must have thought he was someone else, he told them. It was obvious to Diamond that he needed protection, so he turned to Jacob Little Augie Organ, a Jewish gangster who had ran several rackets in Lower Manhattan. The main thing that he had going for him, as far as Diamond was concerned, was that he was one of the few people who didn't want to kill him. Organ wanted to increase his own power base so that he could compete with Luciano, Lansky, and the rest. Diamond would provide some of the muscle that he needed. Jack and Eddie became Organ's bodyguards, and in turn, Organ cut them in on his liquor and narcotics rackets. Then, on October 15, 1925, Organ and Diamond were finishing their daily meetings and collection rounds and were approaching the corner of Delancey and Norfolk Streets in Lower Manhattan. Three men approached them and started shooting. Organ was fatally wounded in the head, and Diamond was hit twice on the right side. He was taken to Bellevue Hospital for emergency surgery and eventually recovered. He refused to tell the police anything, and they tried to charge him with murder but couldn't make anything stick. Organ's murder was never solved, although it was believed to have been arranged by Louis Lepke Buchalter and his partner Jacob Gura Shapiro. They wanted to take over Organ's rackets, and it's believed that Diamond may have been in on the plot. After he was released from the hospital, he took over Organ's liquor operation, while Buchalter and Shapiro took over the dead man's narcotics and other rackets. With cash now pouring in, Diamond became a regular on the nightclub circuit and his picture started showing up in the newspapers. He was never portrayed as a gangster, though, only as a wealthy man about town. The public loved him, and so did the ladies. Although married, he was a womanizer, and his best-known mistress was showgirl and dancer Marion Kiki Roberts. His flamboyant lifestyle kept him out at the clubs at night, and this may have been how he obtained the nickname Legs. He was a great dancer and was part owner of the Hotsy Totsy Club, a dance spot on Broadway. So the nickname could have come from this, or, as others have suggested, from his uncanny ability to escape death. On July 14, 1929, violence came to the Hotsy Totsy Club. Two brothers, Pete and William Red Cassidy, along with a friend named Simon Walker, started a fight at the club after bartenders and staff refused to serve the already drunk men. When a waiter told them to quiet down, Red turned on the waiter and began arguing with him. Walker grabbed club manager Jaime Cohen by the arm, demanded service, and threatened to destroy the club if they didn't get service. He then shoved Cohen to the floor. Diamond and one of his cronies, Charles Entretata, saw the exchange and stepped in. He told Walker, I'm Jack Diamond and I run this place. If you don't calm down, I'll blow your effing head off. Walker turned to Diamond and snarled, You can't push me around. Well, those turned out to be his final words. 
Diamond and Entretata both pulled their guns and shot Walker and the Cassidy brothers. Red was hit three times in the head, once in the stomach, once in the groin. Walker was hit six times in the stomach. Both men were dead when they hit the floor. When the police arrived, Pete Cassidy was lying at the bottom of a flight of stairs with three gunshot wounds. Guns were found on all three of the men who had extensive arrest records. There were more than 50 people in the club when the incident took place, but no one saw a thing. Their backs were turned, they told detectives, or they were in the bathroom. Within six weeks of the shooting, Cohen, the waiter, two bartenders, and the club's hat check girl all disappeared. The waiter's bullet-ridden body was later found in New Jersey. No trace was ever located of the others. No witnesses ever came forward, so Diamond and Entretata were never charged. With the heat on him, though, Diamond closed down the club and moved to Greene County in upstate New York with his long-suffering wife, Alice. But he was only in Greece County for a short time before he sent word to New York that he was planning to return soon and reclaim what was his. When he'd left the city, Schultz and Madden had quickly taken over his rackets. His planned return made him an immediate target and earned him the moniker of Clay Pigeon of the Underworld. In 1930, while preparing for his move back to the city, but also while establishing a bootlegging operation in Greene County, Diamond and two others kidnapped Grover Parks, a truck driver who'd been hauling liquor. They wanted to know where he was picking up his alcohol shipments, but Parks refused to tell them. Oddly, they set him loose. A few months later, Diamond tried the same thing with another driver, James Parks, and this time he was arrested and charged with kidnapping. He was later acquitted at trial. In late August 1930, Diamond traveled to Europe. He told reporters that he was on his way to France where he would take a mineral water cure for his health. The real reason for the trip, though, was to establish a German liquor source. He was planning to smuggle alcohol from Europe to reestablish his New York operation. But nothing went according to plan. When the ship docked in Belgium, he was taken into custody by the police. After several hours of questioning, he was put on a train to Germany. When he arrived there, he was arrested by the German Secret Service, who put him on a freighter that was bound for Philadelphia. It arrived on September 23rd, and he was immediately arrested by the Philadelphia police. At a court hearing on the same day, Diamond was told that he would be released if he left for New York within the hour the weary gangster readily agreed. In New York, he moved into the Hotel Monticello in Manhattan and began trying to take back his rackets in the city. Hardly anyone was happy to have him back. On the morning of October 10, 1930, Diamond was wounded by three men who forced their way into his hotel suite and shot him five times. Still in his pajamas, he staggered out into the hall where he collapsed. He was rushed to Polyclinic Hospital, where he slowly recovered enough to be discharged on December 30th. When asked how he managed to make it to the hallway with five bullets in him, Diamond said he'd already had two shots of whiskey for breakfast. On April 21st, 1931, Diamond was arrested again, this time on assault charges that dated back to the Parks beating in 1930. Two days later, he posted bond and was released. A week later, however, he was shot and wounded again. He was at a roadhouse called the Aratoga Inn near Cairo, New York, which was owned by Jimmy Wynn. Wynn had numerous underworld connections, and the nightclub was a popular hangout for gangsters. Diamond had just finished eating with three companions and was waiting on a telephone call from his attorney. As he walked to the front door to get some fresh air, three gunmen who were dressed as duck hunters opened fire on him. Diamond was hit several times. A local man drove him to a hospital in Albany where he was treated for his injuries. His troubles continued. On May 1st, while he was still in the hospital, New York State troopers seized beer and liquor worth more than $5,000 from one of Diamond's hideouts in Cairo. He was charged with bootlegging and sentenced to four years in state prison. He appealed the conviction and remained free on bail while he awaited the outcome of the appeal. Meanwhile, Diamond still had to face the music in the Parks case, and later that year he went to trial. He was again acquitted on the assault and kidnapping charges. 
He left court a free man December 17, 1931. In the mood for a celebration, he and his family, along with a few friends, celebrated at the Rainbow Room of the Kenmore Hotel, the best hotel in Albany. At about 1 a.m. on December 18, he left the party and went to see his mistress, Kiki Roberts, who was staying at another hotel. Roberts had attended the celebration party, but he had left before midnight. Diamond stayed in her room until about 4.30 a.m. and then was driven to 67 Dove Street, a private rooming house where he'd been staying during his trial. He entered the locked front door with his key, went upstairs to his room, and fell asleep on the bed. Witness reports say that a large black car, which had been parked down the street for some time, pulled up to the rooming house soon after Diamond arrived. Two men got out and entered the front door, using a key, and quickly went upstairs. When they got to Diamond's room, they either used a key or, as some believe, Diamond drunkenly left his own key in the lock and entered the room. Diamond was asleep on the bed. While one man held him down, the other shot Diamond three times in the head. They ran out of the room, but when they were halfway down the stairs, one of the gunmen ran back up, went back into Diamond's room, and shot him a few more times, apparently just for good measure. The landlady, Laura Woods, awakened by the shots, overheard the second gunman call out, "'Oh, hell, that's enough, come on!' The man left the house and drove away in the black car. A few minutes later, at 5 a.m., Mrs. Woods telephoned Alice Diamond, the contact that Jack had given her in case there was any trouble. Within minutes, Alice, one of Diamond's men, and Diamond's eight-year-old nephew, Eddie, arrived at the house. Alice entered the room and began to scream. She frantically wiped blood from his face with a towel when the police and ambulance were called. Like most gangland slayings, the murder was never solved. In this case, there were just too many suspects since almost everyone seemed to want Diamond dead, from Dutch Schultz to the New York Syndicate, relatives of the Cassidy brothers who'd been shot at the Hotsi Totsi Club, and even local politicians who wanted Diamond out of the Albany area. It didn't seem to matter to most who had killed him. There weren't many who were going to miss him. Diamond was buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery in Queens on December 23rd. There was no church service or graveside ceremony. The burial was attended by Alice, her sister and brother-in-law, three nieces, a cousin, about a dozen reporters, and more than 200 curiosity seekers. There were no known gangsters in attendance, and, against the custom of the day, none of them sent flowers either. Diamond may have gotten what he deserved, but there was one sad footnote to the story. On July 1, 1933, Alice Diamond was found shot to death in her Brooklyn apartment. It was speculated that she was killed by her husband's enemies to keep her quiet, but no one knows for sure. Her murder, like the murder of Jack Legs Diamond, has never been solved. Are you familiar with the concept of shrunken heads? You might think they're just stories from explorers about far-off tribes, plot devices from Gilligan's Island, or a scene from the horror comedy film Beetlejuice, but they're actually quite real. They might be small, but the practice of making shrunken heads has a big history. And that is the topic of this week's Mind of Marlar, which you can find right now by visiting mindofmarlar.com. Ironized Yeast presents Lights Out, Everybody. It is later than you think. Lights Out brings you stories of the supernatural and the supernormal, dramatizing the fantasies and the mysteries of the unknown. We tell you this frankly, 
So if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly but sincerely to turn off your radio now. My name, Arch Obler. Tonight, another in our series of tales of the weird and the unusual. The idea for today's play, the story of Mr. Maggs, came to me a few years ago when I was in England, pre-war England. Calm, peaceful, serene, no enemy bombers overhead, no screaming sirens, and England happily without worry. But before we start, Frank Martin has a word for you. Friends, these critical times are making terrific extra demands on all of us. But if you've gotten miserably thin and tired and run down, don't necessarily blame the war or your job. It's quite possible you simply need more vitamin B and iron than you're getting from your food. Well, if you do need more of these vital substances, get them a quick, easy way. Take ironized yeast tablets. They help two ways in cases of such deficiencies. Help two ways to build you up. Help two ways to increase weight and strength. Help two ways to step up pep and energy. Remember that name, ironized yeast tablets. And now... Lights out, everybody. All right, gentlemen, all right, gentlemen. Now, here's an opportunity you can't afford to miss. As the Americans say, an opportunity of a lifetime. In auctioning off these effects of various deceased members of the community, I assure you that no single piece has more pretentious value than this genuine oak and traveling truck. As you see, gentlemen, it's bound in brass and locked tight and secure with a massive, genuine brass lock. What's in it? Nobody knows. But the law says that being unclaimed, strange merchandise, whoever buys it gets it all, as you might say, with all that's in it, be it gold or silver plate or the jewels of India. Now, what am I offered for this chest? Make your bids and make them good, gentlemen. Do I hear someone say ten pounds? Five shillings. Now, gentlemen, look at it. Lock tight. And nobody knows what's inside. A fortune waiting here. And somebody talks of five shillings. Now, come, let's on with it. What am I offered? Five and six. Oh, gentlemen, for firewood alone. I offer six. Six. Six and six. Seven. Well, gentlemen, it appears we're having a competition in little numbers. Is there anybody here who would like to raise a bid in April? Seven and six. Eight. Gentlemen, I ask you, ain't there anybody here who's heard what I said about this chest being locked and sealed? Oh, let it go. It's the last thing I've got to auction. So let it go and we'll all go home. Go into the little gentleman right down here for eight children even. Do you hear any more? So, step right up here, sir, and claim your purchase. Now, what might your name be for the record? Name? My name is Mags. <coughs> yes, Harold Mags. And the money, Mr. Mags? Oh, yes, sir. My pocketbook got it already. Eight shillings, sir. Here you are. Right, you are. You understand, of course, the cottage is extra. Oh? Oh, is it? Right, you are. Now, where will I send the chest? Well, I don't know. I mean, extra charges. Uh, where will I send it? Uh, 92 Applegate Southwest 3. You're right, you are. Is is that all? That's all. The chest is yours. You'll get it in the morning. In the morning? But I'll be at work in the morning. Your old woman will be home, won't she? Oh, yes, but she doesn't in know anything In the morning, about... they'll deliver it, and in the morning, you'll get it. Good night to you. Oh, good night, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you to me, huh? If you knew what I know of that trunk, you wouldn't be thanking me. You'd curse me to the devil. That you, Harold? Uh... Yes, Agatha. Well, I must say, it's a fine time for a man to be getting hold. Well, Mr. Bainbridge asked me to stay and check the inventory. Never mind and... what Mr. Bainbridge said. Did you get anything extra for doing what Mr. Bainbridge said? Well, I... I Never uh... mind what he said. I tell you what you get from me. A cold supper, that's what. Oh, it's all right, Agatha. Oh, is it? Now, just a minute, Mr. Harold Maggs. There's something else I want to talk to you about. Yes, Agatha? 
How much money have you been making on the races? Races? Me? You. Oh, no, you know I never played the horses. And how much money did that rich uncle of yours in Australia leave you? Australia? Me? Why, Agatha, what are you talking about? I haven't got any uncles in Australia. Oh, then maybe it's a gold mine you discovered. Or maybe a well that gives a hundred gallons of petrol a minute. Agatha, are you all right? A chest. Oh. Why did you buy it? Well, they I... They didn't give it to you, did they? It was only eight shillings and I... Only eight shillings? You mean to stand there and tell me you spent eight whole God-given shillings for that thing? Uh, yes. Harold Meg's I ought to... Agatha, what's that? Never you mind what that is. Up in the garret? Yes, yes, up in the garret, where that great prize of yours is. Up in the garret where you should be until your head's examined. But, Agatha, what... In... It's Freddy, breaking the thing open to see what's inside. Breaking it open? Yes, and I told him to do it. Freddy, have you opened it yet? Yes, ma'am. Oh, Agatha, please, I don't want him to... No, oh, keep quiet. I know you haven't got a key to it. But Raymond told me all about this prize package that did. Oh, but... Plunked it right down in the middle of the kitchen floor. And poor Freddie and I had to carry it all the way upstairs. Oh, but Agatha... Oh, we'll find out what's in it soon enough. Oh, no, please, he shouldn't break the lock. It's a good one. Maybe I could pick it. I'll go up No, there. no, Harold, come back here. Let Freddie do what I told him to. Harold! Harold, come back here this minute. Harold, you regret this, making me climb these stairs. Harold, do you hear me? Ma'am, ma'am, make him stop. Harold, Harold, what's come over you? He huh? won't smash my chest, he won't. Uh, well, Mum said I could, she did, she did, she oh, said I could. Oh, you strike that boy. Oh, I didn't. Well, you thought about it. He may not be your flesh and blood, Harold Meggs, but he's mine. Ah. He's a big lout, 30 years old. Uh, Mum, he called me I a big lout again. Mm, quite enough. Harold Meggs, give me that hammer. Yes, Agatha. I'll fix your precious chest, your precious lock. <laughs> That's oh, right, Mum. Show him. Show him. Oh, a good one, Mum. You smashed it. Oh, it was a good padlock. <laughs> you keep quiet. <laughs> Buy a cat in the poke, will you? Teach him, Mum. Well, now we'll see your grand bargain. Help me lift the lid, Freddy. <laughs> sure thing, mm. Mum. We'll see what you wish. Oh, my yeah. good money. Oh. Mum. Why? Why, it's empty. Empty. Harold Mag, you wretch, you. Taking the bread out of the mouth of your good wife and your son to buy empty trunks. I Wait, to... Agatha. Wait for what? For what? It's not empty. What are you talking about? See? The whole inside crusted with dried blood. Open your eyes, you stupid fool. What? 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 Wake up, Freddy. It's not morning. No, of course not. Open your eyes. Uh, uh, I heard something. Well, what did you hear? Can't you hear anymore? I said there's someone in the house. What? What do you mean? Listen. I don't hear anything. Don't talk. Listen. Ah! <gasps> you heard? Yes. Up in the garret. Oh. Get up and do something. Well, what could I do? Well, you're do? not going to let them steal the house away from us. There, again. But why in the garret? Are you going to lie there talking while oh, they... But we've nothing there for anyone to take there. Ah! Ah! It's Freddy. Freddy? What the... Come on. No, no, not up there. Well, I'm going. Harold, come back and don't leave me alone to be murdered. Harold, don't go up there. Harold, I'm frightened. Agatha, Agatha, come up here quickly. No. No, I'm afraid. Agatha, quickly. Oh, all right, all right. I'm more afraid down here than I'll be up there. Can't be much to be afraid of. If you're not afraid, Harold. So dark up here. Well, Harold, what is it? Agatha, come here, help me. Well, what is it? What's the matter with you? What? It's your Freddy. Freddy? Freddy! Oh! The lid of the chest seems to be closed on his head. And I can't seem to open it.
Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree when an old chest becomes a thing of horrible death and when there is more of death in the air, then's the time to leave tonight's lights out for a deep breath and a turning of our thoughts to something that perhaps is your problem. Now, back to Lights Out and our story of Mr. Maggs. The son of the house lies dead, crushed by the object Mr. Maggs had bought at the auction. An old chest. Agatha, it's no use going on like that. There's nothing we can do for you. I, I knew you loved the boy. Guess he's the only thing you ever loved in all your life. Oh, do something. Do something, you worm. You. What is there to do? Storm's so bad, just have to wait until morning, that's all. If you hadn't bought that infernal chest. If I hadn't bought it. Murdered him, you did. You hated him for the memory of my first husband. Now, I wouldn't say that, Agatha. Why not? You bought the chest, so it's your doing. Well, in a way, you're right. I brought the evil into the house now, didn't I? What are you talking about? An unhappy house, and now there's evil in it. What are you saying? Since we came downstairs, all these hours since it happened, I've been thinking... Thinking what? How do you think Freddy died, and why? You're crazy? Asking me if I know how he died? I saw it, didn't I? But I asked you, why did he die? Why? Why? Because the infernal lid of it fell on his head, that's why. Oh, my Freddy. Yes. <laughs> the evil did it. Evil, evil. You are crazy. The only thing evil was your buying it. You just don't understand, do you, Agatha? What are you looking at me like that for? I tell you the lid fell down on his head. Evil. Evil, evil, evil. Stop trying to make me as crazy as you are. Come on back up there and help me carry my son down so I can stretch him out decent and respectful. For when the undertaker comes. No, Agatha. What? I've made up my mind. I won't yeah. go up there again. Oh, yes, you will. He'll lie dead in a bed, my son. Not up there. No, Agatha, I've made up my mind. I figured out that up in the garret, the evil has evil taken... Evil be blasted. My son. You'll help me carry him down. Don't stand there. Don't stand there. Storm's over. Help me carry down his body so I can lay it out decent. No, Agatha. No, hear me out. It's evil. I'll have you locked away, I tell you. Evil, and I knew somehow that it was there. That's no. why I dragged you downstairs again so quickly. Oh. You never thought much of me, Aggie, but this no. time, believe me, if I go up there with you, it means my life. I've listened to enough. A split headed little worm, that's what you are. There's nothing up there but that blasted chest you bought and Freddy's body. And if you won't help me bring him down, then, curse you, I'll bring him down myself. No, Agatha, come back. Aggie, come back. Agatha, I beg you. Aggie! Aggie, you shouldn't have. This once in all these years, you should have listened to me. If you'd have listened this time, I would have meant something more than... <gasps> Agatha? Agatha, what's doing up there? Are you all right? Agatha, do you hear me? You all right? What in the... Helen! Helen! Helen, help me! Agatha, what? Helen! Ah! Agatha, what? What happened? What's the matter? Oh, Agatha, heaven help me. I can't come up to you. I'm afraid. Agatha, that's another hour. It's hard waiting, Agatha. I've got to keep so quiet. I've got to listen. Perhaps you'll say something. Call me again. I've got to know what happened. Man can go crazy not knowing what happened. I... 
I'll keep very quiet. Perhaps I'll hear you saying something up there. Agatha? Wind. I hear nothing but the wind, Agatha. I'm afraid to move out of this chair, Agatha. As afraid as I've ever been in all my life. And that's been many times, Agatha. Something safe about this chair. It's my chair. I've sat in it so many times it knows me. And while I'm in it, nothing can happen to me. Now, can it? But if I were to get up, leave it. Walk toward the door. No, I won't do that. I'll sit here and wait in the chair. And when it's daylight again... <gasps> Agatha, is that you? I, I heard you again. Agatha? Agatha? Agatha, why don't you answer me? I hear you moving around. Why don't you answer me? Agatha! Agatha, isn't it you? Sounds as if... as if a heavy chest were being moved. Moved along to the head of the stairs. No. Nothing more. So quiet. <gasps> Coming down the steps. <sighs> Coming down. Agatha, is that you? You're bringing the chest down? Agatha, is it you? No, no, it couldn't be you, could it, Agatha? And who is bringing it down? Who is it? Answer me. Answer me! <laughs> Gotta get out of here. Run. But I can't. I can't. I'm too afraid. Who, who is it? Agatha, it is you, isn't it? It, it must be you. It must be. Uh, not many more steps, then I'll see you. No, no, I won't look. I won't. Stop, you, whoever you are. Don't bring that chest down here. Stop. Stop! Stop. No further. Stop. I won't have to see you. I won't have to see... <gasps> Again. Oh, no. So close, bottom of the stairs. I'll see. I'll see. I'll see. What? Oh, if I could close my eyes. Only one more step. I know it. I know it. No one with it. How can that be? No one. How could a trunk come down the stairs one at a time alone? Just a chest. 
Why should I be afraid of it? Just a chest. Put my hand on it. <gasps> Move it. Move it under my hand. Thing of evil, I'll get you. You won't get me, I'll get you. My axe. Where's my axe? Closet. Was in here. Yes. Got to find my axe. Won't get me, you blasted chest, you. Got it. You hear me, you evil? Axe in my hand, I'm coming for you. You came after me, but I'll get you. I see you there at the foot of the steps, you chest, you. Lying there so quiet, aren't you? Think I'll open you and then you'll get me too? Well, you won't. You won't. I'm coming for you. See? I'm creeping close to you, slowly, slowly, the way you crept down the stairs for me. How do you like it, you evil, waiting for your doom? I'll get close to you, I'll swing my axe, and then your evil will be over, won't it? You'll be wood, wood, and twisted bands of brass, and then I won't have to be afraid anymore, now will I? Now, I'm close enough, your doom, chest, I'm your doom, here! There. I did it. I did it, you evil chest. You cracked you wide open. I'll pull the rest of you wide apart. And then... Ah! Agatha! You were in it! My axe, it's in your skull! Harry. Oh, Harry. Yes, Mr. Jamison. Harry, uh, that chest you delivered over Applegate Way, where's the signed receipt for it? Oh, yeah, it is. It's lying right here. Uh, received one chest. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Mr. Jamison? Oh, just thinking. Thinking of what, might I ask you, sir? Thinking and wondering if they found out. What's that, sir? That the chest was the one in which that murderer, the young last Wednesday... Used to stuff his murdered victim. Cool. I wonder if that little man that bought it. What was his name? Uh, Mags. Found out about his bargain yet. Phew. Now, just a second, Mr. Obler. You mean to say that this old chest killed those people? I, uh, I didn't say. The supernatural, the supernormal, and coincidence. Who can separate the three? I'd like to tell you something that actually happened to me, though, a few years ago. Very strange happening. But I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. More vitamin B and iron. And now, Mr. Obler... You were about to tell us. Well, I was going to tell you about that very thin line between coincidence and the supernormal. A number of years ago, back in Chicago, late at night, I sat down on my typewriter to try to write a short story. I sat and sat and sat there, but no ideas came along. Then, just as the clock struck 12, and I remember the time very, very well, the idea came along. Quickly, I began to type the story of criminal in the hotel room hiding from the police he can't uh, remember uh, exactly what to do uh, finally in his panic he climbs out the window and hangs from a narrow ledge high above the city street finally just as the police come in he falls well i got that very, very far with the plot and and suddenly rather tired i went to bed the next morning the headline of the paper told of a criminal who had hidden in a hotel room and then when the police broke in the panic and the hour was just at midnight had tried to escape by hanging from the narrow ledge outside the room. In other words, as I was writing that story, at that very moment, mind you, it was actually happening. Coincidence? Supernormal? Who knows? But now, uh, what happens next week, Mr. Obler? Next week? Scoop. Quite a strange title, I'll admit, and a very strange story. It's about a man who worked all his life only to have what he'd worked for taken away, <laughs> but... That, as usual, is next week. Yes, Lights Out will come to you again next Tuesday at the same time. Be sure to listen to Arch Obler's weird story of Scoop. 
Oh, by the way, in answer to those inquiring about scripts, a new book of plays by Arch Obler, Plays for Americans, has just been published by Ferrer and Reinhardt. These plays may be used without royalties by any person or group in connection with our country's war work. And if you need more vitamin B and iron, be sure to try Ironized Yeast, the one and only Ironized Yeast, with the big letters IY on the package and on each tablet. It is later than you think. Next year, the best dressed man in town may be the one with the oldest suit. Because today it's practical, even stylish, to get extra wear from your clothes. And Energene cleaning fluid can help you do that, folks. For Energene is a spot remover. It gets rid of those little grease spots that moths love to feed on. Grease spots that settle on clothes and make them look worn, run down, and old before their time. Yes, Energene removes those spots easily, quickly, at practically no cost. Get more satisfactory wear from your clothes by caring for them this easy, economical, Energene way with Energene cleaning fluid. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. On June 6, 1992, two Missouri teenagers and one teen's mother vanished without a trace after a graduation ceremony and have never been seen again. It was a shocking and tragic end to what should have been the event of a lifetime, and it remains a haunting, unsolved mystery to this day. Best friends Suzanne Susie Streeter, 19, and Stacy McCall, 18, had just graduated from Kickapoo High School. They were spending the evening celebrating with friends. They visited several different graduation parties and then decided to go to Susie's house, which she shared with her mother, Cheryl Levitt, a 47-year-old cosmetologist, for the rest of the night. Cheryl was probably happy to see them. Her night had been quiet. She'd been on the phone with a friend talking about painting furniture until about 11.15 p.m. What happened after that remains a chilling puzzle. Since all of Susie's and Stacy's belongings were later found at Cheryl's house – purses, clothing, makeup, etc. – it was assumed that they did make it there. Their cars were also in the driveway. But when friends arrived at the Levitt house the next morning, Susie, Stacy, and Cheryl were missing. A group of graduating friends all planned to go to the Whitewater Water Park the next day, so friends, Janelle and Kirby, came to the Levitt house at 8 a.m. on June 7th. They knocked, but there was no answer. 
They went home and then returned at noon, thinking that perhaps the two girls had left for the water park without them. As they approached the house, they saw that the porch light was broken. They swept up the glass, trying to be helpful, but unknowingly contaminated a crime scene. Janelle and Kirby checked the door. It was unlocked. That was their first inkling that something might be wrong. When they entered the house, though, everything seemed intact. There were no signs of a struggle. The house was just empty, as if they had simply walked away. But to where? The cars were all parked in the driveway, but Susie, Stacy, and Cheryl were nowhere to be found. Just before the two teenagers left, the telephone rang. Janelle answered. The caller didn't identify himself but began making lewd comments, so Janelle hung up, assuming it was a prank call. She and Kirby left the house. A little while later, Stacy's mother, Janice McCall, arrived at the house. She had tried to call, but there was no answer, so she had driven over. She hadn't heard from her daughter since early the previous evening. There was no answer when she knocked, so she went inside. She looked around and found Stacy's belongings. Her daughter's underwear and t-shirt were missing, but the rest of her clothes were neatly folded on a chair. It looked like both girls had removed their makeup in the bathroom the night before. Janice also found all three of the missing women's purses lined up on the floor outside of Susie's room, which seemed odd. The television was on, and Janice saw that there was a message flashing on the answering machine. When she tried to listen to it, she accidentally deleted it. She was convinced that something was wrong. It had been 16 hours since the three women had been seen. Janice and her husband decided to contact the police. When the authorities arrived, they tried to nail down just how many people had been inside of the house, possibly contaminating the crime scene, and tried to figure out what had happened. It was a baffling situation, but suspects soon emerged. The first suspect was Cheryl's son, Bart Streeter, who had recently argued with his mother and sister about his drinking problem. But Bart had a solid alibi and was soon ruled out. Authorities also questioned Susie's ex-boyfriend, Dustin Reckla. He'd been in trouble before. A short time back, he and a friend were arrested for vandalizing cemeteries. Susie had given a statement to the police that stated the boys had been digging up graves and stealing gold teeth from the corpses. Threats had been made against Susie and her mother. When questioned, though, the boys were cooperative and also ruled out as suspects. The investigation then focused on Robert Craig Cox, an Army veteran who had been arrested and convicted of a woman's murder in Florida. The Florida case was overturned due to a lack of evidence. In 1985, Cox was convicted of two different abduction attempts and sentenced to nine years in prison. His case was appealed and overturned in 1992 when a judge ruled that the evidence only gave the suspicion of guilt rather than proof of it. He was released in 1992 and sent to live with his parents in Springfield, Missouri, which put him in the right place at the right time to have been potentially involved in the disappearance of the three women. Cox was working as an electrician, which the police speculated could have given him an excuse to enter the home. They also found that Cox had previously worked with Stacy's father at his car lot. Cox's girlfriend gave him an alibi at the time, but years later she admitted that she lied about it. Cox had convinced her to make up the story if the police asked where he was during that weekend in June. Her story seemed solid, so the police had no choice but to let him go. But Cox found it impossible to stay out of trouble. A short time later he was arrested again for an unrelated crime. Detectives still believed that he had something to do with the missing women and took the opportunity to question him again. Cox laughed at them. He said that he knew the women were dead and he claimed he knew where their bodies were buried, but was he telling the truth? The police didn't know. Cox loved attention, and this was the perfect way to get it. He was their most promising suspect, but he wouldn't talk, and they had no hard evidence against him. Eventually, the case went cold. The case of the Springfield Three officially remains open. Tips and stories have led to nothing but dead ends over the years. Theories abound. Some say they were victims of sex trafficking. Others claim they were carried off by a satanic cult. One tip 
claiming that the women were buried in the foundation of a parking garage at a local hospital was so convincing that the authorities tore up the concrete to look for them, and they found nothing. What happened that night in 1992? There was no sign of a struggle. The three women were simply gone. They were declared legally dead in 1997, but the questions that linger still weigh heavy on surviving family members and on detectives who refuse to close the case. Where are the Springfield Three? After all these years, no one knows. On June 5, 1930, the body of Chicago mobster Eugene Red McLaughlin was found floating in the Chicago River. Despite the bailing wire that was wrapped around his body and the 75 pounds of metal that had been used to try and sink him to the bottom. The murder was actually one in a number of mob-related killings during what the Chicago papers called Slaughter Week. Like most mob hits of the Prohibition era, it was never officially solved. It had already been a rough year prior to the events of late May and early June. In January, a gun battle occurred in which Frank McCurlane, the mobster responsible for introducing the Tommy gun to Chicago, received partial payback for the murders of at least nine victims of gangland slayings that he was reportedly responsible for. Coroners had often listed him as a cause of death in autopsy reports. He'd been indicted for two murders a short time before, but charges were dismissed. McCurlane had been recently restless. He had fought over shares with his partner Joe Saltese and had transferred his allegiance to the South Side O'Donnells. During the ambush on January 28th, he was struck in the right leg by a bullet. While recovering at the German Deaconess Hospital, he had two unexpected visitors who walked into his room and opened fire. McCurlane, imprisoned by splints, did the best he could. He reached under his pillow and pulled out a 38 caliber revolver, which he fired five times. The intruders ran, leaving McCurlane still alive. Two full chambers had been fired at him, but McCurlane was only hit three times, and none of the wounds were fatal. He was interviewed by the police, but of course did not name his attackers. He did, however, hint angrily that this would not be the end of the matter. One of the gunmen had been John Dingbat Oberta a ferocious little man who was the chief gunman for McCurlane's old partner, Saltese. On March 5th, Oberta and his driver, Sam Malega, were taken for a ride in Dingbat's own Lincoln sedan. He was shotgunned to death. Oberta's funeral was a two-day wake, attended by 15,000 admirers from the back of the yard's neighborhood on the south side where Oberta had earned a name for himself as an influential young politician. Dingbat's widow had previously been the wife of Big Tim Murphy, the racketeer controller of the Street Sweepers Union who'd been machine-gunned in front of his Rogers Park home in June 1928. She and Oberta had met at Murphy's funeral. She had her second husband buried next to her first husband in Holy Sepulchre Cemetery. She told reporters they were both good men. Then, in the last week of May 1930, the guns roared again kicking off what some news scribblers dubbed Slaughter Week. On Saturday, Peter Nolfo, who had once worked for the defunct Genna operation and switched his allegiance to Joe Aiello, was shotgunned by the Druggen Lake Gang, allegedly on orders from Al Capone. Within hours, the Aiellos struck back and three died in the reprisal. A party of five was sitting on the terrace of a small resort hotel in Piscatee Lake during the early hours of Sunday morning. They were Joseph Bircha, who since being released from the Atlanta Penitentiary had been working for the Drug and Lake mob, Michael Quirk, a labor racketeer and beer runner, George Druggan, Terry Druggan's brother, Sam Peller, an election strong-arm man from the 20th Ward, and Mrs. Vivian McGinnis, the wife of a Chicago lawyer. A full drum of machine gun bullets shattered the glass and slaughtered the group at the table. Peller, Quirk, and Bircha died on the spot. Druggan and Mrs. McGinnis were both injured. The assailants vanished into the darkness. 
No arrest was made, and newspapers explained the attack as a quarrel that had developed because some of the Drug and Lake boys were muscling in on the Fox Lake area, which was then supplied by Aiello and Moran breweries. The reprisals continued, and on Tuesday, Thomas Somnario, an Aiello man, was found dead in an alley at the rear of 831 West Harrison Street in Chicago. He had been garroted, and his wrists were tied with wire. He appeared to have been tortured for information. Four days later, a tugboat passing along the drainage canal at Summit on the southwest side bumped into the body of Eugene Red McLaughlin, a Drug and Lake gunman who'd been named four times as a murderer and twice as a diamond thief and yet had never seen the inside of a prison. He'd been shot twice in the head and dumped in the river. His wrists had been tied behind his back with bailing wire and 75 pounds of iron had been stuffed in his pockets. It hadn't been enough to keep him from floating up from the bottom of the canal, though. Two weeks later, his body was identified by his brother, Bob McLaughlin, who was president of the Chicago Checker Cab Company. He'd taken over the office from Joe Workwell, who had run into a nasty accident while running for re-election. He'd been shot in the head. Before he died, he named Red McLaughlin as his attacker, a lead that was ignored by the police. A mournful Bob McLaughlin spoke to reporters after the grim task of identifying his brother's corpse. He said, "...a better kid never lived. He was friendly with all the boys. The West Side Outfit, the North Siders, and the bunch on the South Side. Capone, too. I don't know. I don't know." Red McLaughlin was just another casualty of the wars over territory in Chicago in the waning days of Prohibition the identity of his killer remains unknown. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Barbara Stanwyck and Burt Lancaster in Sorry, Wrong Number. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. (laughs) Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play reverses the usual relation between radio and motion pictures. Sorry, Wrong Number was first a radio drama, and it achieved such success on the air that Hal Wallace decided to make a picture of it. He assigned the author, Lucille Fletcher, to expand her short drama into a full-length screenplay, and the result was a triumph of suspense drama. The rest of the success story you know, because the Paramount picture with Barbara Stanwyck and Burt Lancaster as the stars was one of the top films of the year. Tonight, Sorry Wrong Number completes the circle and comes back to radio with Miss Stanwyck and Mr. Lancaster in their original screen roles. Just as our drama had a double success story, so has our product, Lux Toilet Soap. It's been a favorite for years in the regular size, and now the new bath size has made Lux Soap a hit all over again. The curtain rises now for the first act of Sorry Wrong Number starring Barbara Stanwyck as Leona and Burt Lancaster as Henry. In the tangled network of a great city, the telephone is the unseen link between a million lives, servant of our common needs, confident of our inmost secrets. Life and happiness wait upon its wings, and horror and loneliness and sometimes 
even then. Operator. 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 Your call, please. Operator, I've been ringing Murray Hill 32491 for the last half hour, and the line is always busy. Will you ring it for me, please? Murray Hill 32491. One moment, please. It's my husband's office. He should have been home hours ago. I can't think why that ridiculous wire should be busy. They always close that office at 6 o'clock. I am ringing your number. Thank you. Oh, it's busy again. Operator, the line is busy. Now, will you please... Hello? Hello, Mr. Stevenson, please. Hello? I want to speak to Mr. Henry Stevenson. Hello, George, speaking. Hello, what number is this? Everything okay for tonight, George? Flat says the coast is clear. I beg your pardon, but I'm using this wire. What about the time? Still 11.15? 11.15. You got it all straight now? Hello? Yeah, I think so. At 11 o'clock, the private patrolman goes around to the bar on 2nd Avenue for a beer. Then I get in through the kitchen window. I wait until the train goes over the bridge in case her window is open and she should scream. Who is this? Hello? The client says he doesn't want her to suffer long. You know me, George. And don't forget the jewelry. He wants it to look like a robbery, see? That's very important. Okay. Now, let me check the... Hello? Hello? Oh, that's awful. That, that's horrible. Operator? Operator, you... You just gave me a wrong number. I was calling Murray Hill 32491, but instead I was cut into some other number that you dialed. The wires must have been crossed or something, and I I just heard the most dreadful thing, a murder. Yes, madam. I want you to get that wrong number back for me at once. I'm sorry, madam. I do not understand. I just told you. You dialed a number for me, and then those those horrible men came on, and, well, it's, it's unnerved me dreadfully. I'm an invalid, I'll and I... I'll connect you with the chief operator, madam. Well, do something, please. Chief operator, may I help you? What? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, you may. I'm an invalid, and I've just had a dreadful shock just now on this telephone, and I'm very anxious to trace the call. It was about a murder, a terrible, cold-blooded murder of a poor, innocent woman tonight at 11.15. Yes, madam. I was trying to reach my husband's office. He should have been home hours ago. It's almost 10 o'clock. I, I, I'm all alone tonight. My nurse has the night off because my husband promised he'd be home by 6. About the call, madam. I don't know any of the neighbors as we live permanently in Chicago, and it... It, it so happens that the couple I have working for me had some important date or other. I, I don't know, a movie, I suppose. They they said it was promised them three weeks ago. You'd think they'd at least have checked with me before leaving. They, they know I'm not well. About the phone call, madam. I told you I kept getting a busy signal. Then I asked the operator to call for me. And then... Out of a clear sky, I was cut into this ghastly conversation between two killers. I suggest you call the police, madam. Oh, for heaven's sake, all this idiotic red tape. You just sit there and let people die. Oh. Is, is anyone downstairs? Gertrude. Gertrude, are you down there? Oh. Oh, hold. Oh. Oh. Operator. Give me the police. I just told you, ma'am, first of all, there's a lot of people named George. As for the private patrolman and 2nd Avenue and the bridge, well, 2nd Avenue is a very long street. I don't care Have about... Have you happen to know how many bridges there are in Manhattan? Oh, this is insane. I tell you, a woman is going to be murdered. But a clue of this sort, why, it's not much more use to us than no clue at all. Unless you think there's something phony about all this. Phony? Or that somebody's trying to murder you. Me? Oh, that would be ridiculous. I mean, why should anybody? What have I... Ah, you see, lady, you got nothing to worry about. Now, just a minute. All right, don't listen to me. Who cares? Oh, Henry. Why did you leave me alone? Why did you leave me alone here? I... Oh, his secretary. Henry's secretary, she'd know. Her number's on the pad. Jennings. Miss Jennings. Elizabeth Jennings. Why, no, Mrs. Stevenson. I haven't any idea where Mr. Stevenson is. He was supposed to be home hours ago. Well, that's odd, isn't it? The last time I saw him was when he left this afternoon to keep an appointment. What appointment? Where? Well, I... No, but I do know he had a luncheon date with a young lady. What young lady? Tell me, Miss Jennings. Uh, Mrs. Lord, Mrs. Frederick Lord. She seemed very anxious to see Mr. Stevenson. Mrs. Lord? I... 
heard him make a date to meet her for lunch. Why, Mrs. Lord phoned here this afternoon. Oh? Yes, the nurse answered. I have the memorandum right here. Mrs. Lord, 4.50 p.m. Oh, I'm afraid that's all I know, Mrs. Stevenson. But I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. Mr. Stevenson's so devoted. He speaks so beautifully of you. Well, if there's anything I can... No, help... no, thank you, Miss Jennings. Oh, I do hope I haven't let a cat out of the bag. Good night, Miss Jennings. Mrs. Lord, a young lady, she said. Lunch and gone all afternoon. Hello? Mr. Stevenson, please. He's not in. Who's calling? It's it's Mr. Evans again. Do you know where I could reach him? I'm sure I don't know where Mr. Stevenson is. Call back later. Would 15 minutes be all right? I haven't much time. Yes, 15 minutes. And if he should come in, the name is Evans. It's very important. Yes, yes, I'll tell him. Mrs. Lord Telephone. 4.50 p.m. Murray Hill, 3. 9266. Hello? Is Mrs. Lord in? This is Mrs. Lord. Who's calling, please? Mrs. Henry Stevenson. It so happens my husband hasn't come home this evening. I thought perhaps you might give me some idea as Yes, to where... yes, but I can't talk now. I can't hear you. Could I call you back? Call me back? Why? Is anything wrong? Leona, this is Sally. Sally Hunt. Sally Hunt? I'm sorry if I sound ridiculous, but I can't talk now. No, 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 wait. If you're the Sally Hunt I used to know... I'll call you back as soon as I can, Leona. Hey, Sally, who was it? Uh, just uh, one of the girls, dear. She, she wanted a recipe. Hey, Joe would like a bottle of beer. You got any on ice? Oh, no, I'm afraid not. I'll run down to the store. Thanks, honey. And hurry back. Joe is dying. Sally. Sally Hunt. Oh, yes. Yes, that was long ago. College, spring dance. He was Sally's date. He was with her when I met him. Henry. Henry dancing with Sally. Hello, Leona. This, uh, this is Mr. Henry Stevens. Hello, Henry. Well, can I cut in? If you don't mind, miss, where I come from, it's the man who does the picnic. <laughs> all right, go ahead. But why don't you get somebody your own speed? I'm sure there are better dancers around. Oh, you'll do all right, Henry. Leona knows her way around the floor. Thank you, darling. Well, Henry, let's dance. So your name's Cotter, huh? No relation to, uh... J.B. Cuttle. Distant. He's my father. Your father? Anything wrong with that? Oh, no, no, nothing wrong. What do they call you? The aspirin era? <laughs> you from out of town? Well, that depends on what you call out of town. Oh, I don't know. Harvard? You're trying to be funny? Okay. What do you call out of town? Grassville. Oh. What college is up there? No college, Miss Cuttle. Just factories. I never even finished high school. Neither did my father. He always says if a man has talent for making money, why should he waste his time in school? I guess your old man ought to know. What do you say we sit the next dance out? Why? I've got a car, Mr. Stevenson, a brand new one, a Lagonda. Ever drive one? I never even heard of one. Besides, I'm with Sally. Oh, don't worry. She'll never miss you. But maybe I'll miss her. Why didn't you think of that? Oh, come on. Don't be silly. For once, I'm not kidding. And neither am I. So long, Miss Cotterill. took me a few days, but I finally got you in my car. How do you like it? Fine. Only we don't go together. It's a lot easier to see you here than, well, with Sally Hunt. I've never put the two of you together in a million years. Why not? Oh, you're both so different. You, uh, you belong in different worlds. Yeah. What are you stopping for? Why not? It's nice here. Sure, it's nice here. Take a look. This is Grassville. Stick around a few years and then see how much you like it. What do you do, Henry? I work in a drugstore. Well, that's a coincidence. Sure. I work in a drugstore, and your father owns a hundred of them. Would you like to meet him? Say, who are you kidding? Nobody. Dad will like you. You're young, healthy, ambitious. Why don't you stop? What does a girl like you want with a guy like me? Dad's coming to New York next weekend. I'm cutting my classes on Saturday. Want to come with me? I don't know. When you look at me like that, I... Come on, let's get out of here. No, not yet, Henry. Not yet, darling. Sure, sure, 
I like him, honey, but he's nobody, Leon. And what has he got? Nothing. And what did you have, Dad, when you started? Besides, I thought you said he was sort of engaged to that girlfriend of yours, that Sally something. Oh, that's all over with. Dad, I... I love him. Love him? Oh, come on. If I really thought you did, you know I'd be oh, the first no. one. Oh, no. Don't start telling me that. Leona, what's the matter? You make me laugh. What does it really matter to you if I love Henry or not? All you want is for me to stay here with you for the rest of your life. You're afraid of losing me. Haven't I always let you do anything you ever wanted to do? But marriage is something else. I, I've worked hard. I, I built up a big business just for you. And you yourself wouldn't want to see some worthless clock of a husband, a guy who Let doesn't... Let me even... alone. Leona, You don't please. care about me. You're thinking only of yourself and your business. You're hateful, selfish, and hateful. Leona, stop it, dear. You'll make yourself sick And what again. good is your wonderful money and your wonderful business if I'm dead? Yes, that's what you want to do, drive me into my grave. You don't care just as long as your business is safe. How can you say things oh, like that? Oh, go away. Don't touch me. Don't you dare touch me. Darling, listen to me. I oh. didn't mean to... Oh. Look, we'll talk it all over oh. again as soon as... Oh. Leona. Oh. Wilson! Oh. Wilson, quick, call a doctor! Sally. Sally Hunt. <laughs> I took Henry away from her. She couldn't stand it. Even after all these years, she couldn't stand it. Going to him today, seeing him in his office... Hello? Leona, this is Sally again. I'm sorry I had to be so mysterious before, but I just couldn't talk at home. My husband was there. Well, this is all certainly rather odd, to say the least. Oh, this whole thing must seem very peculiar to you, Leona. Hearing from me after all these years. But I had to see Henry again today. I've been so worried about him. Worried? About what? Well, my... my husband. He's with the district attorney's office. And a couple of weeks ago... Sally, here in the newspaper about an old boyfriend of yours. Old boyfriend? Yeah. Remember Henry Stevenson? Oh. Pictures in the paper. Mr. and Mrs. Henry Stevenson, she's the former Leona Cotterill of Lake Forest, Illinois, have taken a house for the summer in Sutton Place. Mrs. Stevenson, in poor health for several years, is here to consult with specialists. Mr. Stevenson is vice president of the Cotterill Truck Corporation. Are you tearing it out for me? Oh, no. No, it may come in handy in a case I'm working on. What sort of a case? Oh, special investigation. Joe's on it, wouldn't he? Henry hasn't done anything wrong, has he? <laughs> Sorry, I need one too many questions. Eh? Don't tell me you're still stuck on that guy. Oh, don't be silly, darling. <laughs> Hello. Anything happened, Joe? And Stevenson fell for it, huh? Oh, well, sure, we'll go. Look, tell Bolger to line it up. Oh, five thousand's enough, and hundred dollar bills, and make sure they're marked. And for Pete's sake, keep your mouth shut. Thursday, huh? Okay, 10 o'clock. So. I'm sorry if this seems involved, Leon. Involved? I simply don't know what you're trying to tell me. Well, wait till I finish. I know I didn't have any right to do it. But that Thursday, I went to South Ferry. I don't know what I expected to see, but... Well, anyway, I spotted Fred and his friend Joe from the police. There was another man with them. I guess the one who was to bring the $5,000 in marked bills. Well, I... I followed them. Followed them? aboard the ferry and over to Staten Island. They went far out to a very desolated stretch of beach. Nothing but a few broken-down shacks and an old deserted house. I had to stay way behind them so they wouldn't see me. But then they went in the house. That gave me a chance to come closer. There was a freshly painted sign out front. 20 Dunstan Terrace, it said. And the name Evans. W. Evans. Evans? Do you know it? I... Uh, no, I've never heard of him. Well, what happened? Well... After a while, a motorboat came into shore and tied up at a pier in back of the house. A man, sort of elderly, got out of the boat and went into the house. He was carrying a suitcase. A little later, my husband came out. Only now he had the suitcase. Well, he didn't come home until late that night, and I, I was dying to ask him what happened, what possible connection it could have with Henry. Well? I, I didn't dare ask him, Leona. But things have happened since, and unless we do something, something drastic, it may be too late. Your five minutes are up. Please deposit five cents for the next five minutes. Oh, just a minute, please. I, I know I have another nickel. Are you still there, Leona? I'm here. This is one of the queerest things I've ever heard. Yes, I know. And I just didn't seem to be able to connect Henry with it. That's why I finally went to see him today. What did you find out? Well, I met him for lunch. He told the captain he was expecting a very important phone call, and then we sat down. It's been a long time, Sally. 
Eight years. Tell me, how's dear old Grassville these days? I don't know, Henry. I haven't been back. So you're married now, hmm? Living here in New York? Yes. My husband's with the district attorney's office. Oh? That's why I wanted... Henry, what I... But what I'm trying to say is this. A few days ago, I saw a picture of you in the newspaper. Vice president now. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Biggest drug business in the country. I was sorry to read that the owner isn't well. Yes. Chicago doctors don't seem to know just what it is. Her trouble, I mean. Henry, what do you do in the drug business? Push buttons, like all other vice presidents. Oh, but I'm serious. So am I. I'm almost as important as the office boy. I don't mean to be inquisitive. I only mean this for your own good. Mean what for my own good? Well, yesterday my husband was making out a report... We have your phone call, Mr. Stevens. Oh, thanks. Excuse me, Sally. I'll be right back. Well, I waited a while, Leona. But Henry didn't come back, and then I... deposit five cents for the next five minutes. Operator, but I haven't been talking five minutes. I deposited another nickel, only a couple... I am sorry, madam. Please deposit another five cents. But I haven't any more change. Hello? Hello? Leona, I'll have to call you back. But I only wanted to say that Henry never came back to the table and that he is in trouble. Fred's been talking to the police. I've heard him mention Henry's name over and over again. And there's someone else in it, too. That man called Evans. Your five minutes are up, madam. Waldo Evans. He owns that house on Staten Island. I am sorry, madam. I will have to disconnect you. Reverse the charges. Put them on this phone. Operator. Operator. <laughs> In a few moments, we'll bring you act two of Sorry, Wrong Number. Now, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. Well, Libby, that was a gala evening we all had at the premiere of 20th Century Fox's new picture, 12 O'Clock High. Yes, indeed. And for one person in particular, it must have been the thrill of a lifetime. I'm thinking about our little Lux girl, Jackie Barnes. The winner of the national contest for the prettiest 15-year-old Lux girl. Mm Mm-hmm. Jackie was an honored guest at the premiere. She certainly was a radiant youngster. She got more compliments than she could count that evening. Well, that's the way it is with Lux Girls, Libby. You know, Jackie was telling me how impressed she was with 12 O'Clock High. As everyone was. It's always good news when Gregory Peck heads a cast. And this time, I think he has the best role of his career. Yes, he makes the tough commander of a wartime bomber group an unforgettable personality. It's a gripping story you feel intensely. The dangerous flying sequences, the day-by-day strain those men endured. The whole cast is magnificent. Twelve o'clock high is one picture, Libby, where the men take the honors. Yes, except for Joyce McKenzie. She plays the one feminine role. Makes her debut in pictures as the army nurse. Mmm, there's another lovely Lux girl. She is indeed, John. Like so many successful young actresses, she finds Lux toilet soap gives her complexion just the care it needs. Recent tests by skin specialists prove that Lux Soap Care really works. In actually three out of four cases, skin became softer, smoother in a short time. No wonder Lux Toilet Soap is the leading beauty soap, not only in Hollywood, but all over the country. If you haven't tried it, why not begin your Lux Soap facials tomorrow? Remember, nine out of ten screen stars recommend this gentle protecting care. Now, our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act two of Sorry, Wrong Number, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Leona and Bert Lancaster as Henry. It's a moment or so later. Through an open window, the night air drifts slowly in Leona's window, heavy with the heat of a New York summer. Leona lies motionless on the bed, and the sounds of the night become magnified. The tugboats on the river, the hum of distant traffic, the muffled roar of a train passing over a bridge, and then suddenly... Hello? Leona, this is Sally again. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm calling from the subway station. The stores around here are all closed. I've just been home, Leona, and some more has happened. That house on Staten Island, the one I told you about, well, it was burned down this afternoon. The police have captured three men. But this Waldo Evans escaped. But who is Waldo Evans? And for heaven's sake, what's his connection with my husband? I still don't know, Leona. But I do know the whole thing has something to do with your father's company. Oh, that's absurd. My father called me from Chicago this afternoon. He never mentioned a word. Now, look. Who's been arrested and why? Three men. And I don't know why. And why do you think Henry's one of them? I didn't say that. I only know that 
Somehow he's terribly involved. Did anyone say he was going to be arrested? No, not exactly. Then what are you talking about? Why are you calling me like this? Are you still jealous that I took Henry away from you? Can't you bear to see me happy? Can't you stop telling lies and making trouble even now? Fiona, I can't talk anymore. Then I'm right. You are just trying to make trouble. No, no. Fred and Joe, they're coming down the subway platform. If my husband should see me here... Fiona, I've got to hang up. Hello. Oh. Oh. Yes? This is Western Union. We have a message for Mrs. Henry Stevenson. This is Mrs. Stevenson. The telegram is as follows. Darling, terribly sorry, but last minute remembered annual drug convention tomorrow in Boston. Taking next train out, back Sunday morning. Oh. Keep well. All my love. Oh. And signed, Henry. That is all, madam. Do you wish us to deliver a copy of the... Oh. Oh, no. Then I wait until the train goes over the bridge in case your window is open and she should scream. The client says the cost is fair. I got your message, George. Everything okay for tonight? Henry is in trouble. Death for trouble. Darling, terribly sorry. Peggy, next train up. Back to Sunday morning. Then I wait till the train goes over the bridge. Then I wait till the train goes over the bridge. Dr. Alexander? Doctor, this is Mrs. Stevenson. Oh, yes, Mrs. Stevenson. How are you? I need you right away, Doctor. Please, come right over. Now, now, Mrs. Stevenson, what seems to be... I said I want you to come over at once. I'm afraid I can't tonight, Mrs. Stevenson. Now, be sensible. If you just make up your mind to cooperate with your husband and me in our plan of action... Plan of action? What are you talking about? Mrs. Stevenson, I explained everything in my letter over a week ago. Letter? What letter? But surely your husband... Hasn't he spoken to you, Mrs. Stevenson? About what? Look, you... You try to compose yourself now, and perhaps we can discuss it tomorrow. We'll discuss it now. Do you hear me? Now, this very minute. Well, if you insist upon knowing, your husband called at my office about ten days ago. He seemed quite concerned about your condition, naturally. Anyway, we discussed your illness at great length. <laughs> I still don't know what's wrong with her. Well, Mr. Stevenson, your wife's illness seems to date far back to her early childhood. Is that true? Yes, I suppose so. But you knew nothing about it when you married her? No, not until after a couple of years. You see, we were... We were living with her father then, in Lake Forest. I remember early one morning. Why did you do that, Henry? Why did you send the maid for my handbag? Why? Because there's something in it that I need. Well, how much money do you want? I'm sorry to disappoint you, Leona, but this time it isn't money. Simply that I wrote Ferguson's telephone number in your notebook last night. And I want to call him. We have a date for lunch. You know perfectly well you're having lunch with me today. I, I know, Leona, but, but I won't be able to make it. This date with Ferguson's rather important. Oh, more important than me, I suppose? Oh, it isn't that, Leona. It's just that... Well, it's about a job. You have a job. What on earth are you talking about? Leona. Leona, I've been meaning to say this for you, to you for weeks. I just don't belong in your father's business. Who says you don't? I do. I say it. Working for your father is like... Like running in a dream. No matter how hard you try, you know you'll never get anywhere. I don't want to graft off your charity for the rest of my life. I want a chance. A chance on my own. Only you're not getting the chance. I won't have you traipsing around, you hear? Just because Dad doesn't go falling all over himself, you're not going to throw away a million-dollar business like Cotterell for an idle whim. It happens to be my business, too, you know. And to think my own husband turns up his nose at it. Now call Ferguson and tell him you've changed your mind. Go on, Henry, call him. But I haven't changed my mind. You're still going? Yes. And someday you'll see it'll be better for both of us. Henry! Henry, wait! Now, that's a little silly, isn't it? Locking the door? You're not going, Henry. Not as long as you're my husband. Oh, come on, Leona. Give me that you key. You can't do it. You can't do this to me. Nobody's ever done it. Nobody, nobody. Will you please stop and give me that Henry, key? Henry, please. If you love me, if you love me at all. Henry, I, I beg you. I'll talk to Dad. I'll do anything. Anything you want, only don't leave me. Don't go away. Give me that key. No. No, I won't. I won't. I won't. Oh. Oh, Henry, you're hurting me. Please. Your husband told me, Mrs. Stevenson, that in spite of your opposition, he had lunch that day with Mr. Ferguson. When he got home that evening, he said your father was waiting for him at the door, angry and worried. All right, Henry. 
Come in the library. I want to talk to you. What's the matter? Where's Leona? Leona's in bed. She had an attack. A heart attack. She almost died. A heart attack? Did you two quarrel this morning? Yes, but... But what's that... Weren't you supposed to have lunch with Leona? Yes, but I had to see someone else. Look, Mr. Cotterill, if you don't mind, I'd like to see Leona. You'll see Leona when she's ready to see you. Just in case you don't know it, Leona's had a heart condition since childhood. Her mother died of it the day Leona was born. Leona can't stand being treated the way you did this morning. She never has been before, and she's not going to be now by you or anyone else. And what happens if once in a while I have an opinion of my own? I don't give a hoot about your opinions, Henry. Have them. Think anything you like. But while you're in this house, you'll do what my daughter tells you to do. I think you should know that the argument this morning was about a very important decision. Don't be a fool. A decision I made as much for the sake of Leona's future as for my own. Was it for her that you had lunch with Ferguson? Well, did you get the job? No. No, I didn't. And I'll tell you why you didn't. It so happens I'm a pretty good customer of Ferguson's. I buy more than $2 million worth of dyes every year. Now, who do you think he's going to care about, you or me? So that's what happened. Now, who else in Chicago would you like to have lunch with about a job? Oh, face up to it, Henry. Just as long as you're my son-in-law, you're working for me and nobody else. If if you really cared for Leona the way I do, you'd have done the same thing in my place. Besides, you haven't done so badly for yourself. Now, go upstairs and see Leona. She's been asking for you. Well, Mrs. Stevenson, as I say, we discussed all these things in my office ten days ago, your husband and I. I asked Mr. Stevenson how long this heart attack of yours lasted. Oh, she got well right away, Doctor. Maybe I... Maybe I should have pulled out then and there. But I didn't pull out. Somehow I couldn't. Her father wasn't altogether wrong. I hadn't done too badly for myself. Anyway, from that time on, I began to compromise. Always with the hope that somehow, someday, I'd win out on my own. But it wasn't long before we were right back where we started. Another attack? Yes, sir. I remember one day in particular. I had an idea that I thought, that I hoped might help the city. Henry, you mean you brought me here just to look at an apartment? Oh, you'd be crazy about it, Leona. Now, come on, let's go in and look at it. I'm not interested, Henry. But you haven't even seen it. Why, there are terraces on all four sides. I've told room... you a thousand times we don't need an apartment. Leona. Leon, it's not an apartment I'm looking for. What I want is a home, a home of our own. You just can't go on living with your father indefinitely. I don't see why not. There's plenty of room and I like it. Besides, who's going to pay for this little penthouse? Well, I hope eventually I would. Oh, eventually. But in the meantime, it's my money and I'm the one who's going to pay for it. Okay, Leon, let's go. Oh, Henry, you're so naive. You're like a little boy with a box of candy. I just can't throw my money away on everything you happen to see. There's a limit. Sure, there's a limit. I'm supposed to follow you around like a pet dog tied to a chain. I'm supposed to like whatever crumbs you want to throw. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Yes, you've got me sewed up 16 different ways for three meals a day and pocket money. That's all you care about. That's all you married me for, my money. I should have known it. I should have known it. Oh, stop it, Leona. Please, just for once, will you listen to me? You hate me. You're bored with me. All you want to do is get away. Okay, I'm bored. Bored stiff. Who wouldn't be with that neat little routine you've got cooked up for me? What do I have? Nothing. Nothing on my own. Not even the studs on my shirt or the matches in my pocket. Henry, how can you say this to me? You once told me I'd love this kind of life, remember? Well, do you want to know something? I do love it. I love it now more than you'll ever know. But I want to be my own boss, profiting by every bit of it. Not just the stooge on the outside looking in. Henry! Henry, get me some water. Quick. Listen to me, Leona. Please. It isn't that I want to be without you. I could love oh. you still if only you try to understand. Henry, my purse. Henry, the, the pills. And my purse. That attack kept her in the hospital nearly three weeks, Doctor. At the time, I... Well, I thought it was all my fault. But no matter what I did, her attacks increased in violence and became more frequent. About a year ago, Leona... Well, she, she just seemed to give up hope of ever getting well. She took to her bed more or less permanently. It was my idea to come to New York and see you. The doctors in Chicago said she didn't have much of a chance. Anyway, we rented the house on Sutton Place, and here we are. And believe me, it's been more and more like a nightmare. Mr. Stevenson, there's absolutely nothing wrong organically with your wife's heart. Nothing wrong? I've examined her thoroughly. 
And what you've just told me confirms what I've thought from the start. And, and that is? Her condition is mostly mental. Mental? She's what we call a cardiac neurotic. Her attacks are brought on by her emotions, her lack of control, her frustrations. The whole thing is probably quite unconscious on her part. Now, I'm not saying your wife isn't sick. Mentally, she is sick, and her attacks are real enough. But, given the proper treatment, she may snap out of it entirely. Well, I'll... I'll call on her tomorrow. There's a psychiatrist I wanted to see. Doctor, uh, I wish you could wait a few days. I'd like to think this over. Think it over? Yes, you see, she's so easily upset. And I think that, well, that maybe I ought to prepare her. You know, get her used to the idea. Well, a few days more or less won't matter, I suppose. Unless... Unless you wanted to write her a letter. It might make it easy for her to take, and it... Well, it would give me more time to talk to her. Well, it's an extremely delicate matter, Mr. Stevenson. I... But if you think you can manage it, let's try it that way. Give me a ring in a couple of days. Meanwhile, I'll write the letter. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks for everything. Well, that's exactly the way I left things, Mrs. Stevenson, ten days ago. As your husband requested, I wrote you the letter. And I'm telling you I never received a letter. Well, let's not worry about that now. I've told you everything, and now I want you to relax. Do you have that sedative I prescribed? Yes, yes, it's here. Well, then take some. Double the dose, and I'll... Liars! 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 Hello. This is Stevenson. Who is it? This is Mr. Evans. I've been trying to get you, but your line has been busy. Has Mr. Stevenson come home? No, no, he isn't here. He won't be back until Sunday. And will you please, please tell me what this is all about? Why are you calling him? Who are you? I've already told you, Mrs. Stevenson, and I'm very sorry if I've annoyed you. But there are names and addresses that are very important for Mr. Stevenson to know. So if you'll be good enough to take the following message... What are you talking about? I can't take any messages now. If you'll please tell Mr. Stevenson that the house at 20 Dunstan Terrace has been burned down. I burned it down. You... you what? Also, that I do not believe it was Mr. Morano, the name is spelled M-O-R-A-N-O, who betrayed us to the police. And since Mr. Morano has been arrested by the district attorney's office... There is no necessity for the money now. Oh. oh, this is fantastic. What money? Who's Morano? Thirdly, tell Mr. Stevenson that I escaped and I am now at the Manhattan address. However, I do not expect to be here after midnight. If he wishes to find me, he may call me at a phone number, Bowie 21000. And now, if you'll be so good as to repeat... The oh, message, you're insane. Do you realize I'm a terribly sick woman? I'm very sorry for you, Mrs. Stevenson. I don't know. Perhaps it would be better to tell you the true facts. I mean now, before they are garbled by the police. Maybe then you'll understand. But if you're ill... I don't know what or whom to believe. So much has happened to me tonight. And I'm sick, my doctor says I'm... I'll tell you all I know, Mrs. Stevens. Well, tell me then, tell me. It started over a little... a year ago. At your father's factory in Chicago. You see, Mrs. Stevenson... I had worked in your father's company for many years. I'm a chemist. Anyway, late one afternoon, your husband walked into the laboratory and he... We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a few moments, we'll continue with Act Three of Sorry, Wrong Number. Our guest tonight is Barbara Ann Newton, young Par- Paramount starlet. Aren't you glad, Barbara, you were present at a certain little theater production one evening? A lucky evening for me, Mr. Keeley. A talent scout saw me, arranged for a screen test, and... And here you are in picture. Yes. And from now on, I'm going to work like mad. Oh, it must be wonderful to be a great actress like... Like Olivia de Havilland? Well, I gather you've seen her new picture, The Heiress. Not once, but three times. 
I can understand why the New York motion picture critics gave Mr. Haviland the award for the best performance of the year. And how did you like Montgomery Clift as the money-conscious suitor in the heiress? He's splendid, so dashing and, and romantic, too. And Ralph Richardson as a stern father is simply perfect. Do you remember the scene where he compares his unpopular daughter with her sought-after cousin? Oh, yes. The party scene where Mona Freeman is the reigning belle. She's like a Dresden doll. So blonde and dainty. Those lavish costumes of the crinoline era suit her beauty very well. Yes, Mr. Kennedy. And she's just as delicate and lovely in real life. Always so beautifully groomed. Real lux loveliness, huh? <laughs> exactly. Mona Freeman gives her complexion daily lux soap care. And she's really keen about the new bath size cake. Nine out of ten screen stars say they're delighted with this new product of Lever Brothers Company. For a luxurious, refreshing, relaxing beauty bath, you simply can't buy a finer soap. That's the way I feel. I love the nice fragrance that leaves on the skin. Thank you, Miss Barbara Ann Knudsen. Women who use the generous new bath size Lux Toilet Soap will agree. Its rich, abundant lather and delicate flower-like fragrance make a wonderfully refreshing beauty bath. So, for all over Lux loveliness, why not get the satin smooth bath size Lux toilet soap tomorrow? Here's our producer, Mr. William Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of Sorry, Wrong Number, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Leona and Bert Lancaster as Henry. <laughs> on the table says ten minutes to eleven o'clock. But Leona Stevenson, clutching the telephone, listens with mounting bewilderment and fright to the voice of a man named Waldo Evans. Yes, Mrs. Stevenson. Your husband came into the laboratory and started asking me questions about the drugs we use and how we prepare them. Well, this is very interesting, Mr. Evans. So, uh, this is where the formula for all our products are developed, huh? That's right. Some of these drugs must be very valuable. Oh, yes, Mr. Stevenson, very valuable. I see. And uh, tell me, uh, what do you do with them? Well, they go into the various Cotterell products, sir. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're the man in charge here, huh? Yes, sir. I see. Well, thanks for your time, Mr. Evans. I was just curious. Thank you, sir. Good night, Mr. Stevenson. <laughs> first meeting with your husband, Mrs. Stevenson. Then, from time to time, he'd drop into the laboratory and visit with me. And one night, when it was storming, he offered to drive me home. So you're a bachelor, Mr. Evans. Well, I didn't know that. Yes, sir. I live in a looming house on uh, Chestnut Street. A man all by himself. No responsibilities. Tell me, why do you work so hard? Well, to tell you the truth, sir, because, because I have a hope. An ideal, you might say. In a few years, I I hope to retire. Retire, huh? Oh, I have it all planned, sir. I'm going back to England. I hope to raise horses, sir. Well, not, uh, not raise horses. Just horses, sir. Do you care for horses, Mr. Stevenson? Well, I'm afraid I haven't thought very much about them. Oh, then you're missing a great deal. Well, that's my hope, sir. To live there quietly and raise horses. Why have you waited this long? Money? Money, of course. But someday, I'll... Well, why wait until you're old? What good is a dream when you're too old to enjoy it? Oh, I've thought of that, Mr. Stevenson. I suppose the zest does come out of things with the encroachments of old age. Now you're talking, Wally. My motto is, if you want something, get it now. It's, uh... It's the next turn to the right, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, Chestnut Street. You know, Wally... Wally, I've been thinking. There might be a way out. A way out? Yes. To have your little place in England. Everything you want. <laughs> Indeed, sir. And all you have to do is to make a little mistake every now and then. Mistake? In the laboratory. I've been checking on it, Wally. The way you're set up, no one would ever know. Mr. Stevenson, I... <laughs> I'd better say good night, sir. Wait a minute. The differences in the amounts of those raw drugs you handle need be so slight that nobody but yourself would ever know. I... I don't understand, sir. Look what you've done for the company all these years. And what have you gotten out of it? Not a tenth of the salary you should be getting. No. No, please, Mr. Stevenson. Now, don't be silly. I've already talked it over with someone else. 
talked it over with... With whom? A man named Murano. He can handle all the raw drugs that we can get. And then we split. You, Murano, and I. Mr. Stevenson, I just can't believe it. You're a young man. Vice president of the company. A wonderful future ahead of you. Don't make me laugh. Yes, I'm young. Young enough not to waste my life in dreaming. There are things I want to do, big things, and the only way to do them... I'm sorry, Wally. I thought you were my kind of a person. I trusted you. But, but what if we were caught? Why should we be caught? We'll make our pile and stop before anyone even guesses what went on. Morano knows just what to do. Besides, for once, there's an advantage in being Cotterell's son-in-law. Yes. Yes, I... I see. I thought you would, Wally. Well, partner... We're in business. And so we started, Mrs. Stevenson. A systematic plan of robbing your father's company. By September of last year, I had banked the sum of $7,500. But then, I received a memorandum from the personnel office. Will you please stop your whining? Didn't you read the memo? You're not fired. They're simply transferring you to the New Jersey plant. But they must suspect... This is a warning. I'm sure of it. I'm through, Mr. Stevenson. Look here, you old fool. We've been stooges up till now. Morano's played us for suckers. This is our chance to get rid of him. That transfer of yours is just what I've been looking for. I, I don't understand. Look, I'll tell Morano you've been fired, that the deal's all washed up. Meanwhile, you're back there in New Jersey. We'll operate on our own and we'll split Morano's share between us. But, but I'm just a chemist, Mr. Stevenson. I don't know anything about disposing of drugs. But I do. I know all about it. Now listen. The Cotterill plant in New Jersey is in Bayonne. And just across the bay from Bayonne is Staten Island. I happen to know a little about Staten Island. About six weeks later, we began operations, Mrs. Stevenson, on Staten Island, New York. Our headquarters was an old abandoned house, 20 Dunstan Terrace. There, twice a week after work, I would come from your father's plant in Bayonne. And there, Mr. Stevenson would telephone me or mail me his instructions from Chicago... A little over three months ago, Mr. Stevenson arrived in New York. A few nights later, when I went to 20 Dunstan Terrace, I found that your husband was not alone. Come right in. We've been waiting for you. Wally, this is Morano. Morano? You didn't expect me, did you, Mr. Evans? Well, neither did Mr. Stevenson. But here I am. You see, I have ways of finding things out. For instance, ever since the two of you broke off our present little association in Chicago... I find you've accumulated a rather large bank account. Am I right? What about it? I'm warning you right now, Morano. Don't you try any funny business. Relax, Mr. I'm warning you. I said relax. Sure, you're a big, strong guy, Mr. Stevenson, but mussing me up won't get you anywhere. You see, I merely represent an organization. But we had what you might call a board meeting, and the vote was seven to one against you. Now, that's pretty serious. That's like a death sentence. Oh, cut it short, Morano. What do you want? Mr. Stevenson, please give them what they want. Mr. Morano, you can take everything I've got. Shut up. Now, if you were to turn back what you've accumulated, Mr. Stevenson, and pay us $200,000 for our injured feelings, I might get the board to reconsider their decision. You know as well as I do I don't have that kind of money. But you have such wonderful connections. A millionaire father-in-law, a very rich wife. Yes, a lot of good that does. Why do you suppose I went into this racket? But I thought I read somewhere about your wife being sick. Very sick. What about it? Well, she has life insurance, hasn't she? Made out in your name. Now, I'm pretty sure the board will give you, say, 90 days to raise the money on something like that. Why 90 days? Isn't that what the doctor in Chicago said? She wouldn't get better? Yes, that's what he said, but... Well, what's that? Well, just a little IOU to make it legal, you see. Everything can be straightened out without any trouble, without any rough stuff. But suppose something happened, and my wife didn't. I mean, I mean, if she got better. I wouldn't worry about that, Mr. Stevens. You've got a doctor's word for it, haven't you? They know their business. So here, take the pen and sign the piece of paper. What I have just told you, Mr. Stevenson, took place three months ago. I need not describe Mr. Steven Stevenson's distress when the IOU became due last Wednesday. As I understand it, Mr. Stevenson saw Mr. Milano, but his request to an extension was refused. And now, inasmuch as I have already given you the final message, 
I believe the rest explains itself quite simply. Mr. Evans, where is my husband? Where is Mr. Stevenson now? I wish I knew. Perhaps if you tried the Bowery number. The Bowery number? What Bowery number? The one I gave you when I first started to talk. Mrs. Stevenson, I'm afraid I must ask you to check it all. I can't, I can't. I'll repeat it once more. Point one, the house at 20 Dunstan Terrace was burned down this afternoon. I did it. Point two, I escaped. Point three, Mr. Milano has been arrested, so it will not be necessary to raise the money. Point four, it was not Mr. Milano who told the police. Just give me the Bowery number, the one for my husband. Point five, I am at the Manhattan address now, but I'm leaving. And may be found at Bowery 2-1000. Bowery 2-1000. Yes, after midnight. Good night, Mrs. Stevenson. And thank you very much. Bowery 2, 1,000. Bowery 2, 1,000. Oh, Henry. Henry. Oh. Bowery 2, 1,000. Is this Bowery... Is Mr. Stevenson there? Mr. who? Stevenson, Mr. Henry Stevenson. I was told to call by a Mr. Evans. In just a minute, I'll see. Stevenson? Yes, yes, Stevenson. Hold on. Oh. Oh. Hello? Yes, no, he's not here, ma'am. Oh, well, Mr. Evans said he might be expected. Could I... Could I leave a message? Message? Now, look, lady, if this is your idea of a joke... Oh, please. Please help me. What number is this? What am I calling? Bowery 2-1000. The city morgue. Oh! 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 Operator. Operator. Police. Give me the police quickly. I will ring the police department. No, no, wait a minute. Give me the hospital. I can't be alone. It's 11 o'clock. Hurry, please. It's 11 o'clock. One moment, please. Operator, I can't hear you. Are you calling the hospital? Operator, operator. Bellevue. Is this a hospital? Yes. I, I want the nurse's registry. I want to hire a trained nurse immediately for the night. I am sorry, but this is a city it hospital. It doesn't matter. I've got to have a nurse. I understand that, madam. I'm but... sick and I'm all alone. All alone in this horrible empty house. I overheard a conversation. A telephone conversation about a murder. A murder to be committed at 11.15. I, I, I don't know what's happened to my husband. If something isn't done, I, I'm afraid I... What was that? What was what, madam? That... That click just now on my telephone. As though someone had lifted the hook off the extension downstairs. I did not hear it, madam, and if you were... Well, I did. There's someone in this house. There's someone downstairs. And they're listening to me now. They're... Who is it? Who's down there? Oh... <laughs> Hello. New Haven is calling Mrs. Henry Stevenson. Is she there? I, I, I can't talk now. Call back later. I later. have a person-to-person call from Mr. Stevenson. Do you not Did wish you to accept Mr. the call? Did you say Mr. Stevenson? Mr. Stevenson from New Haven? Do you wish to accept the call, madam? Oh, yes, yes. One moment, please. Here's your party, sir. Hello, darling? Henry! Henry, where are you? Well, I'm on my way to Boston, dear. Stopping uh, off between trains in New Haven. Didn't you get my wire? Yes, yes, I got it. I was sorry I couldn't reach you by phone before I left. But, of course, I knew you'd be all right. Well, I'm not all right. I'm... There, there's someone in this house, Henry. Right now, I, I'm sure of it. Oh, honey, how could there be? Don't tell me you're still alone. Well, of course I'm alone. Who else could be here? You promised to be home at six o'clock. I know, Leona, but I thought I explained to the time. I've been alone for hours. I've been afraid of every kind of horrible call. And, Henry, Henry, I want you to call the police. Do you hear me? Tell them to come over at once. Now, honey, you know you're perfectly safe. The doors are all locked and there's a private patrolman. You're right in the heart of New York City, and the phone's there at your bed. Henry! Henry, what do you know? What do you know about a man named Waldo Evans? Evans? Why? Why do you ask? I, I had a long talk with him just a little while ago about you. About me? Well, what about me? Oh, he, he told me some terrible things. Some of it sounded insane, but some of it, maybe it was true. You mustn't listen to every crackpot that calls you up, dear. Now, just try to forget him. He, he said you'd been stealing from Dad's company. Is that true, Henry? Leona, of course it's not true. Well, he, he left some kind of a message for you that the, the house on Staten Island had been burned down and that the police knew everything and that Morano had been arrested and that... Uh, Henry, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. They, 
They said you were a criminal, Henry, a desperate man. And Evan said... Evan said you wanted me to... to die. Leona. And that money, Henry. That money those people wanted. Why didn't you ask me for it? Why, I'd have given it to you gladly if it would have saved your life. I, I, I'll give it to you now if it isn't too late. That's all right. Forget about it. I didn't mean to be so awful to you, Henry. I... I only did it because I loved you, and I I thought you didn't love me, and that you'd go away and leave me. Leona. Yes? I want you to do something. Please. Will you forgive me first, Henry, will you? I want you to try to get out of bed. Please, Henry, please. Leona, listen to me. I try can't. Try to get out of bed. I can't get out of bed. You've got to. Walk over to the window and stop screaming, Leona. Scream out of the I, street. I can't move, Henry. I'm too frightened, and I... Keep trying. Otherwise, you've only got three more minutes' time. Henry! Oh, don't talk anymore. Just get out of that bed. I confessed everything, everything. I did steal from your father, and I was so desperate that I even tried. Henry! I erased it. Henry! I can hear footsteps. Somebody's coming up the stairs! Get out of that bed! Walk, Leona! Walk! No! No, I can't! Henry! Oh, Henry, save me! The train! I can hear the train! It's near the bridge, and I... Please, Leona! I'll wait for them to get me! They'll know! They'll find out from Morano! They'll... Oh, no! No, please! Please don't! Oh, please! Please, I'll give you anything! Please, no! No! Sorry. Wrong number. For a thrilling experience in the theater, our thanks go to this evening's stars, Barbara Stanwyck and Burt Lancaster. They're coming downstage now for a curtain call. You know, it's good to have you both back. And it's nice to be back. Bill says you got him in bed with the audience, Barbara. In what way? Well, we keep getting letters asking why you haven't been here for so long. And we have to keep explaining that you've made one picture right after another with no time off in between. One thing is sure, Bill. I haven't forgotten the Lux Radio Theater or Lux Soap. It's my favorite complexion care and has been for years. And that's one of the nicest compliments Lux has ever received. Barbara, tell me if you can. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't she wonderful? I sound like How Andy many... Devine. <laughs> she says she sounds like Andy Devine. <laughs> tell me, Barbara... How many pictures have you made that still aren't released? Four, Barry. And what's the first one we'll see? <laughs> the Hal Wallace production, Thelma Jordan. Oh, yes, Wendell Corey's in that, too. You know, when you and Hal Wallace get together on a picture, we know it's going to be a hit. Bird, I hear you are off for New York in a few days. Yes, I've just finished my own Norma F.R. production of The Hawk and the Arrow at Warner Brothers. And now I'm going to New York to see a few shows and take a brief vacation. Well, your last vacation you spent out on the road with a circus as an acrobat. Nothing like that this time? Not unless you have to be an acrobat to get tickets to South Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, tell me, what's next Monday's show? Next week, Burke, one of America's best-loved characters will return to this stage. The gentleman I'm talking about is Mr. Belvedere. And our play is the 20th Century Fox hit... Mr. Belvedere Goes to College. Naturally, we'll have the original Mr. Belvedere here to play the part. The amazing Clifton Webb. And besides Mr. Webb, we have two other stars. Colleen Gray and the popular Robert Stack. 
a great comedy, and the return of Mr. Belvedere all on next Monday night. Everybody will love it, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night, and thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's a great deal of vague and sentimental talk about the American economic system. But here are some cold facts. Since 1910, we have increased the income of each household from $2,400 to about 4000 And the figures are in dollars of the same purchasing power. We've done it by increased production, and yet we work 18 hours less each week for this extra money. This is the miracle of America. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Clifton Webb, Robert Stack, and Colleen Gray in Mr. Belvedere Goes to College. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Louis Silvers. Here's a fashion flash from Hollywood. Barbara Stanwyck has one of those smart, new, finely pleated nylon 90s that stays in pleat when you wash it. Of course, she insists on Lux Flakes care for it just as she does for all her lovely lingerie. One of her favorite shades is a pale green orchid. This spring, you'll be seeing more and more delicate and unusual colors in slips and nighties. So play safe. Wash them with gentle Lux Flakes. Tests prove that wrong washing soon fades colors, often tears delicate lace. Lux Flakes Care keeps pretty slips and nighties new looking three times as long. Use Lux Flakes to give your nice washables that lovely Lux look. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Mr. Belvedere Goes to College, starring Clifton Webb, Colleen Gray, and Robert Stack. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please, share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness, aside from the old-time radio shows, are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.